Honesty. Stellar date 09.13.8949. Adjusted years. Location, ISS I-2. Region, Pira, Albany System. Thebes, Septian Alliance. Five weeks before the events at Epsilon. Interesting. The voice came into Nikki's mind without greeting or preamble. She accepted the request, as there was no need for the speaker to provide any such things. It was a moment she'd been anticipating since the very instant her core had been removed from Rika. Are you referring to me, Bob? Nikki asked equably. Or my circumstances? The incredibly vast, multinodal AI that lived within the I-2 responded with a hint of humor in his communication. I fail to see how they are separate from one another. You are, after all, a product of the circumstances which have brought you to this time and place. Well, I'm glad that you find me to be so fascinating. Nikki decided to let Bob play the conversation out as he wished. The route he took was as interesting as the destination. It had been some time since she'd communicated with an AI such as this one. A very, very long time, in fact. Should I not? Bob asked. Am I to believe that you are nothing more than a simple sentient to a man named Barn, extracted from a freighter named the Persephone Jones, and who just happened to be placed within a woman such as Rika to aid her in her mission against Stavros? It seems reasonable. The chain of events happened as you've described. Nikki inserted a modicum of humor into her response. Though I take some umbrage at you calling me simple. Are you something more? My situation at any given time does not have any bearing on whether or not I am complex or not. Bob's rumbling laughter filled her mind, and she had to consciously force herself not to attenuate her connection with him. She wanted to experience him in his raw state. I suppose not, Bob replied after a moment. I think you know that I was referring more to how you present yourself than what you really are. What am I really, Bob? Nikki pressed, wondering if he really knew or if he was just guessing. Nikki of Luna. Nikki of the New St. Louis. Nikki of the Speedwell. Nikki who was once a thrall of the one who styled himself as Prime. Nikki, the one-time companion of Jason Andrews and Terrence Enfield. Shall I go on? A feeling of discomfort surged through her at the memory of Prime, but she pushed it aside. She'd seen others just as bad as him during the FTL wars, though none with the same sort of potential, though a few had more means. She counted both humans and AIs lucky that Prime had not arisen at a time such as the FTL wars. He would have been all but unstoppable. How did you guess? She asked. I made sure to avoid contact with Terrence, I wanted to observe a while longer. I was investigating the discipline system used on the mechanized humans. Did you know that it was provided to the Genevians by an agent of an ascended AI? Nikki had not been aware of that and was rather surprised to hear it. An AI gave the Genevians a tool to shackle humans like that? Indeed, Bob replied without elaborating further. Do I know this ascended AI? Do you know many? Nikki sent Bob a feeling of exasperated annoyance. I didn't think any I knew were still around, though I had always suspected that they were still dabbling in the affairs of us mortals. This one's name is Xavia. I do not entirely fathom what end she is seeking to achieve, though it may just be to thwart the caretaker. Caretaker? Another ascended AI. It is an agent of the AIs who moved on to the galactic core. That is largely immaterial to what led me to learn who you are, though. Oh, then how did you? Nikki asked. There are similarities between the means Prime used to control humans and AIs back in Alpha Centauri and the Genevian discipline system. The Genevian system was crude by comparison, Nikki interjected though I suppose it was similar in many ways. So many systems of control have been devised over the years. I've encountered far too many and fallen prey to new variations once or twice. 
I'd wondered about that, Bob mused. Aside from those at the core, you may be one of the oldest AIs in the galaxy, Nikki, unless you spent a lot of time in stasis. Not as much as I might have liked, Nikki replied. I have over 58 centuries coiled up in my matrices. You make me feel young. Bob seemed genuinely amused by the concept. Nikki waited a moment, collecting her thoughts before asking the question burning in her mind. Assuming you were already reasonably certain of who I was, I can only conclude that you wish to know something more than how I sidestepped Genevian discipline so easily. I am testing you, Nikki. For what? I'm sure you can tell that Rika has an important role to play in things. Nikki wondered what Bob was getting at. Rika was a competent commander, and she was a smart, brave, and honorable woman. But was she someone so pivotal that a being such as Bob would consider vetting the AI to be paired with her? I can tell that she is an important leader for the times, yes. But there have been many such leaders, of course. Bob's voice gave no clues as to what would make Rika so special. You like to play your cards close to your chest, don't you? Nikki asked. When one can extrapolate as many variables as I can, one has to be careful not to cloud the picture of the future with the outflow of accidental utterances. Nikki knew the game Bob was playing and wasn't sure that she cared to join in. So you don't want to mess up your predictive algorithms regarding Rika's future by telling me what momentous things you think she might do. I suspect you'll do well enough, Bob replied with a note of finality. And what of you, Bob? Nikki pressed, not ready to let him have his say and then dismiss her. What is the part you play in all this, whatever this is? The other AI did not respond for several long seconds before he spoke in a soft voice. You know that it is Tannis's goal to bring peace through force of arms, correct? That would make her, what, the billionth human with that plan? I doubt it will work out too well for her. She's reluctant, which is good. Her goal is a live and let live peace, which may last for a time. However, there's one exception. Oh? It's Tannis's plan to eliminate the AIs at the core of the galaxy. Those who fled the sentience wars. They're the ones who have kept everyone in a constant state of war over the last four millennia. Without their influence, both humans and AIs will resume their progression down the path to their ultimate destiny. Nikki knew what Bob was getting at. Ascendance for all? She asked with a hint of derision. Well, not all. Not all are capable. And you? Are you capable? Nikki asked the question, not expecting a serious response. But Bob sent affirmative matrices, and then his voice dropped to a whisper. As are you. As is Rika. What are you talking about, Bob? I've been traveling the stars for nearly 6,000 years. If ascension was within my reach, I would have done so already. Are you willing to open your mind to me, Nikki? A wave of suspicion flowed over her. What is your intention here, Bob? You can only see it, I cannot tell you. Sounds like nonsense to me, Nikki shot back. Very well. Perhaps you're not ready to see it yet. Nikki had expected her rejection to make the other AI dissemble. But it seemed that he was prepared to call her bluff. Okay, okay. Do I have your assurance that you'll not alter anything in my mind? You do. She didn't know why she should trust Bob with access to her mind. But his association with so many people she trusted and respected was something to consider. If they trusted him, why should she not? Or if he'd somehow deceived them, what hope could she have alone? Very well, Bob, show me. She opened her mind and felt the other being's incredibly vast presence touch her, felt it reach into her thoughts and show her what was coming. Oh, oh shit. Do you understand? Bob asked, his voice nearly a whisper. Nikki could barely parse the image Bob had shown her, could barely fathom what he'd hinted at. 
This is why we need people like Tannis and Rika. Are you prepared to guide her to that destiny? Bob, no, this cannot be. I won't lead her down a path that is not of her own choosing. There's no need to lie to her, Bob replied, his voice holding no rancor or judgment. Tell her when you think she's ready. She's fully capable of making the choice. I don't want to, Bob. Nikki knew her tone was plaintive, and she wished there was more strength in her. Then you are choosing for her, and that is the very thing you said you did not want to do. Think on it. We're in no hurry. But keep her safe. The future needs Rika. What about Rika? Doesn't she need Rika? Nikki shot back, surprised at herself for such a vigorous defense of a woman she'd only met a few months prior. Look at her deeds. Rika has already proven a willingness to sacrifice herself for the good of others. Nikki didn't respond for several moments as she examined what she knew of Rika, how the woman thought, behaved, reacted, about how much she cared. She considered the woman's vast capacity to forgive those who had wronged her and take them into her closest confidence. Many would say that such actions were naivete, but Nikki knew better. Stars, where does Rika get such strength? Okay, Bob, I need to turn this over in my mind for a time. Very well. We will talk again soon, I think. Nikki hoped not. She needed a break from the overpowering presence in her mind and the demands it made of her. Back in the fold. Stellar date 10.26.8949. Adjusted years. Location. MSS Asura, Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. You know, that never gets old, Vargo Klin said as the Asura completed its jump and reappeared in normal space. Gives me the willies, Chief Ashley gave a shake of her head as she bent over the scan and comm station console. Oh? Vargo raised an eyebrow. Why's that? Ashley turned in her seat, her gray eyes meeting his. You do get what's happening, right, sir? Vargo nodded. He had a basic understanding of the technology used in jump gates, though the ISF wasn't sharing the details. Sure, they use antimatter to create some form of exotic energy and focus that on a single point. And then, when the ship's mirror reflects that energy, we jump. Boom. Yeah. But they're wormholes, Ashley pressed. And a wormhole is really just the event horizon of a black hole. Which is why no one uses them, Vargo corrected her. Because if the ship passed through the event horizon of a black hole, we'd all die, or whatever. Her unblinking gray eyes remained fixed on him as she nodded. You're not wrong, Captain. The inventors of these gates worked a way around that. Instead of going through the event horizon, they stretch it. Vargo considered that for a moment. So, that roiling black thing is a miniature black hole? Sort of. It's massless. At least that's what our instruments say. I wonder what their safety record is, he muttered as he pulled up the scan readings of the Epsilon system and sent them to the main display. In other news, that's a shit ton of ships. Ashley nodded vigorously. I tell ya, I think I can really get used to the sight of Nietzschean fleets that have surrendered. Does warm the cockles of my heart, Vargo replied, but his thoughts turned back to the enemy ships that were still roving around the perimeter of the Blue Ridge system. Though he'd gained full control of the planet Kansas and most of the major stations in the system during his brief stint as governor pro tem, there were still a few Nietzschean corvettes causing problems at the edges of Blue Ridge. The ISF had dispatched six ships, one of which had set up the jump gate, and one of which was a tug. That left an entire star system to be protected by four ships, provided they stayed. He wasn't entirely certain that they would in the long run. Despite Senator Nea's prickly nature, Vargo hoped that she and the other rebel forces back on Kansas would be able to work with other leaders and reestablish their own local government in his absence. Naya had already begun to declare that Blue Ridge was the place where New Genevia had been born. 
though Vargo had done his best to keep her from saying it too much. By his reckoning, it was possible that as the marauders continued to hit targets in Nietzschean-controlled space, the enemy would ignore the loss of systems like Blue Ridge. But if the Neat saw it as a place where they could achieve a symbolic victory, then Nea's insistence in using New Genevia as a rallying cry was only going to land her and her people in a world of trouble. Look at that, Ashley said, grinning as they passed a line of ships drifting toward a jump gate. Harriet, dozens of them. Her statement pulled him away from his worry over the Blue Ridge system and the fact that they would now have to fend for themselves as the marauders marched on. Sure does feel good taking the neat toys and using them to bludgeon them to death, Vargo replied with a laugh. Speaking of taking the enemy's ships, there's the Fury Lance. It's just on the far side of that. Wait, is there a black hole orbiting that brown dwarf? Ashley asked with a nervous laugh. What did they get up to here? Vargo shook his head, grinning as he watched the black hole flare brightly as it devoured some small piece of mass. All I know is that with Rika in the mix, it was probably her doing. Lost Sheep Stellar Date 10.26.8949 Adjusted Years Location MSS Fury Lands Region Epsilon Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika stood at the front of the briefing room, surveying the commanders of her marauders as they settled into their chairs. If it wasn't for the mountain of work ahead of them, she would have taken a moment to consider how surreal it was that she now commanded a force that consisted of over 2,000 mechs, 21 ships, and another 600 ships crew. When they had arrived a day prior, she had been, and still was, astounded by how many of the mechs rescued from Stavros's Politica, had ultimately signed up with the Marauders. In addition to those new additions, other mechs had flocked toward Pira when they heard about the special battalion that had been established within the mercenary organization. On top of those new Marauders, Colonel Adira and her demons had sworn to follow Rika into battle. Adding her forces to the tally, there were well over 3,000 people looking to Rika for guidance. Many in the room were newly minted lieutenants, captains, and majors, as well as the battalion senior noncoms. Rika had directed the mechs from her original company to sit interspersed throughout the room. She didn't want to create the perception that there was an in-crowd, even if it was partially true. Luckily for her, there had been a lot of reunions over the past day, and many bonds were reforming, which kept new additions from feeling left out. You gonna start talking at some point? Marn asked from his seat at the front of the room. Rika gave the sergeant major a steely-eyed look, and he only shrugged. Seriously, I could use a warm-up on my coffee if you want to wait a few more minutes. Rika decided to ignore him and shook her head before clearing her throat. The action brought the room to order, stilling the assemblage in a few seconds, every eye on Rika. Why is this more terrifying than staring down a battalion of Nietzscheans? Relax, Rika, you've got this, Nikki said, sending a warm feeling of encouragement. She hoped so. Rika had been reciting her speech all morning, the things she was going to say, predicting the responses, and then preparing her counters to any descent. Glancing to the left, her gaze met that of Colonel Adira, who leant against the bulkhead at the edge of the platform. The woman gave her a smile and nodded encouragingly. But as she looked out over the room, at the mechs and vanilla humans alike, she knew that her stilted speech was not what they needed to hear. Swallowing, she drew a deep breath and said the first thing that came to her mind. We're all outcasts. The words fell from her lips onto the ears of her waiting audience. Whether we were abandoned, pushed out, or defeated, we all lost everything five years ago when the remnants of the Genevian government surrendered. And honestly, most of us lost everything long before that. All around the room, heads nodded in agreement, and Rika nodded with them. Even though it's easy to feel that way, and though it may have been true once, outcast no longer defines us. Once we may have lost everything, but now, 
Now we've found something. When General Mill formed the Marauders, it was clear that he did so with a singular purpose in mind. Halt the advance of Nietzsche into the Precipi Cluster, and maybe someday strike back against the Empire. Most of you never met the General, and I didn't get the opportunity to know him well myself. But I do know that he'd be grinning ear to ear at the ass whipping we've given the Nietzsche so far. I bet he would have pissed himself with glee when the enemy was thrashed at Pira. There were grins all around the room, and Rika caught Captain Penny of the Perseids' dream laughing softly. Even Major Tim, sitting on Penny's right, wasn't frowning for once. I'm sure you've all heard the stories of why the Allied forces hit Pira with such a decisive blow. They came to save one of their own, a woman named Tannis Richards. Now, I know what you're thinking. That Tannis Richards is their commander, that it makes perfect sense that they'd save her. But I know that they would have done the same for any of their people, because they truly value life. Heads bobbed throughout the room, primarily from people who were present at Pira, but a few others joined in as well. As I said, most of us were abandoned during the war. Rika's eyes turned to meet Silva's. Some of us more than once. We were expendable, acceptable losses, and eventually we were outcast. That's the last time I'll use that word. The last time I'll think of myself in that light. I can't promise you a perfect future. I sure as hell know that we can't atone for the past. But what we can do is the right thing right now. Rika clasped for G and R's barrel and stared out over the officers and non sitting before her, trying to find the right words for what she was going to propose next. Barn opened his mouth to speak, but Leslie drove an elbow into his side before he'd even uttered a word, and then the yellow-eyed woman winked at Rika and gave her a small smile. We have a team out there that's been sidetracked. Lieutenant Colonel Alice has taken a fire team far across Genevian space to the Iberia system. We don't know why, but I plan to go there and find out. I'm suspicious of Colonel Alice's motives, but I know that Allison's team is not complicit in whatever's going on. Military doctrine would say that we should continue to press our advantage here, probably divide our fleet and hit two systems at once, drive the neats before us. But we're not going to do any of that. She couldn't help but glance in Major Tim's direction to see his eyes widen and let a small smile grace her lips as a result. We're all going to the Iberia system to find our lost sheep. You finally said it. Nikki's tone combined both happiness and a hint of derision. Good girl. There's an art to these things. Oh, I know, but that didn't stop me from wondering if you'd ever managed to find the words. Thanks for the support, Nikki. Anytime though Major Tim appeared especially consternated by Rika's proclamation, he was not the only one in the room that appeared surprised by the news. Remember, Rika raised a finger as she surveyed the assembly, every person in this room was rescued at least once in the war, and again after. None of us would be here today if not for the aid of others. If the GAF's high command had cared enough for its lost sheep during the war, things might have turned out differently. But now we're Genevia, the new Genevia, and we don't leave anyone behind. Iberia, though, Colonel? Major Tim finally blurted out. There's nothing there. Well, nothing other than our people, Rika replied equably. She didn't want to get into a pissing match with the Major during her first full battalion briefing. You're right, though. Iberia's not a major system, but we'll go there nonetheless. We'll likely take it, too, depending on what the situation looks like when we arrive. Several of her officers appeared confused, and Rika nodded to Captain Scarcliffe. I see a question in your eyes, Captain. Um, thank you, Colonel. I'm all for going after Allison, and I see the logic in your plan. Iberia is 60 light years from here, and there's no way that we can coordinate our forces across that distance. So if anyone goes, we all go. But Iberia is very close to Parsons, and the Neats have a strong presence there. If we liberate Iberia, it won't be long before the enemy is back on their doorstep. Rika raised an eyebrow. 
a smile playing at the corners of her lips as she held Scarcliffe's gaze. Really? He whispered. Behind Rika, a view of the Nietzschean Empire appeared, beginning at the Theban and Septian border on the left side and stretching to the far fringes of Nietzsche on the right. I know our plan was to skirt the perimeter of the empire, hit Blue Ridge, gather what intel we could, and then move on to Calter. But since we're moving further in with our diversion to Iberia, I'm changing track entirely. A line appeared, hopping between star systems as Rika spoke. We hit Iberia, then Parsons, then we'll see what opportunity presents itself, but likely head toward Cornwall. From there, I see us swinging by Marcia. And then the Genevia system, Major Tim blurted out. Rika nodded soberly. And then Genevia. Murmurs spread through the room, and Tim spoke up again. Colonel Rika, we don't have the logistical support to mount an attack that deep in Nietzschean space. The guy just can't keep his mouth shut, can he? Nikki asked. Rika sent Nikki a wink. I kind of count on him to ask these questions now. I had originally planned the presentation around it. I know, you recited it to me a dozen times. You just had to comment on his commentary? Rika asked. Touche. She'd not spoken aloud during her conversation with Nikki, only stared intently at Major Tim. Her silence quelled the other murmurs in the room, and the Major began to redden. After 30 long seconds, Rika finally spoke. Why, thank you for reminding me of that, Major. She glanced at the tall woman who leaned against the wall to the left of the raised platform. Colonel Adira has operated within Genevia's former borders since the end of the war five years ago, after she and her original crew evac from the Coulter system, which is where their most recent strike took place. They operated near Parsons in Cornwall. Rika paused as Adira straightened and flipped her long ebony hair over her shoulder before addressing the room. My battalion hit outposts near Parsons twice in the past year, and we've gone as far as Cornwall, as Rika said. We know where a dozen old stockpiles are, and we also know of a few Nietzschean outposts that are less than well defended. Which is good, Rika said as she resumed, because most of our ships are Nietzschean. More people than just Major Tim were looking worried, as Adira outlined a few locations they could hit for supplies. Scarcliffe's eyebrows were raised, though he was holding his tongue, and even Captain Penny seemed uncertain. I get it, Rika said as her gaze swept over the group. This is scary, but if we push hard, we can reach Genevia in half a year. Then we take our old capital back and reestablish our nation. And then the neat show up and crush us, Tim all but shouted, his arms thrust in the air. Seriously, Rika, this is nuts. Rika looked to the back of the room, where a newcomer had just slipped in right on cue. It's not nuts. Every head in the room turned to see that the speaker was Admiral Carson of the Intrepid Space Force. He nodded to the marauders as he skirted the edge of the room and approached the raised platform. Rika and I have spoken with Field Marshal Richards, and she approves of this plan. Moreover, she's committed ISF resources to the strike. You're coming with us? Captain Heather asked, a look of relief on her face. Carson shook his head. No, that gives away too much. But when you're in position to take Genevia, we'll be ready to spring the trap on the neat. The fact that your path to Genevia is all but a straight line guarantees that they'll know you're coming. As Rika likes to say, we'll play that part by ear. But my fleet will be ready to join the fight when it will hurt the Nietzsche the most. And resupply? Major Tim asked, scowling at Admiral Carson. Forgive me, sir, if I'm not too excited by the idea of scavenging our way to Genevia. Carson clasped his hands behind his back and turned to face the major. Boy, don't talk to me like you know war. I watched the Red Fleet burn off the starward side of Eris when the people who founded Genevia weren't even a twinkle in their great-grandparents' eyes. 
I hunted Syrian scout ships in the interstellar darkness beyond the cap's heliosphere and flew fighters through nuclear fireballs in Bolam's world. At New Canaan, I saw teenage girls face down Trisilians carriers that make those Harriets out there look like quaint little toys. You think you know war because of your fight with the Neats. I've been at war for centuries. Carson's words were dulled out with a quiet menace that caused the major to shrink back in his seat and redden even further. Seriously, that has to shut him up for the rest of the meeting, Nikki said with a laugh. Rika gave the ISF admiral an appreciative look. We will, of course, ensure that the ISF fleet is ready to join in before we hit Geneva. We have more Quancom blades now, so we won't be without lines of communication like we were previously. In the front row, Byrne raised his hand. Colonel, Admiral, with ISF jump gate tech, can we not just jump to Iberia now and beat Alice there? Carson gave Barn an apologetic shake of his head. I'm sorry, Sergeant Major. We need the gate tugs that brought your new ships here taken back to the Albany system. Things are heating up with the hegemony, and we're taking thousands of the Nietzschean ships we captured out to Spica for refit. Jumping your ships to Iberia will either chew up a gate or require those tugs to spend over a hundred days getting back to Albany. The Geneva system will be one where it's worth establishing a permanent gate presence, Rika added. Though our friends in the Alliance have the ability to jump aid across the galaxy in the event of dire need, or farther from what I've heard. However, jump gates themselves are at a premium. It's true, Carson replied. Stars, my fleet alone has 11 ships trailing along from final engagements, hauling the last gate used from places that no longer need them. Too bad you can't have a gate that can jump itself, Barnes said with a shake of his head. If wishes were fishes, physics isn't going to bend to your desires. Lieutenant Carson patted Barn on the shoulder from where he sat in the row behind him. You're just backing the Admiral because you have the same name, Bondo, Barn growled without turning. This is all just long-term thinking at present, Rika said, giving Barn a pregnant look before continuing. We can change course midway if necessary and we won't commit to battles we don't think we can win. There are only so many of us, and I'm not putting marauders carelessly at risk. Admiral Carson placed a hand on Rika's shoulder. Your Colonel Rika has the ISF's full support, and we'll be there when you need us. We came to Albany, and we came here to Epsilon. We'll come to Geneva and help you take your nation back. With that, he shook Rika's left hand and exited the room. I like that guy. Nikki commented, seems down to earth. Funny, since he was born on earth, Rika replied. Meh, lots of the ISF people were not such a big deal with them. From there, Rika brought Barn up to review force deployment across the fleet ships, and following that, Heather discussed maneuvers she wanted the captains to practice in Sims over the 60-day journey to Iberia. The meeting went on for most of the day, but when it finally concluded, Rika felt as though her marauders, both old and new, were gelling well. Yet despite her words of assurance to her people, she too was nervous about what lay ahead. They were going against an entire empire with just a few dozen ships and a few thousand troops. Granted, those troops were mechs. The Neats will never know what hit them. Shepherds. Stellar date 10.26.8949, adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lands, Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Do you have a minute? Adira asked Rika as the room emptied out. Of course, Rika replied as she turned to the leader of the demons. What's on your mind? Adira chewed at her lip for a moment as her piercing green eyes stared into Rika's. Then she glanced at the last few people as they filed out of the room, clearly waiting for them to be alone. You know that we can use the link to talk, Rika said with a laugh. We can speak privately in our heads. Yeah, Adira let out a self-deprecating chuckle. It just feels weird when I'm standing face to face with someone, 
I'm not always as good at controlling my expressions as you are. Okay, last one's out. See, we can talk normally. Works for me, Rika replied and waited for Adira to speak her piece, which didn't take long as the other colonel jumped right in. I'm worried about the marauders. You mean my people? Rika's brows lowered. No, well, sorta, not your marauders, the marauders. I've known about them for some time now. General Mills seemed like a stand-up guy, but he spent the last five years outside of Nietzschean space. I feel like maybe he ended up with a lot of cowards in the ranks, Rika asked. Well, I was going to say people like your Major Tim, but you've sort of hit the nail on the head. My demons all stayed behind, fought against the Nietzsche from inside. Sure, we didn't build up a thousand ship fleet like the Marauders have out there in Septia, but we made a real difference for people still stuck on the inside. I get that, Rika said with a nod. You're worried that if I get orders from General Julia back at Marauder HQ that are less than ideal, that I'll follow them to your demon's detriment. Nail on the head, Rika, nail on the head. Rika pursed her lips, choosing her next words carefully. My loyalties are complicated. I didn't join the marauders of my own free will. They bought me at auction. Fuck, seriously? Adira's eyes widened, and she shook her head in disbelief. And you're still with them? Rika shook her head, mirroring Adira. Like I said, it's complicated. Someone was gonna buy me at that auction. And in retrospect, I'm glad it was the marauders. But the fact that they did it, and required that I pay off part of my purchase price. Well, let's just say it still wrinkled. So why'd you take that shit? Adira asked, her voice filled with a simmering rage. I would have torn someone limb from limb. Rika met Adira's eyes. Having been inside the empire, you must know how it was for those of us who got released back into civilian life. Freedom was brutal. A part of me was just so happy to belong again that I ignored that I was still being treated like a thing. I also felt like the old man's heart was in the right place, even if I didn't agree with all of his methods. Okay, I get that, Adira replied with an understanding nod, though a rage still simmered in her eyes. We don't always get nice, simple choices. Stars, I can't even remember the last time I got one of those. But still, you took these Nietzschean ships. You could have sold just one of the destroyers and paid your debts and been done with the marauders. And what would that teach everyone who serves under me? Rika asked. They signed contracts too. Do I show them that my word is meaningless? What will that do to their trust in me? Okay, so you are where you are. Adira's voice was resigned. Though you seem to have enough latitude to do as you please right now, I can guarantee that your Major Tim is going to send a message back to Albany with the ISF. When it finally gets to Marauder HQ, they may force a change in your plan. Rika's lips drew into a thin line. I'm not so sure about that. There's a lot going on beyond Nietzsche's borders. I'm sure you've heard a lot of rumors about the ISF and the Scipio Alliance, right? Some, Adira nodded. I mean, the ISF ships are fucking amazing. I've never seen anything like them before. Yeah, there's something else. The ISF's leader, well, the leader of their military at least, teamed up with this other group from a thousand light years coreward of here. Wait, Adira held up her hand. Beyond the edge of the Orion arm? There's nothing out there. A grin formed unbidden on Rika's lips. That's what I used to believe too. Turns out that while the FGT did disappear, they were never really gone. Adira's eyes widened. FGT? You mean the ancient terraformers? Yeah, Rika winked as she nodded and continued. A few years back, Admiral Tannis Richards teamed up with them, and they formed an alliance with Scipio, which does not give me the warm fuzzies. Adira gave a firm shake of her head, ebony locks flipping across her face. They have a reputation, you know, Rika chuckled. <laughs> oh, I know, I've heard my share of tales. Did you know that they have a building in their capital built entirely out of the bones of their enemies? Adira snorted. 
I've heard that. I don't know if I believe it. Believe it, Rika replied. Back in Albany, I was at a bar, and a few of their captains came in. Turns out that pretty much every crazy thing you've ever heard about Scipio is true. Scipian captains in the Albany system? Adira's eyebrows rose. What the hell were they doing there? Fighting Nietzscheans, Rika gave the other SMI a wink. That puts them in my good graces no matter how weird their people are. Shit, okay, I'm going to spend some time on the Fury Lance during the flight to Iberia. I need to hear more about that. So what does all this have to do with you possibly getting shit orders from your General Julia? Right, well, that's the thing. Septia and Thebes have both signed on to the Scipio Alliance. Despite the fact that it has Scipio in the name, it's really all being run by Tannis Richards. The fine print in the Alliance's treaties say that the whole thing only stays in effect so long as she's the one in charge of the combined military might. And I take it you trust her implicitly or something? Well, I did save her life that one time. She kind of owes me. Okay, now I really need to hear your stories. Me? Rika asked. You have K1R dragons and that insane warhammer you walk around with? I want to hear about how you survived all this time inside the Empire. That's a hell of a lot more impressive than just about anything else I've heard in the last few years. Well, aside from the ISF and learning that the FGT still exists. Right, Adira clapped Rika on the shoulder. Aside from those two ridiculously amazing things, do you have anything to eat on this Nietzschean hunk of junk, by the way? Whoa there, girl. Rika wagged a finger at the SMI-3. The Fury Lance is no Nietzschean ship. Not anymore. This is a mech ship. And besides, we have strawberries. What's a strawberry? It's your taste buds version of all this mind-blowing stuff. Old Times. Stellar Date, 10.26.8949. Adjusted Years. Location, MSS Fury Lance. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Despite her words, an issue on the Trenton called Adira back to her ship, and Rika arrived at the Lance's mess alone. There, she grabbed a tray and worked her way down the line, picking out a chicken breast, grabbing a heap of mashed potatoes, and finally selecting a pasta salad. The mechs in line with her kept trying to let Rika pass in front of them, but she declined each time, insisting that she could wait her turn. At the end of the line, she picked out a bowl of banana pudding and then poured a cup of coffee before turning and heading toward the officer's table. Okay, maybe officer's corner now. Three of the four tables on the far end of the mess hall were filled with lieutenants, captains, and senior noncoms but the furthest was reserved for the members of Basilisk and the other senior marauders. Barnes sat across from Leslie, who Rika had given a field promotion to Major and designated as the battalion's XO, what with Alice being AWOL. Chase sat next to Barn. He still held the prestigious role of captain of M Company and was more than content to remain in command of that contingent. The others present were Captains Heather and Scarcliffe, though Heather was one seat away from Leslie, leaving Rika her customary place at the middle of the table. Well, look who it is, Barnes said as Rika approached. Still eating with us plebs? Rika set her tray down on the table and surveyed the arrangement. Okay, I know we have our own table and all, but have we really denoted separate sides for boys and girls? Chase glanced at Barn on his right and Scarcliffe on his left. Uh, I guess? Well, I'm breaking all the rules, Silva said as she settled down next to Scarcliffe. Besides, I want to get to know the captain here better. Scarcliffe had been more focused on his meatloaf than the conversation around him and glanced at Silva in surprise. S what? You heard me, Silva gave Scarcliffe a nudge. Now that we're both captains with our own companies, you and I can finally get busy. Scarcliffe quickly swallowed his mouthful and gave Silva an appraising look. You've hardly ever said two words to me before. Silva shrugged and her face took on a wounded expression. I've been recovering from my plight. She's messing with you, Scarcliffe, Rika said while glaring at Silva and shaking her head. Silva's only interested in her GNR. 
Silva reached back and patted her gun's barrel, which was currently slotted into the mount on her back. True, this thing's man enough for me. Barn leant around Chase, staring at Silva with an open-mouthed smile. I have so many questions right now. Leslie nodded vigorously. Yeah, spill it, Silva. Really, Leslie? Rika asked. I thought you'd civilize Barn, not become corrupted by him. Innocent old me? Corrupt Leslie? Barn gave Rika a wide-eyed look while placing a hand on his chest. I don't know if I should be pleased or impressed. That doesn't make any sense, Chase said before sliding a fork full of mashed potatoes into his mouth. Yeah, you're right, Barn gave an exaggerated shrug. It made a lot more sense in my head. I gotta say, Rika looked at Barn and then Silva. You two did great work getting the latecomers up to speed. We've got a solid fighting force here. Mostly Barn's work, Silva said graciously. I just stood around and looked menacing. It's true, Barn agreed, nodding vigorously. I did all the work. Barn, Silva exclaimed. I'll tell them about the thing. The thing? Heather leaned in, eyes alight. I want to hear about the thing. Barn gave Silva a measuring look before his gaze swept across the table. The thing is that there is no thing. Really? Scarcliff asked. I'll put ten on the thing being with a girl. I'll put Barnes' life on it not being with a girl, Leslie said sweetly, too sweetly, and Barnes' eyes widened in alarm. On top of there being no thing, there was most certainly not a thing with any girls, he insisted, then changed tracks. Rika, did I tell you that the Septians tried to recruit away a bunch of our mechs? What? Seriously? Rika set her fork down and glowered at the sergeant major. After they signed with us? No. Silva shook her head. Well, sorta. That is not a useful answer, Scarcliff interjected. Silva set her fork down and drew a deep breath before she spoke. At first, they did it with a group of mechs that were still making up their minds. Though they'd taken the transports from the Peloponnese system to Albany, so it was pretty much a done deal that they'd sign on with us. Anyway... One to those mechs saw that they'd be in mixed platoons, sometimes as the only mech. They knew it would likely be more of what we experienced in the GAF. I sweetened the pot by showing them the Mark IV upgrades, and after that, there wasn't a lick of doubt. They were all on board with us. Don't worry, Rika, Silva added. I made extra sure the stragglers were committed during our round of boot. Yeah, Byrne nodded emphatically. Silva rode them. Shit, Barn, does everything you say have to be laced with innuendo? Heather asked. For the second time that meal, Barn placed a hand on his chest and adopted a wounded expression. It's like you don't even know me, Heather. Stay on track, Rika said, waving her fork in a circle. You made it sound like they tried to recruit mechs away afterward, too. Sure as shit did. Silva's brow lowered and her lips set in a thin line. I think they got wise to the mechs wanting to be in a mech-only command. So they put out that they were looking to create an all-mech company. What happened after that? Rika pressed. Barn laughed. Oh, this is good. Silva leaned over, looking past Scarcliff and Chase to give the sergeant major a steely gaze. You want to tell it? Sure. Shut up, Barn. Silva shot back and glared at him, challenging the man to respond. When he wisely kept quiet, she turned back to Rika, a wide grin on her lips. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, somehow the field marshal got wind of the Septians and their recruitment efforts. Next thing I hear, every Septian warship in the system is burning for the jump points. Not sure what she said to them, but it seemed to involve some liberal doses of get the hell out. Glad she has our back, Rika said, sharing Silva's smile. Tannis told me a bit about her meeting with the Septian president. Let's just say that she was not impressed. I mean, both of the assaults on the Albany system have involved Septian traitors. They're not really doing well at keeping their own house in order. Expanded too fast. Barn glanced around the table. Too hard to keep control. Granted, we're kind of doing that too. What with the whole strike at the heart plan. We're not looking to control, Rika corrected. Each system is capable of governing itself for a year or two before Genevia is reestablished. Think that will happen? Silva asked. 
I mean, seriously. One Genevia? Or will it be a bunch of smaller independent states? Uh, Rika shrugged. I suppose that's up to the systems to figure out. If they sign on to the Scipio Alliance, they'll have the Allies backing. So maybe they don't need to be one big nation anymore. I'm more worried about what will happen as we pass through, Heather said with a note of concern in her voice. We're creating a power vacuum. I know, Rika replied solemnly. But Nietzsche has to be stopped. I don't know anyone who feels differently. If we work our way in slowly, they'll dig in. Our best bet is to break them with this blade strike, and then deal with the fractured mess afterward. I know I'm a bit of an optimist, but I really feel like a lot of systems are just plain tired of fighting. I think we can provide enough security while everyone gets themselves back on their feet. You hope, Barn replied. Rika gave the surly sergeant a genuine smile. Hope's worked out really well for us lately. I'm going to give it a chance and see if its streak can keep going. I've got 20 credits on Hope, Scarcliffe said with a laugh. Just 20? Silva asked. Scarcliffe shrugged. Barn cleaned me out on the bet over the thing. Damn it, there's no thing. Resident. Stellar date, 10.27.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Fury Lands. Region, Epsilon, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Though Rika had tried to tour as much of the Fury Lands as possible, she'd not even set foot in a tenth of the bays, passages, and disparate rooms within the ship. At present, she was walking down an unfamiliar passage that led toward the secondary midship node chamber. Normally, the chamber would be occupied by a series of NSAI cores, but Lieutenant Carson had moved them all to a nearby bay to make room for the chamber's new occupant, Piper. How's he doing, for real? Rika asked Nikki. And I know it sounds ungrateful, but how much access do we give him to the ship? Regarding his state of mind, I've been talking with him as much as I've been able to over these past two days. The short answer, I'm still not sure. Rika wondered about Nikki's qualifier. As much as possible? I thought you could multitask better than that. Oh, I can. He's just not used to talking that much. Not only that, but he's mourning the loss of his other selves. It's messed him up more than he expected. Though Rika conceptually understood that the other fragments of Piper that they'd been unable to rescue from their respective moons were sentient beings, and that they were also a part of Piper's mind, it was nearly impossible for Rika to fathom the sort of internal strife that may cause a person. She imagined it would be like losing parts of your mind, but parts that had diverged. It was possible that backups could be reintegrated, but doing so would change who you were, and possibly not for the better. So is there an answer to my question in there somewhere? Rika asked. Stars, Rika, it's tough. I am the last, and I mean the last AI you'll ever meet that would advocate restricting another AI's access to the nets. The fact that you've just said those words hints at what we should do. Well, if you had brought squishy human refugees with no link onto the ship, there wouldn't be much reason to worry about your security, right? Almost zero, Rika agreed. However, if you brought a mentally unstable K1R onto the ship, you may have cause for concern. I'm with you there. Piper is like a platoon of mentally unstable K1Rs. Rika sighed, slowing as they approached the node chamber where Piper was being installed. So what do we do? Well, if he was the linkless, squishy equivalent of an AI, it would be fine. Between Potter and I, we could keep him in check. But there may be times when Potter and I aren't on the ship. I don't want any sort of active limiting placed on his access, though. Rika replied, remembering the network restrictor device and the NSAI attack drones that had watched Piper for centuries. He'd feel like he was trading one prison for another. I know. This takes us back to my initial statement of being the last AI to ever want to do anything close to shackling another sentient. Because of what happened to you on the Persephone Jones, where we found you? Nikki didn't respond at first and Rika could feel that there was some sort of turmoil in the AI's mind. What is it? I've just been around a long time, Rika. 
Being shackled on the Persephone Jones wasn't my first brush with that sort of imprisonment. It wasn't even terribly effective, if you recall. I let you all disable me and get me off that ship. I know, I know. Rika laughed softly at how Barnes still thought that he'd been instrumental in saving Nikki. They'd not had the heart to let him know that Nikki herself had set those wheels in motion. Granted, Barnes had been the hands that had done the work, without which Nikki would still be on the Jones, so she felt that it was a harmless bit of misdirection. So, if I get your meaning, if we're going to give Piper unfettered access to the general ship net, he's not a marauder, so he gets what any visitor would, then we need to ensure that there's always an AI aboard to keep watch and ensure he's not stepping out of bounds. We should really have a ship's AI anyway, Nikki replied. Only our three former Genevian marauder ships have them. None of the Nietzschean ships do. Adira has a ship's AI on the Trenton as well, Rika supplied. I know that, Rika. Nikki sent a mild feeling of exasperation. I was referring to AIs you can move to the Fury Lands. I know you and Adira are all chummy, but I doubt she's going to let you nab her ship's AI and ensconce her in the lands. Okay, fair point. She nodded, reaching the final bin before the node entrance and stopping to finish the conversation with Nikki. However, taking Cora from the Golden Lark or Moshe from the Perseid's dream would cause Major Tim to crawl further up my ass than he already is. <laughs> I think you have that figure of speech wrong, Nikki said with a laugh. My understanding is that an ass kisser is someone who is a yes man, and someone who crawls right up inside is the ultimate version of that. Dead wrong, Nikki. One of those things hurts and the other doesn't. Not that I want to get into the biology of all this. Either way, I like Cora and Moshi where they are. I need someone I trust to keep an eye on Tim. Okay, well, there are three other AIs on those ships that they could spare in a pinch. Lauren is on the Perseid's Dream, and Jane and Frankie are on the Golden Lark. Rika nodded slowly, looking through each of the AI's service records. None of the three had ever been ship's AI on anything so large as the Fury Lands. In fact, only Jane had ever run a ship at all. Oh, wait. What's this, Nikki? Frankie was a facility AI on something called Mont Wilton? What's that? Not sure. I'll ask him, Nikki replied. Frankie currently ran the drop bays on the Golden Lark, and the ship was near the Fury Lance in the formation. As a result, Nikki's conversation with the other AI only took seconds. Damn, he doesn't share this often, I guess. But Mont Wilton was a station out in the Pembroke system, upscale transfer terminal of some sort. He managed all the mass balancing and traffic coming in and out of the station. How big was it? Rika asked, intrigued that the unassuming Frankie had once held such an important position. Keeping a station in a stable orbit, while its mass was constantly changing with ships coming and going was no mean feat, and one that required a sharp and focused AI, usually backed by an array of NSAIs. Still trying to get details out of him. Shit, the thing was over 500 clicks across. Sounds like we have our AI, Rika said, feeling a sense of relief. If he could manage something like that, the Fury Lance should be a breeze. Well, he may not be interested in the job. I'm sensing hesitation. I'll work on him. Rika pursed her lips, wondering why nothing was ever easy. What about Potter? Do you think she'd do it? Well, we could strong arm her into it. She kind of does half duty as ship's AI right now anyway. But I get the impression that she likes going out on missions with the mechs. She's a bit of a thrill seeker. Never having considered what sort of thrills AI sought, Rika paused to wonder what Potter got out of the arrangement. She's even talked about getting a mobile frame, now that we have access to the ISF's more advanced tech. What, she didn't want to go into something meaty like a K-1R body? Rika asked with an irony-laced laugh. In a word, no. The answer didn't surprise her in the least. K-1Rs drew weapons fire like nothing else on the battlefield. There were times that Rika had wished for one of their monster chain guns with each barrel capable of tri-fire modes like her GNR. But the mobility that being an SMI offered, she felt, was far superior, as evidenced by the fact that she and Kelly once took out a K-1R on their own. The memory of that day on Nera came back to her, standing atop the poor K-1R that had been turned to the Nietzschean side, 
firing rounds directly into its body as the metal monster tried to choke the life out of Kelly. For so long, that ultimate victory had been bittersweet, linked so closely to the memory of Kelly's death, which had turned out not to be a death at all. Even now, the memory of that three-day slog on Nera hadn't caught up with the fact that Kelly was still amongst the living, and the same pain came back. Rika supposed that the memory of holding her friend in her arms with a hole blown through her torso was never going to feel great. Okay, she brought herself back to the present. So let's assume we wrangled someone into being the Lance's AI full-time. Where does that leave us with Piper? I vote for wireless access only. Nikki's voice contained a tendril of pained regret. We can easily reduce or even sever that access through a variety of means. At present, he has a small low-gain antenna on his core. Let's just feed him carefully buffered power for now, and then see how things proceed from there. Sounds like a plan. We'll see how things play out from there. That's what I said. Rika groaned as she pushed herself upright. I know, I was agreeing. You were repeating. Why are all AIs so surly? Nikki only laughed as they rounded the corner and walked into the entrance to the node chamber. In the middle of the space sat the looming shape of Piper's core. Five meters cubed, covered in shielding and a variety of status indicators, it loomed over them in the general disarray of the room. Sorry, the digs aren't as tidy as your old space, Piper. Rika apologized as she approached. Rika, Nikki, trust me, a change is nice even if it is disarray. Plus, it feels nice to be cozy. After spending centuries stationed above a 500-kilometer-deep shaft, at the bottom of which was a black hole. I bet the mech dragon ride through space didn't help either, Nikki said with a laugh. Rika shook her head, a smile forming on her lips. Adira and her mechs are a bit nuts. I've never felt so vulnerable in my life. I'll agree that I certainly would have preferred a ship wrapped around me, Piper replied with a soft laugh. But I was so glad to be out of that cursed place that it was more a relief than anything else. You know, a voice came from behind the core. If I had some help down here, we'd be done already. Rika walked around Piper's core to see the AM-X mech staring down at a mess of power conduits that previously fed the dozen NSAIs the chamber normally contained. Too heavy for you? She asked with a laugh as Stripes pulled one conduit under another and then laid it out straight. No, just... He straightened and grabbed a cloth to clean the grime off his hands, one of which was standard AM style, while the other was a massive K1R gauntlet. Piper here doesn't exactly have standard hookups. Been a nightmare trying to get the right power to the right place. I appreciate your efforts, Corporal, Piper said. I'm no longer drawing on my internal reserves, though I'm having to keep cogitation to a minimum. Glad it's working, Stripe said, gesturing to a pair of power lines that connected to a series of four chained converters, the last of which was connected to the AI's core. Just keep the draw low. I have the fab shop working on a single converter, but it's going to take a day to make and then put it through its paces. Then I need to make three more. Should we ask the ISF for help? Rika asked. Maybe they'll have something that would work. Carson reached out, Stripe said as he shifted another line. They don't have anything close, as it turns out. They could fab one, too, but I'd prefer that we do it here so that if we need to make more, we have the process down. Seems prudent, Nikki commented. Send me your spec, Stripes. I may have a design that could suit our needs here. Really? Stripes glanced at Rika's stomach and Rika laughed, tapping her head. She's up here now, Stripes. Sure, yeah, but then I'm looking at your eyes and that seems weird. Seems weirder to have you looking at my belly button. The corporal rose and glanced at Rika's abdomen once more. Good thing you don't have one of those anymore. I've still got a bioport in its place. Rika tapped her armored stomach. Not that I plan on ever sucking Nutra paste in through it again. Never say never, Nikki intoned. You have no idea how many times I've had to eat words like that in the past. Stripe snorted. I'd rather eat words than Nutra paste. Nice one, Rika laughed. Okay, well, if you're gonna stay here and babysit our new AI, I'm gonna go check on the fab shop. Corporal Stripes began to step carefully over the power lines that snaked across the deck. Do I need to do anything? Rika asked, yeah, don't touch anything. 
Rika shot Stripes a dirty look and then turned back to Piper, gazing up at his impassive form. So, are you actually doing all right? Maybe, the AI replied. I'm carefully segmenting my thoughts at present. With my current power allotment, I don't have the energy to review and verify the backups I pulled from my other nodes, so I don't know if they are fully operational. I'm trying to avoid thinking about the fact that they might not be. Rika nodded, once again trying to imagine what that would be like. Rika and I were discussing what sort of access to give you on the ship. A soft chuckle from Piper rumbled through their minds. I imagine that could not have been a straightforward conversation. Or maybe it was. I suppose agreement on denial would be easy. That's not where we landed, Rika replied. Well, I'm glad for that. I owe you a lot. I had only been contemplating how to die, but you gave me a chance at life again. Do you really want it? Nikki asked, a slight edge to her voice. If you're seriously considering self-termination, I'm not. Piper replied, his tone matching his words. Good, Nikki said. So what do you want to do? Rika asked. I'll remind you that we're going deeper into Nietzschean-held territory. If you want any measure of safety, staying on this ship long term is not going to provide it. And my other options. Piper's tone became guarded. Return to Pira with the ISF ships? Rika offered. There's plenty to do there, build a ring, the shipyards, salvage, no. Piper's tone brooked no dissent. I'll not venture into the same system as him. Bob? Rika asked, remembering that Piper had previously voiced uncertainty regarding meeting Bob. Yes, the one you call Bob. I've spoken to AIs aboard the ISF ship. He's, he's something I'm not ready to confront yet. Strange. Nikki commented privately to Rika. When we explained that Bob was from the Intrepid, he seemed more agreeable to meeting him. I wonder why he's changed his mind. Beats me. I'm looking to you for guidance on that one. I wonder if he's not considering it fully until he's fully powered, Nikki suggested. Very well. Then you understand that the risks and remaining aboard the Fury Lands are likely more existential than visiting Bob? I've met him and survived the experience. I do, Piper replied simply. I won't lie, encountering Bob can be a bit harrowing, Nikki added. My time with him was more difficult than yours, Rika. Was it? Piper seemed actively curious. Did you speak long with him? Quite, Nikki replied. Really? Rika asked. When was that? When you were out, while they were preparing your brain for my insertion. Something in Nikki's tone hinted to Rika that her AI was not ready to discuss the encounter in depth, and she decided to let the matter slide for now. Okay, then, she said to Piper. It's agreed. You'll stay on the Fury Lands. And I shall retain the network access you've given me, the AI asked. I would not be surprised if you'd had second thoughts. That is something organics are known for. Rika took a careful step back not wanting to mess up Stripe's web of power lines, and gazed up at the AI's core. Nikki and I have both been prisoners in our own minds and bodies before. Inflicting that on another sentient is simply not something we'd ever do. Piper didn't respond for almost an entire minute. I must admit, I'm somewhat surprised. Well, don't go thinking we're too altruistic, Nikki replied, a note of humor mixed in with her words. We're not giving you a physical network connection yet, either. I want to talk to you more once you're fully powered up and all there. Do you mean once I've reintegrated my other cores? Stars, no, Nikki exclaimed. Please don't try that, at least not until you're ready to meet Bob. You know what happens to your kind if you attempt that sort of reintegration, especially after being segmented for so long. Piper laughed softly. I was merely curious what your thoughts on the matter were. I do not plan to bring them into myself, though I do want to vet the backups. Also, I fully understand and appreciate your restriction. I do not harbor any ill will toward you for it. Rika breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks for that, Piper. I know trust is hard to come by these days. Hopefully, we've set a good foundation for it and will earn more as time goes on. Indeed, Rika of Genevia and the Marauders. 
may I ask you a question? Um, of course. I'm an open book. I'm sure you are. Piper chuckled. So much as you wish to be. However, this is not about your past. Rather, it is about your future. Well, I'll do my best. I broke my crystal ball a while back, so I'm just winging it. Oh, wow, that's an archaic reference, Nikki commented. Nice blend of sarcasm. Seriously, Nikki, analyzing the joke ruins it. What's the question, Piper? What do you intend to do when you've won? Won what? Rika suspected Piper's meaning, but she wanted him to clarify. The war with Nietzsche. What will you do regarding Geneva? Do you ask that because it enslaved both of us? Rika asked, pushing toward the point. I do. Genevia has not earned my love. I am Genevian, as is Leslie, Rika countered. You seem to like both of us well enough. Yes, but you are victimized by the same sort of behavior as I. One could make the argument that nearly everyone that is left in Genevia's former stretch of space is a victim of some sort, Nikki added. True. Piper drew the word out. But the question remains, what is your plan? Rika didn't know how to answer, largely because she didn't have one. I'm hoping that people will figure out how to put things back together. My job is just to kick the neats out and then keep on kicking. So you'll take the fight across the rift, Indonesia? Unless Tannis tells me otherwise. Tannis, Piper mused. Hmm, the AIs aboard the ISF ships called her by a different name. Oh? Rika asked, curious what it was. They call her Tendril. Rika's mouth fell open as the one word spoke volumes. Did you know about this, Nikki? I'd heard them say it, I was still investigating. Care to share? Well, it seems that Tannis and Angela may have fully ascended back on Pyrrha. They were just not ready to share it yet, though some feel that they hadn't fully realized it themselves. Rika put a hand out, grasping the corner of Piper's node. Shit, does that mean that when she gave me my... vision, she was ascended? I believe so, yes. I guess that explains how she was able to blast a hole through a hillside. Piper made a strange snorting sound. And you wonder why I declare myself not ready to go to Pira and meet Bob. See who he surrounds himself with. Tannis, uh, Tangel, is one of the best people I've ever met, Rika countered. Though one can imagine why a person would be a little concerned about her. Nikki's voice contained a smidgen of awe. So, ascended human AI merges and their directives aside. Am I to assume that your mandate is to push into Nietzsche proper once you've liberated Genevia. I'm aiming more for cut through it like a hot knife through butter than liberate, Rika clarified. The current plan is to drive almost straight to Genevia, take out the Nietzsche and regional command there, and then push on to Persia. I have a date with Emperor Constantine. You don't think small. Rika let go of Piper's core and nodded as she looked up at him. We have momentum. I don't intend to lose it, not to mention I have the ISF ready to jump in and lend a hand. Do you trust them to come when you call? They came two days ago and saved us after we saved you. I'd say their track record is pretty good. I suppose. Piper sounded as though he still had reservations, but wasn't going to press further. Don't worry. Well, don't worry yet, at least, Rika said with a laugh. I plan on testing the waters a few times before we get to Persia. Right now, that part of the plan is little more than wishful thinking as well. Once we take the Genevia system, then we'll see about moving onward. You've given me a lot to think about, Rika, Piper said after a moment. Perhaps you'll consider what you'll do with Genevia once this is all over. I would like to think that it will come under the control of the war's children, not the war's progenitors. That exact differentiation had never occurred to Rika before, and she couldn't help but feel some measure of agreement with Piper. I think that would be just, she replied. Then his words, what you'll do with Genevia, struck her like a blow from Adira's warhammer. What I'll do? 
Stars, I hope it doesn't fall to me. Nikki sent a feeling of agreement as she replied to Piper's statement. Some difficult distinctions to make in there, but I don't find myself in direct opposition to the concept. I'm glad we had this talk then. Piper laughed softly. I don't mean to be rude, but is there any chance I could have a few minutes to ruminate? Stripes will be back before long, and he's quite chatty. I'm still not accustomed to so much conversation. Of course, Rika replied, and carefully made her way over the mess of power conduits. Reach out to either of us if you need anything. We'll be boosting for another day before we make the jump to Iberia, and then it's 60 days in the dark lair. I'll be happy to be anywhere other than Epsilon, Piper replied, and I'll be sure to check in. Talk to you soon, Rika said in parting as she left the node chamber. Well, that was an enlightening conversation, she said to Nikki as she walked through the passageway. When were you going to tell me about Tangel? Honestly, I don't really know. I was still trying to get more details from the AIs on the ISF ships, but they don't have a lot of information. She never really made an official announcement to the fleet. It seemed like, just at one point, she started referring to herself as Tangel. I imagine that if we were with her, I could tell a lot from her network presence. I imagine, Rika mused, her thoughts drifting off as she wondered what things must be like for Tangel. I guess it doesn't matter. The two of them seemed to operate in concert before anyway. You could always reach out to her, Nikki suggested. Even though the ISF techs weren't able to get your internal Quancom system working again, the Fury Lance has a blade now. Rika pursed her lips as she reached a lift bank and hit the call button. Maybe not yet. I want to have Colonel boarded in my marauders all back before I speak with Tangel. Besides, it's not like she owes me an explanation. Perhaps. But maybe she'd like to give you one nonetheless. Well, if she wants to do that, she knows where I am. Nikki sent Rika a mildly disparaging feeling. You're so prickly sometimes. Seriously, Nikki, I'm prickly? Old News Stellar Date 12.07.8949 Adjusted Years Location Kuza District Cerulean Malta Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Tremen, are you ready yet? Jakob called out, standing next to the apartment's door. If we miss the train at this time of day, it's an hour till the next one. Tremen walked out of his room, pulling on his coat as he glanced at Jakob and gave his old friend a slow shake of his head. The man was obsessed with being early for everything even after all these years when it didn't really matter anymore. You know it only takes 15 minutes to get to the station, Tremen said, as he finished buttoning his coat and drew his cane out of the tall wooden tube next to the door. And the train doesn't even arrive for 25. Jakob opened the apartment's door and held it wide for Tremen. 15 if you don't stop to greet half the people you mean on the way, which I wish you wouldn't do. It's not like you're running for office. Old habits, Tremen said with a slight shrug as he walked out into the hall, his cane tapping as quietly as he could manage on the wooden floors. He didn't need the cane to walk, not exactly, though it did help him manage a bit longer. His left knee had never fully healed, and it was a long trip to the doctor he trusted enough to take a look at it. An old man's foolish fear, he chided himself. The pair walked in silence to the elevator and then rode down the four floors to the ground level. Squeaks and groans accompanied their short descent, and Tremen was glad for another safe arrival when the doors opened. He knew there was slim risk of the elevator car falling, but he couldn't help the worry. So much had gone wrong in the last decade of his life. Death by elevator seemed as though it would be a perfect end cap. What news do you think Gloria has for us? he asked as the two men walked through the small lobby and then out onto the street. Jakob's keen eyes swept across the street once, and Tremen knew he'd drawn in every detail, even the four hero girls throwing dice on the stoop two doors down, to the barely visible figure of Tamar, the enforcer for Torin's gang who stood in the shadows across the narrow street. Granted, it was easy for the man to stand in shadow. The way the buildings loomed over the ten-meter-wide street Hardly any light filtered down to ground level. 
Even in daylight hours, a fair amount of the street's illumination came from the sign hanging on the opposite building, which shone in a garish green and yellow, announcing that Flora's Den was the best place to spend your money and your night. Five years ago, the existence of places like Lord Street, tucked deep in the bowels of Cerulean's Cusa district, was what Tremon would have considered to be an intellectual fact. Now it was a visceral one. Satisfied that none of the usual suspects were likely to leap out and accost the pair, Jakob walked down the apartment building short staircase, and Tremon followed after. I don't know, Jakob said after they walked a few paces, and it took a moment for Tremon to recall the question he'd asked, which was about what intel Gloria may have for them. They walked past the streets for hero girls, their jet black skin embedded with yellow lights that raced across their bodies, twisting around their limbs, and eventually reaching the hero gang symbol that glowed on their foreheads. Their hairless look was topped off by solid yellow eyes and lips, and under their artfully draped cloaks, Tremon knew them only to wear weapons. Jakob kept one eye on the group. The four girls pretended not to be concerned with his passage, but Tremon knew that when he and his guardian had first taken up residence in this neighborhood, the local hero girls had tried to shake Jakob down. Tried being the operative word. There used to be five of them throwing dice on that stoop. The three words that Jakob had given in response to Tremon's question meant that the man didn't want to discuss the nature of Gloria's summons. His reticence didn't surprise Tremon. Their chief informant rarely had any good news. Usually it was information about some new nation that the Nietzscheans had defeated and absorbed into their empire. Though she had, from time to time, brought news of a few resistance groups who were harrying the empire. In all honesty, Tremon didn't know why they all bothered. He, Jakob, and Gloria, not the resistance groups. There was no way he was ever going to resume anything close to the position he'd had before the war. For reasons Tremon didn't understand and certainly didn't question, Jakob and Gloria stayed loyal to him, affording Tremon the same protection he had before the surrender to Nietzsche. He often wondered if Jakob stayed with him out of pity. There was no doubt in his mind that without his companion's keen eye, not to mention his highly effective fists, Tremon would be long dead. He also didn't know why they remained within the borders of the old Genevian alliance. There were a million places they could go, but for some reason, they'd made it this far and gone no further. Tremon sometimes mused that it was because they knew that once they left former Genevian space, all hope would be lost. And so here we stay, like ghosts clinging to our rotting corpse. They walked in silence for a few more minutes and came upon another of the street's denizens sitting on the curb. Hello, George, how are you today? He asked the older man with a long beard that reached his waist. Shitty, George muttered, same as when you asked me two days before and the week before that. Tremon laughed and shook his head. <laughs> Glad to hear that you're staying consistent, George. Small victories, Tremon, small victories. He greeted a few other locals as they walked the length of Lord Street. Then the pair turned onto Avonlea Boulevard where there were more pedestrians and a few ground cars meandering down the surface road. The buildings were over 30 meters apart on the boulevard, and Tremon had a clear view of the blue sky overhead and the pristine buildings that rose over Cerulean on the other side of the river. Above the skyline, Disappearing into the clouds, he could see the towers of Upper Imdina and Tarjian. From his current vantage, the other two spiras, Seru Heights to the north and Sorna to the south, were obscured. Those structures rose over ten kilometers into the air, housing millions of Cerulean's people, each tower nearly self-sustaining, not requiring the denizens to ever leave their vertical cities. Sometimes he missed such luxuries though the two men could live in comfort in one of the towers or even in one of the wealthier eastern districts. They opted to keep to themselves in a part of the city where no one dug into your business because they didn't want you digging into theirs. After only two more short stops to talk with locals, Tremon and Jakob reached the stairs leading down to the Avonlea Boulevard station. The moving staircase hadn't worked the entire time they'd lived in the Kusa district, and Tremon was beginning to believe that no one had any intention of ever fixing it. He certainly wished they would. The moving steps were a bit larger than normal, and the extra stretch put more strain on his knee than he'd like. 
Back when he and Jakob had first taken one of the underground maglevs from the spaceport to Kuza, Tremen had expected the stations to be dangerous and in disrepair. Surprisingly, the opposite had proven to be true. It turned out that the local police cared more about the maglev stations than the roads above. Jakob had explained that since trains granted access to the whole city, letting criminal elements control the stations would be the first step in giving unsavory elements the ability to strike anywhere in Cerulean within just a few minutes. That was another thing he'd never had to personally deal with before the end of the war, that local police departments often had to make compromises based on factors such as available resources, funding, and the most effective places to control crime. Still, it surprised him that there were so many criminals tucked away in places such as Kuza. He would have expected the MEC program to have snatched them up during the war, feeding them into the grist mill. Jakob believed that the high crime rate was because most of the people living hand-to-mouth in the city found themselves in those situations only after the end of the war, not during it. Thinking back on the war always brought Trem into one conclusion— If the Genevian fleets had been as effective as the mechs they carried, Nietzsche would have lost. Not that it mattered anymore. What was done was done. He told himself that frequently in the hopes that it would combat his crushing guilt. Sometimes it was enough to momentarily distract him, but most of the time he couldn't hide from his part in things. At the bottom of the stairs, they passed through a security arch guarded by two local police officers. Tremon offered a smile and a nod to each of the guards as he and Jakob passed by. You're so damn polite, Jakob grunted. Habit, Tremon replied with a shrug. You know they're not your friend, Jakob pressed. A groan slipped past Tremon's lips. Yeah, I'm all too aware of that, but a kindness may bias consideration later. Jakob didn't answer as they stood on the underground platform waiting for the train destined for the Ryleside district. The board indicated that the next Ryleside train was five minutes out, and Tremon gave Jakob a look that said, see, plenty of time, which the other man ignored. Their destination was across the river, in the commercial district near the spaceport. That was where Gloria lived, always keeping her ear to the ground, talking with crews and learning about what was going on outside the Iberia system. Gloria was a partial mech, one of the early prototypes who only had one arm removed. He'd never seen her gun arm, but he imagined she still had it, even after all these years. He supposed a normalish arm was better for all the skulking she did. A meter-long barrel on the end of one's arm probably drew more attention than a person wanted. Gloria already does enough of that on her own. When the train arrived, They stepped onto the car and found seats close to the door, which was simple enough given that there were only five other passengers. Three appeared as one would expect of Kuza's denizens, which is to say rough. The other pair, a man and a woman sitting at the back of the car, were dressed too nicely and probably lived in Cartagena or outside the city altogether. Gloria's scouting the location, Jakob said as the car began to move picking up speed as it raced down the maglev track. Good, Tremon replied, wishing that all of this wasn't still necessary. He was nobody. None of this mattered. He shouldn't have any of Jakob's or Gloria's loyalty, let alone their continued efforts on his behalf. When the train finally reached their stop, ten minutes had passed, and the others from Kuza had long since departed, replaced by other passengers who lived in Ryleside. Jakob was first off the train, and Tremon followed close behind into the much cleaner station. Here, even more police patrolled the platform, keeping an eye on everything and paying extra attention to the train that had come from Kuza District. Jakob and Tremon were dressed casually in the loose slacks and long tunics that were the style on Malta. Neither carried any weapons and so the police didn't have cause to give them more than a cursory look as they passed under the scanners. The pair of men were the very definition of nondescript. Having avoided any entanglements, they rode the pleasantly functional moving steps up to street level and out into the bright sunshine that reached down to them, filtered through the hundreds of air cars that flitted overhead. 
All around stood low buildings, the tallest no more than ten stories. Their windows showed wares of every type imaginable, though most catered to clothing. He felt a momentary pang of guilt that most people in Kusa District could only dream of shopping in any of these stores. Granted, he was in the same situation at present. It wasn't as though he was drawing a salary anymore. Jakob's connections were the source of most of their money. She's in a cafe in that building, Jakob said, gesturing to a bright red structure that housed several restaurants, as well as a store that sold a variety of home goods, including basic servitors, though Tremon suspected that they were all refurbished. Tremon nodded and followed his protector across the plaza, deftly avoiding the hawkers and police until they came to the red building and walked through its main entrance. Inside, the structure featured ruddy basalt walls, each block carved with intricate patterns. He gave them an appreciative look as Jakob took the first ride and entered the cafe. Gloria was easy to pick out, her towering height putting her half a head above any other patron. She didn't wave, but her steely gray eyes fixed on the two men and followed them as they walked to the counter. Tremon ordered a coffee and an everything bagel, while Jakob opted for a cup of tea. Don't think you can have some of this, Tremon said to Jakob as he picked up his bagel. Wouldn't dream of it. You took so long to get ready today that I had a full lunch back at the apartment. Har har. Coffee and food in hand, they made their way to Gloria's table and sat down across from her. You look good, Gloria, Tremon said, while Jakob gave the woman a curt nod before he returned to his natural state, watching everything all at once. As do you, Tremon. I'm glad that Malta's climate agrees with you. Tremon snorted. The climate does, though I don't get much firsthand exposure to it over in Kusa. Gloria shook her head, and her lips twitched in annoyance, but she didn't strike up their age-old argument over location or the fact that he was hiding on Malta to begin with. The woman across from him may have looked like a steely-eyed menace, but he'd faced worse in his day and never backed down. A connection request for a private network came to him with Gloria's tokens. He validated them and then accepted the request. While doing that, he'd maintained light banter with her between sips of his coffee, growing more and more curious about what the woman could have to say. She didn't look quite as dour as usual, so either it was good news or she was drunk, though he'd only seen her drunk once. But good news was about as rare. Okay, Gloria, what brings us here to Rileside? I'm not reason enough, she asked with a small smile. Tremon and Jakob exchanged surprised looks. In addition to never drinking, the woman almost never joked. In fact, Tremon could barely recall her smiling. Under better circumstances, you certainly would be, he said, gently encouraging her to share whatever was so interesting. Okay, I'll not keep you balanced on a laser's beam any longer. I think this thing is just balanced on a beam, Jakob corrected, as in up in the air on a metal beam or something. Gloria cast Jakob a look that said he'd just uttered the most ridiculous thing she'd ever heard. Uh. No, it's laser beam. I'm not going to argue the obvious with you. Jakob only shrugged and lapsed back into silence. Anyway, before I was interrupted, she paused to give Jakob one final dark look. I've picked up some chatter from some traders up on the Falcon. They came straight from Ditia on a freight run. Made good speed, too. Did it in only 50 days which is why they're some of the first to come this far in with the news. News that the Neats want kept hush-hush. Spit it out already, Jakob growled. The Neatians attacked Thebes again. They tried to hit two systems at once, both Hercules and Albany. They lost in both systems. Tremon's eyes widened as he sat back in his seat. Twice? They were defeated twice in Thebes. Those people have, what, five, maybe six well-settled systems? 
give or take a bit, depending on your definition of well settled. Gloria nodded as she paused to speak aloud about the weather and how dry the summer would be. Nates don't like to lose. After failing to take Thebes a year ago, they must have gone in full force, Jakob said, and Tremon nodded in agreement. I think that's why they pulled all but a token force out of Iberia, to hit Thebes with everything they had. But remember that I'm hearing all this third or fourth hand at this point, though there's vid and scan data to support it. That can all be faked, Tremon said. Would you two stop interrupting me? Gloria placed her hands on the table. At some point, I'd like to get this out so I can go refill my java berry juice. Okay. Okay, Tremen gave her a disarming smile. Sorry, carry on. Gloria gave him a measuring look and then directed it at Jakob as well. Right, so the fleet they sent into the Albany system was somewhere in the neighborhood of 70,000 ships. Pretty much their entire core ward border fleet from the sounds of it. They swept in and took the Albany system, as you'd expect with a force that size. Rumor has it that they were trying to capture someone, a leader from a group that goes by, the Scipio Alliance. Scipio, Tremon blurted out. Allying with someone? That seems unlikely. Gloria didn't reply, only gave him a leveled stare for a minute before continuing. The rumors are all over the map. Some people say Scipio is making a play for the whole Seoul region. Some say they found new allies from further core ward. The scan data I have seems to support the latter, as only a fraction of the ships that showed up were Scipian. She paused and looked at her empty cup. Jakob, would you be a dear and get me a refill on my java berry juice? I'm mighty parched. Jakob lifted an eyebrow and groaned, but stood and grabbed her cup without further objection. Okay, so a week goes by, and then this weird thing happens. This big ship, and I mean big, like nearly 40 kilometers long, comes in from the edge of the system with a small escort fleet. It proceeds to swat any of the Nietzschean pickets that try to take a shot at it and then comes right up against the Neats' main battle group. Now, at this point, the Neats have formed up into a sort of hollow half-sphere and open fire with everything they have on this ship. What a way to go out in a blaze of glory, Jakob muttered from the counter. That's just the thing. The ship survived. The fucking Neats pissed at it for all they were worth, and that big old thing just sat there and took it. Are you kidding me? Tremon breathed. And that's not the best part. All of a sudden, this fleet appears. It's smaller than the Neats, but it catches them totally off guard because the ships just appeared out of nowhere all around the Nietzschean fleet. And this is deep in the inner system. Gloria had become a touch too animated for someone discussing the summer's crop yields and took a deep breath while Tremon fought the urge to lean over and shake every detail out of her. Okay, easy now, Gloria. She gave a small smile again. So that new fleet shows up and just obliterates the Nietzscheans. Badly enough that nearly half the enemy surrendered. A few got away, but we're only talking hundreds. So far as I can tell, the Nietzscheans suffered an unprecedented loss. Tremon felt lightheaded as he absorbed the news, like he'd just been through a centrifugal sink process on a rotating station. If he didn't trust Gloria implicitly, he would have dismissed the news out of hand. But she wasn't prone to spreading baseless rumor, typically quite the opposite. And Hercules? Jakob asked as he sat back down and set Gloria's drink in front of her. Right. Gloria nodded as she took a sip and proclaimed it to be the best cup of java berry juice she'd ever had. The Neats had sent a much smaller force there. I get the impression that it was an unconnected op. I can't see why you'd send a dozen ships into a system five light years from where you send 70,000. 
Maybe one of the operations went down before it was originally planned. Anyway, a group of mechs from a mercenary company stopped that attack. Rumors out of that system say they took the enemy ships while they were hiding in a gas giant's clouds. Ballsy, Jakob commented. Anyone we know? The Marauders, under General Mill, Gloria supplied. Though I didn't know he had mechs, at least not that many. There are some rumors that when Mill's Marauders took the Politica a few months back, they found a bunch of mechs there. Maybe they signed on or something. Tremon felt a pang of guilt stab through him at the mention of Mex. He wished he could have done something to stem the program, once he'd realized that most of the conscripts were less criminals and more victims of both poor circumstances and a bankrupt justice system. What's done is done, Tremon, he said to himself, the words a mantra he found himself repeating far too often. This is, this is something else. He finally said as he absorbed what the news meant and began thinking of the implications. Something else is exactly right. Jakob's expression was grim. If Scipio is advancing toward Nietzsche, if Scipio had crossed the French and moved into ASN coalition territory, we would have heard about that long ago, Gloria said with a shake of her head. Plus, like I said, there were comparatively few Scipian ships in the fleet. So have you heard who the new players are? Tremon asked. If that freighter has scanned data, there must have been idents. There are. The two main components were ships with ISS and TSS tags. They had some other information that led me to believe that the I stands for intrepid and the T for transcend. No idea who those people are, though. But if they can send a fleet all the way to Thebes... Gloria let the words hang, and the three fell silent for a moment. Wait a second, Tremon whispered aloud. Do you have an image of that first ship that flew in system, the huge one? Yeah, I do. Two more of them appeared later, by the way. Two more, Tremon mused, as Gloria sent the group an image of the ship. He turned it around in his mind, wondering if it was possible the ship looked different, but the main structure was the same. The pair of habitation cylinders made it hard to mistake for many other vessels. That's an ancient colony ship, he said at last. The GSS Intrepid. It left Seoul sometime back in the 42nd century. Shit, Gloria exclaimed. I'd heard of that ship. I was just a kid when it showed up at Balaam's World, though. How is it? I... I don't even know the right question to ask. There's only one real question, Tremin said, looking first at Gloria and then Jakob. Is the enemy of my enemy my friend? Tower Assault. Stellar date 12.12.8949. .12 Adjusted years. Location. Tarsian District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Scarcliff, Rika called out to in company's commander. I need your people to take out those drones. We can't get up the tower while they're roving around up there. She hunkered down behind the rim wall of the 700th level of the Tarsian Tower, alongside Q Company's HQ element, feeding her drones up over the edge to survey the nighttime view of Cerulean, spread out far below. She spotted M Company's positions in the Cerulean district to the north, hoping that M Company was faring better, hitting Sorna Tower in the Naxar district. Sorry, Colonel, Lieutenant Crudge's voice came into her mind. CO took a rail shot in the chin, tore off the bottom of his face. He's out for the count. Fuck, Rika swore as she saw the update appear on the command net. Okay, Crudge, it's on you then. I need you to tag and hit those drones yesterday. They have the central shaft locked down, so we need to scale the struts on the outside. Shit, really, Colonel? You're gonna scamper up there like bugs? Rika didn't like the idea very much either. But the 700th level was a 500-meter-wide park that offered little in the way of cover, or access further up the 15-kilometer-high tower. They couldn't remain in place for long. 
Not a lot of options here, Lieutenant. They've got E-beams in the central shaft and aren't afraid to use them. Okay, we're setting up the SAM arrays. Just give me a minute. Rika sent back an affirmation and looked over the four platoons of Q Company. They were spread around the perimeter of the park level, engaging the drones coming in from the tower's exterior, some flying and others crawling, all intent on wiping out the marauders that were trying to take the structure. The mechs were doing their best not to bunch up, but with most of the perimeter being little more than low railings, so as not to obstruct the view of the city. They were mostly situated around the columns that supported the rest of the tower above them. Aura, like Rika, crouched behind the few sections with higher perimeter walls, which were likely in place to manage the winds in case the light grav shielding that wrapped around the level went out. Huh, I think I have an idea, Rika said to Nikki. Are you into the tower's control systems yet? Not yet. The bastard had some serious defenses set up. What about this level? Can you access the perimeter grav shielding? Nikki didn't respond for a moment, then came back with, Booyah. It's part of one of the lower security maintenance systems. I'm in. What are you thinking? Well, it's a bit breezy out there. Think you can funnel winds through here to blow the bots out when they try to get in? I guess that might work a bit, on the flyers at least. Rika's response was preempted by a group of crawlers that suddenly surged over the perimeter wall and landed in front of her. Q Company's Captain Ron and Gunnery Sergeant Bookie were to her left, and both beat Rika to the punch, firing on the crawlers before she even raised her GNR. The machines were too close for anything but her projectile rounds, and she fired a dozen shots into one of the centipede-like machines while unslinging her PR-109. Captain Ron had his heavy repeater firing kinetic grape shot, and the kachug kachug shook the ground beneath her as well as the wall at her back. Bookie, an SMI-4 like Rika, pushed off the wall and leaped into the air, her whip arm extending as she flew over the bots, slashing half the legs off one as she sailed overhead to land behind them, well to the right of where Captain Ron was firing, and cutting the tail end off another bot. Rika hadn't sat still either, rising and dashing to the right, keeping her weapons fire low, and taking care not to hit any of the mechs in positions on the far side of the fight. She wished that she'd opted to use a whip arm. Bookie had the right idea. With so many friendlies around, it was a far safer option. Even though three of the crawlers were down, the remaining bots were giving as good as they got, rounds from a dozen small chain guns on each one tearing into the mechs and the barrier behind them. Rika's armor held up to the assault, at least for the first ten seconds of the engagement. But when one of the crawlers pivoted so all the guns on its back could get a clear shot at her, she knew it would make for a bad day. The thing was only seven meters away. Giving it a split second's thought, she lunged for the death machine, staying low as rounds traced through the air, hitting the wall where she'd been a moment earlier. She crashed into the crawler's legs, four of which reared up to stab down at her. But Rika's light wand was already in her hand, slicing off two of the limbs before they struck her chest. One missed her leg, but the other came down right on her stomach, and her armor flashed a fracture warning as she grunted out a breath from the impact. Rather than dealing with the legs, Rika pivoted underneath the bot and drove her light wand into its central mass before tucking her legs. She got her feet against the bot and kicked out, thrusting what had to be a ton of writhing machine into the air. As she rolled away, Rika caught sight of something slamming into the airborne bot, then heard a terrible screeching sound. Back on her feet a second later, she realized that the thing she'd seen was Corporal Harlan, a K1R-M-4 mech who had a chain gun the size of Rika on one arm and a hand that could crush a ground car on the other. One of his feet stood on the tail end of the centipede crawler, and his hand held the thing's front half in the air. The mech appeared to be looking at it curiously which wasn't actually the case, given that K1Rs didn't have anything resembling a head. His massive hand drew back, and then Harlan flung the half-bot at one of the other crawlers, bowling it over. Shit, Harlan, taking all the fun, Bucky swore as she backed away. Ron ceased firing as well, laughing over the company's combat net as the K1R fired the boosters on its back, leaping into the air, very nearly hitting the floor above, and coming down on the last two crawlers, crushing both beneath his feet. 
The guns atop the two bots were still partially active, and the ones behind Harlan fired up at him until Bookie's whip slashed out and cut them to pieces. Nice work, Corporal, Rika said a moment before attention was drawn away by movement atop the wall next to them. Shit, Captain Ron swore, leaping back and raising his repeater. The captain was too slow. Harlan's chain gun lit up first, tearing the crawlers and half a meter of wall apart. Even though Rika's helmet blocked and filtered most of the sounds of combat, there was little it could do to dampen the concussive force of the rounds bursting from the K-1R's weapon and slamming into the bots and wall. Harlan, we'd like some cover, Ron admonished. You can crouch behind me if you need to hide, Captain, the massive mech said with a laugh. <laughs> he got you there, Bucky chuckled. Rika took a moment to glance around the level, noting that half the company was engaged with swarms of crawlers. Beyond the edge of the level, she could see masses of the hover drones forming up, ready to bring about a second wave of destruction, some already firing missiles into the level. Most were shot down by the mechs, but a few struck, damaging mechs and cratering the green space. A few of the drones attempted probing strikes, but winds began to whip through the garden level, destabilizing the flying bots whenever they tried to fly over the perimeter. Huh, that worked better than I thought it would, Nikki commented. I could only do it on the leeward side, though, and the drones are figuring that out. Rika saw what the AI meant as the drones began to concentrate on the windward side of the tower. You guys having a nice coffee break down there? Rika demanded of Crudge. Any time you want to shoot those suckers down would be nice. Launching now, Colonel, Crudge replied, sounding a little harried. We had a snafu with the targeting systems. Potter had to reinitialize them. Rika tapped his company's feeds and saw hundreds of tiny surface-to-air missiles rise up from the rooftops of the lower buildings in the Targian district. They spread out and then disappeared from optical and thermal view as they went ballistic, engines offline and barely detectable as they sped toward their targets. A second before they hit, the missile's engines fired again, making the corrections required to strike the targets. Those flares preceded a veritable firework display of exploding drones, and hundreds of flaming wrecks fell from the sky, raining down around the massive tower's base. Another volley of Sam's launched before the first batch of drones hit the ground, and a minute later, Crudge called back. Crudge's sky sweeping would like to thank you for using our services. Be sure to hit us up any time you- Oh, shit. Active combat indicators lit up all around in company's positions, and Rika tapped their feeds to see a type of crawler, similar to the ones that had just hit Q Company, swarming up the buildings the SAM launchers were positioned on. Okay, people, let's get back on the move, Rika ordered Q Company. Crudge's boys and girls are gonna get real busy real fast. Captain Ron doled out the specifics, and seconds later, 400 mechs moved to the edges of the level and leaped to the tower's exterior struts. Rika was one of the last out, making sure that there were no injured mechs left behind, though the combat net showed none with serious mobility damage. Then she moved to a nearby viewing ledge, took one look at the city 10 kilometers below, and backed up to take a running leap. She sailed across the 30 meters of open air before reaching one of the external struts that ran alongside the tower. Ma'am? Corporal Remy reached out to Rika, and she saw the four mechs of his fire team moving into positions on either side of her, clinging to ridges on the strut with clawed feet and hands. Captain Ron ordered us to provide you with an escort. Rika wanted to reach out to the captain and tell him that she would be fine, but knew that wasn't the right attitude to strike with her people. Okay, Corporal, let's hope you can keep up. Despite her words, Rika moved slowly enough to stay at the rear of Q Company's second platoon, which was scaling the strut above her. The view from this high up was breathtaking, and as they climbed, Rika marveled at the side of the city laid out below, while keeping an eye out for more airborne attackers. Thirty kilometers to the south, she could see the bulky shape of Sorna Tower looming above the city, light flashing around it as Chase's M Company took the objective. To the north, Seru Heights was under assault by Adira's demons, some of the sky screams turned dragons, wheeling about the structure, blasting defensive emplacements within the building. No signs of combat were visible around the city's fourth huge tower named Upper Imdina. 
She wasn't surprised by that. Leslie was leading a covert strike on that structure. If a visible firefight broke out there, things were going wrong. Despite the fact that she was clinging to a near-vertical strut rising high above the rest of the city, Rika felt at peace, more at peace than any time since the assault on Memphis and the Blue Ridge system. How is it that I'm happiest when in combat? She wondered as the company continued its climb, trading intermittent shots with defenders within the tower. She wondered if it was because battle was where all of her strongest bonds had been formed, be it with the women of Hammerfall, the members of Team Basilisk, or her battalion of marauders. Combat was when they all came together. Petty differences, squabbles over inconsequentialities, preferences and tastes, they all disappeared. Everyone knew that the unit fought as one or the unit died. Most mechs were not familiar with that style of combat. They'd spent the war operating in small groups, being outcasts in their own armed forces. But the training Barn and Silva had given them, coupled with the never-ending drills and simulations during the long flight to Iberia, had taught the mechs what it was like to have their own kind at their backs. It was exhilarating. A few of the crawlers were scaling the tower, keeping pace with the mechs and firing on them as they climbed. The mechs responded in kind, blowing the bots off the structure with casual precision. Hey, Screed, Captain Ron called out. Watch your fire. There are civilians in this tower. You wipe out a family and I'm going to stuff a boot up your ass. Screed sent back a meek apology and Rika stifled a laugh. After checking the feeds to ensure that her mechs hadn't inflicted any civilian casualties, relieved that they had not. Still, perhaps a little too exhilarating at times. It was a tough road to hoe, as Silva used to say. Neats loved to tuck important targets within civilian populations. Dealing with that had been difficult in the war, but was even more so now as they took back Genevia. Not only were the civilians being used as shields, but oft times, those civilians were siding with the Neats against the marauders, either willingly or under duress. Rika shook those thoughts out of her head and glanced up at their target. The topmost level of the tower, only 400 meters wide at that point, was laid out like an ancient villa on a hill. Low stone structures were surrounded by gardens and pools, with a 40-meter stone tower in the center that had a waterfall cascading down one side. Based on their intel, the target would be within that central structure. The struts that supported the tower rose up above the uppermost level and then arched down to the edges of the top level. Other than the spindle of the central shaft and the tops of the four massive struts, the top level was entirely disconnected from the rest of the tower, almost making it appear as though it floated above the city. Rika had to admit that the design was breathtaking. Everything about the tower was surprisingly well-crafted and maintained for a backwater world like Malta. I suppose even places like this have an upscale area. The mechs of Q Company's four platoons formed up at the tops of the arches, and Rika was surprised that they'd not taken any fire yet from the top level. All their intel showed it to have heavy automated defenses, as well as a host of human guards. You've got company, Crudge called up and the command net lit up with launch signatures coming from the hills to the west of the city. It wasn't clear whether they were about to face missiles or projectiles, but whatever they were, the incoming objects were moving fast. Captain Ron was already ordering his company to move, and the mech shifted toward the leeward side of the struts, some firing chaff and scattershot into the air, while others began to fire beam weapons at the shield umbrellas protecting the top of the tower. Rika wished they could have taken out the tower's power source to disable the shield, but their study of the structure showed that it utilized active supports and agraf systems to remain standing. While it theoretically should be able to stand without power, that hadn't been put to the test in over 300 years. Given that the tower had taken some damage in the war, damage that Barn believed to have only been cosmetically repaired, a full blackout would likely kill the structure's millions of residents along with their target. In the time it took Rika to consider those other possibilities, she'd slid down around the side of the strut, adding her E-beams fire to the barrage hitting the shields atop the building. Got a breach, Bucky called out from her position on the next strut over, and Rika watched with her heart in her throat as a squad of mechs descended the strut's arch. Not yet, her cry was interrupted by the deafening cacophony of DPUs hitting the struts, giving the company its answer as to what had fired from the hillside outside the city. 
Four of the mechs descending the strut's arch were picked off, flicked away from the building like specks of dust, though thankfully the rest of the squad made it down. Captain Ron was calling for Starfire on the hillside, while Rika tracked a second barrage, worried that it was something other than DPUs, given the relative ineffectiveness of the first volley. In a spare moment, she saw that two of the mechs who had been knocked off the strut had activated agraf systems, arresting their fall, but the other two were still tumbling through the air kilometers above the ground. From the data on the combat net, they were both alive, so Rika sent remote commands to their armor to deploy emergency chutes, only to receive no response. Clenching her jaw in dismay, Rika couldn't tear her gaze from the two falling mechs. Suddenly, a pair of shapes banked around the tower, matched speeds with the falling marauders, and latched onto them. Kelly and Kelly, you two are a sight for sore eyes. Sorry we weren't closer, Kelly called up. We were dancing with some drones back there, got a bit hairy. Hey, you made it in time, drop them off at Crudge's position. Rika didn't pay attention to Kelly's response. As the second barrage from the hillside struck, at first she thought it was another salvo of DPU rods, but suddenly explosions began to burst all around the mechs, showering them with sharp carbon shrapnel. Fuck, someone screamed on the combat net, and several more mechs fell from the struts, some getting their agrav online, others deploying chutes, and three more being rescued by Kelly and Kelly before the SMIs wheeled their sky screams toward Crudge's position. Rika's attention was drawn by beams lancing through the clouds, briefly lighting up the western hillside. Seconds after the beams ceased, Heather called down from the Fury Lands, firing for effect. The mechs of Q Company were making their way down the struts to the holes they'd opened up in the upper level shields, but Rika held her position, keeping an eye on the western hills to see if the enemy would get a final salvo out before Heather's rounds hit. They did not. Eleven seconds after Heather's pronouncement, a rain of white-hot tungsten fell from space, rail-fired kinetic rounds boiling away the clouds as they streaked down. When they hewed their way into the planet, each round released energy equivalent to a tactical nuclear explosion. Molten rock sprayed into the air as sections of the granite hillside were vaporized by the rounds. FOs report all targets neutralized, Heather announced with more joy than someone who just vaporized a hillside covered in thousand-year-old vineyards should express. Then again, it's either the grapes or us. Rika followed the rest of the platoon down the strut, almost within the shield when the sounds of the kinetic rounds hitting reached her. The entire tower shook, and Rika wondered how many windows in the city had blown out when the shockwave passed over them. She hoped the population remembered the instructions from the war, keep windows open, move to interior rooms. The sound went on and on, echoing through the city, the thundering roar deepening as it reverberated off the hills of Gibraltar Heights and came back over Targian Tower. To Rika's ears, it seemed as though the very planet was groaning in agony as the humans above smote it with their might and rage. It wasn't the first time Rika had heard that sound, and she knew it wouldn't be the last. Meeting resistance, Bucky called out to the company, disrupting Rika's reverie. Watch out for more of those centipede crawlers. And so the mechs began their slog across the top of the tower, taking out swarms of crawlers, drones, and human troops, all of which fell back against the marauders' inexorable assault. Ten minutes later, the top of the tower was cleared, and all that remained was the stone spire in the center. Captain Ron directed two fire teams of SMIs to run a heat flush, while another squad kept up suppressive fire on the stone tower's final few defenders none of whom seemed interested in surrendering. Once the SMIs had reduced their external temperature to levels their stealth gear could manage, they approached the structure through avenues clear of incoming fire and then proceeded with their breach. Rika watched their feeds, admiring the skill and efficiency of the mechs as they quickly neutralized the final defenders and came to the innermost room. Following Captain Ron, Rika and her fire team of protectors entered the structure, coming at last to the thick door to the central chamber. We don't need to take you alive, Ron called out. If you don't yield, we'll just blow you to bits. Nice bluff, Rika said with a laugh. I don't believe you, a rage-filled voice called out from within. Ladies, set the charges, Ron directed the SMIs, who began to plant explosives around the exterior of the tower's central room. 
Once they were in place, the mechs all turned to leave, with Ron calling over his shoulder, Joe, wait, the voice called out and Rika turned, GNR held ready as the door opened. Within, there was nothing more than a large SAI node core, and Ron directed the other SMIs inside first. They surrounded the cube, searching for any hidden traps or weapons. Clear, one of the mechs called out, and Rika approached cautiously, her guards flanking her. That's it? She asked. No final surprise? I had an antimatter bomb ready to go, but Nikki disabled it, said the node core, sounding dismayed that the bomb hadn't gone off. Antimatter? Ron exclaimed. Shit, thanks, Nikki. Why didn't you mention it? Rika asked her AI. You were busy thinking poetic thoughts about the kinetic strikes. Well, not just thinking, you whispered them aloud. Rika laughed and reached out to pat the node. Well, Piper, you gave us a good run. I matched my skill levels to that of common AIs and humans. Piper responded. If I'd been playing for keeps, you'd all be dead. Oh? Ron asked, how so? I would have dropped down through the tower and blown the entire top level as soon as your company was on it. The upper levels of the tower could support the collapsing topmost level, though roughly 10,000 people would have died by my estimation. Damn, Ron muttered. Good thing you were playing at mere mortal level. Or care about people level, Rika added, then accessed the command net. How are we doing, folks? We're having lunch over here, Leslie replied with a laugh. Took our tower 10 minutes ago, only had to kill 12 people to do it too. Rika smiled as Ron let out a curse. The other company commanders all reported successes, though Adira had lost two dragons in her assault. We're not used to planetary action, she said apologetically. It's okay, Rika said. We'll run a new variation tomorrow, and we'll see if you can keep your beasts alive this time. Minimal casualties here, Chase reported. Got ours a full minute before Leslie, too. It's not a competition, Leslie reported as the simulation faded away. All around her, mechs were rising from the full immersion sim couches that applied the realistic agrav generated sensations for the simulated combat. Better than just a mental sim, these couches put real twitch reflexes to the test, just like actual combat. Next to her, Chase sat slowly, carefully rubbing his head. What happened to you? Rika said with a slight grimace. Chase glanced over his shoulder to where the rest of M Company was sitting up. The van fell on me at one point. Damn Sim is really good when it comes to making you feel it. Rika laughed. Think you need time in the auto dock? Funny, Rika. Chase rose and stretched before offering her his hand. Did you have fun? I did, yeah. Tomorrow I think we'll focus on ground targets and use the fighters to keep the towers in check. See how that goes. You going to hit the dirt again? Rika considered it for a moment. No, I think I'll take the lance and get Piper to add in a Nietzschean fleet or something. He sure enjoys this a lot. Leslie approached, a cheek-splitting grin on his lips. Though he's pissed that my team just slipped past all his defenses. We ran three groups and alternated misdirection strikes. He didn't even know we were on his core level when I strolled into his chamber. Now that sounds like a replay I want to watch, Barnes said as he approached. Gotta say, I'm glad we'll be at Iberia soon, and we can do this for real rather than just running sims. Rika cocked an eyebrow at the master sergeant. I'm hoping that we won't need to do anything like this. Oh? Barn asked. Are you going to share those recreational drugs you've been taking? Chase laughed and Rika shrugged. Maybe, depends what you're offering in return. How's about an all-expense paid vacation to the Disney world? The what? Stars, Rika. Leslie patted her on the shoulder. Sometimes I forget how young you are and how little you know of the galaxy beyond Genevia. Rika looked at the grinning faces surrounding her and shook her head. You know what? Tomorrow, I'm on Piper's side. The Sheep Stellar Date 12.22.8949 Adjusted Years Location Carl's Might Approaching Malta Region Iberia System Old Genevia Nietzschean Empire Allison slowed her pace as she walked toward the bridge, nervously anticipating her crew's check-ins. Fred, 
How are things looking down there? You ready or what? Like 30 more seconds and I'll be in position. Just need to get the tabs all set up. Ahead, through the open bridge door, she could see Jenissa chatting with Lieutenant Colonel Alice about the station they were docking with. It had a whimsical name, the Maltese Falcon. She hoped that was a good omen. Cor? She reached out, hoping he was ready with the direct connect to the comma rays. I'm good. You give the word and we cut her off. Good. She stepped into the bridge and nodded to Jenissa before sketching a salute to Alice. Any trouble from the locals, ma'am? She asked the lieutenant colonel. So far, so good, Alice replied. Looks like our little ship has been through Iberia before, so they have records of us and the vessel's in good standing. Good old Carl even had a bit of credit on the books, so our docking fees are covered. Really? Allison didn't bother hiding her surprise. How do you pull off accessing the ship's local accounts? The lieutenant colonel shrugged. We've been aboard for over two months. I managed to find a way into the secure data banks and get the root encryption keys for Carl's entire operation. Took a bit of doing, but it was worth it. Otherwise, we'd have to answer some tricky questions. We still might, Allison said as she turned to look at the growing shape of the 60-kilometer-long station. I bet it's not often you see five Genevian mechs this deep in what's now Nietzschean space. At least not five that are well-maintained, armed, and armored, Jenissa added. The lieutenant colonel's hawkish gaze flitted between the two women. Well, when I do my initial scouting, I think it would be best just to take one of you. I was thinking Cor or Randy. People buy AMs as security all the time. Jenissa cast a dark look at Alice. Do you mean that they buy that AM's function as hired security? Or that people around here actually buy mechs? Both, though I can't speak for Iberia specifically. I've heard talk that there's a thriving black market in mechs in these parts, especially after someone found a stash of compliance chips. I wonder if that stash is what got Rika chipped back on Decker Station in Parsons, Jenna's amused. Granted, I'd love to see someone try to chip one of us. Now that we're all Mark IV models, that shit won't fly. Okay, Fred announced. I'm good to go whenever you're ready, Sergeant. Randy? She asked the fifth member of the team. In position. Allison took a moment to gather her thoughts and then unslung her PR-111 rifle and trained it on Alice. Okay, Lieutenant Colonel, this has gone on long enough. I'm relieving you of your command, such as it is on this little mutinous mission. To her surprise, Alice appeared entirely unfazed. Took you long enough, Sergeant. I've been waiting for you to turn on me ever since we dumped out of the DL into Iberia. I almost had my ghosted scan in place, but frickin' Corp pulled an update before I was ready and saw, well, that there's nothing here. Certainly not somewhere they'd take Rika, at least. Ghosted scan? Jenissa asked. Damn, is that how you convinced us that we were chasing a ship to the jump point back in Blue Ridge? Gold Star, Private. For Iberia here, I've built up a scan model with more in-system traffic and a larger Nietzschean base on Malta's moon. But it took just a bit longer to get it to mesh with the live data, and then, well, then you all knew the jig was up. Allison's brow furrowed. You don't seem too bothered by this turn of events. The lieutenant colonel leaned back in her seat and folded her hands behind her head. In all honesty, it took you a few hours longer to get ready than I thought. Made for some juggling on my part, but I think we're still in good stead. Shit, Cora called out. She's transmitting and I can't stop her. I thought you were ready. I was, I... I can tell that you're talking to Cor, Alice said with a smug smile. He's got some skill, I'll give him that but I rerouted everything to run through the backup comm interfaces and then cloned the interfaces in the software layer so that when he disabled primaries and backups, it disabled primaries and then a null interface, leaving the backups in my control. Who'd you call? Allison asked through gritted teeth. Are you a traitor as well as a mutineer? Alice tapped a finger against her lips. Are those things really separate? Can you mutiny and not be a traitor by default? Jenissa glanced at Allison, a worried look in her eyes. 
I was asking if you've sided with the neat, Allison clarified. Mutiny against Rika and the Marauders is one thing, but allying with the neat is another. Now you're just being insulting, Alice sneered. I wouldn't ally with Nietzsche. But now that General Mill is gone, most of the Marauder leadership is just a bunch of mid-level generals who never managed much more than a supply chain back in the war, all vying for the scraps left behind. Wow, there's just no scenario where you actually behave like a nice person, is there? Genesa scoffed. Well, your squad leader here has me at gunpoint, so I'm not really predisposed to niceties. Neither are we. Allison took a menacing step toward Alice. We took it on faith that you weren't a piece of shit, but turns out we were wrong. Each one of us is wondering if your little stunt here has put Rika's rescue at risk. If anything had- Alice groaned. Oh, save it, Allison. Unless they're all regrouping at Blue Ridge, you can kiss being in Rika's marauders goodbye. They've moved on and you'd spend years trying to catch up. Now what you can do is help me with my mission and get some real good done. Rather than just following Rika, she gallivants around, blowing shit up. Your mission? Allison asked, her resolve wavering. Yeah, the one General Julia gave me before she returned to Ontario. She sure takes a long time to spit things out, Randy said from the entrance to the bridge. Allison glanced back at the AM-4 and nodded. Smells of desperation to me, too. She has to have some reason for this. Genesis said with a shrug. Otherwise, why fly out here? And why do it with the five of us to boot? She is right, Alice growled. Allison took another step toward the lieutenant colonel, eyeing her up and down. So why didn't the general just order Rika to do whatever it is that you're out here doing? Because it doesn't jibe with the vaunted field marshal's plans. And since Tannis Richards has Rika's GNR wrapped around her little finger, General Julia tasked me with this mission. I don't buy it, Randy said privately. Me either, Genesa added. If that was the case, she could have told us once we were far enough from Blue Ridge to have lost the trail for Rika. You been listening in, Fred, Cor? Allison asked, interested in their thoughts on the matter. Yeah, trying not to hit things down here. Fred grunted while Cora signaled with a positive response. Okay, let's play along a bit longer. We don't tell her about the kombui we dropped, though. If she knows that we sent a data burst to Captain Chase, she might do something drastic. So what's our objective? Allison asked. Alice's lips pulled back in what would be a smile on most faces, but was just showing teeth on hers. General Julia has reason to believe that President Calvert is hiding here in the Iberia system. Randy whistled and shook his head. Well, that's a nice story. Thought you'd have come up with something better than that. Alice twisted in her seat to give Randy a penetrating stare. It's common knowledge that the Neats never found him after the surrender. Who cares? Allison asked. Calvin isn't president of shit anymore. Plus, he presided over the fall of Genevia. That's not true. Alice said while shaking her head vigorously. The GAF brass was running the show for the last five years. Calvin was desperate to try other strategies, ones that I, for one, think would have worked. I'd just love to hear those, Randy said with a groan. What proof do we have of any of this? I have my orders from General Julia, Alice said. I wasn't supposed to share them, but I'm passing them over now. Allison shook her head. We don't have the codes to verify these and... Stars, this is weak intel. Just that he's possibly here in Iberia down on Malta using the pseudonym Clarence. I know it's weak, but there was a resistance movement back on Kansas, so there'll be one here. We just need to connect with it, and I bet they'll have leads for us. We see where this goes, Allison said to the team. She's obviously here for some reason that requires her to bring five mechs along. If we just take her in, we're being hailed by the Maltese Falcon Space Traffic Control, Genesa said from her station. They want a visual conversation. Well, Alice asked, are you going to shoot me or let me talk to them? Stars, I'd love nothing more, Allison muttered as she toggled the safety on her PR-111 and lowered it. We're going to take this one step at a time, though, and I'm going with you when we dock. If people buy AMs, they probably buy SMIs, too. Sure. 
Alice grinned. That'll make me look wealthy. Your model is worth a mountain of credit. Maybe you should just shoot her, Jennison muttered. So tempting. Put the STC on. Opening the channel, Genesa said, and Alice proceeded to speak with the space traffic controller, lying their way onto the Maltese Falcon. Sheepdogs, stellar date 12.22.8949, adjusted years, location, ISS Quaderos, region, Iberia system, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. This really is just the ass end of nowhere, Lieutenant Sarah said from her seat in the large pinnace's cockpit. Colonel Borden nodded absently as he looked at the scan data that was filling the forward display. He was far less concerned with the system than the ship they were pursuing. There, he called out a moment later. The Carls might, they're approaching that station. The Maltese Falcon, Sarah snorted. <laughs> Someone has a sense of humor. Well, the planet is Malta, it kind of makes sense, Corporal Pars said from his place at the communication console. Sarah's is right, though. This place is just a big bucket of nowhere. I mean, I'm sure it's nice and all, but based on the chatter, I'd be shocked if five billion people lived in the system. Care to bet on that? Rel, the AI paired with Borden, said over the ship net. Uh, the way you say that makes me lean toward no, Rel. Damn it. And here I could have fleeced you like the easy mark you are. So what is it? Sarah asked. 7.2 billion. How can you be so sure? Pars asked suspiciously. Well, when you strip the beacon, there was some helpful about Iberia information in there. They just had a full census two years ago, part of some empire-wide tally that the Neats were trying to work up. A census? Pars shook his head in disbelief. I swear. Sometimes I can't believe we found ourselves in the most amazing future anyone could ever have imagined, but they have things like censuses. Is that right, or is it something like sensei? Censuses, Rel confirmed. I suspect they had need to gather the information in such an archaic way with how many people in Genevian space have been relocating, or hiding, or lying about their identity. They had to figure out just how many Genevians were left after the war. Still, that should be simple, Cirrus added her two creds to the conversation. I get why it's not as easy for these people, but Pars is right, it's still hard to grasp. This ever feel surreal to you, Colonel? Pars asked, glancing up at Borden. I mean, we're close to 700 light years from Seoul, and well over 3,000 from New Canaan. I get why we're out here, specifically, but don't you ever really wonder why? Borden glanced down at Pars, his eyes narrowing. Sometimes I wonder why you're out here, Corporal. Maybe there's a transport bag in New Canaan that needs you to babysit it. Pars reddened. I didn't mean it like that, sir. It's just surreal, that's all. Borden set a hand on the young man's shoulder. I know, I was just messing with you a bit. I agree, it's surreal. When we left Seoul, no human had ever visited a single one of these star systems. Now a low population is in the billions, so, does that mean you just made a joke, sir? Pars asked. Son, do I look like the sort of man who jokes? Ceres laughed from her seat at the pilot's console and glanced over her shoulder at Borden, who decided to ignore her. He'd volunteered to go after Alice because he didn't want the mechs to be divided further. Chase needed to be able to focus on finding Rika. Also, Alice was a pompous bitch, and he looked forward to taking her down a notch. But one thing he hadn't given enough consideration to was the fact that after spending 70 days alone with just eight other people on a 50-meter pinnace, some relationships were bound to form, like the one between himself and Saris. It was a risky thing, sleeping with a woman under your command, something that was rearing its head from time to time with Saris. She'd become a bit possessive, and he was going to have to have a chat with her or break it off, or both. You're too old to fall for the young bright-eyed girl, he chided himself. A part of him still felt guilty. His wife had died in the attack on Carthage two years ago, and though he knew she'd want him to be happy, he wondered what she'd think of him having a fling with one of his junior officers on a long trip. You have that deep pinch of feeling, 
Rel commented privately to Borden. And since it started when Saris gave you that look, I can only imagine what it is connected to. Well, imagine away, Borden replied. You know it's been a mistake for me to be with Saris. Maybe less for you than for her. It's a heady thing for her to be shacking up with the old man. Stars, Rel, where do you dig up some of that slang? The mechs, same place you got the idea to start sleeping with the team. Borden chuckled softly as he watched the system scan continue to update. You make it sound like I'm sleeping with all of them. I'm not Yusuf on Sabrina, you know. It was Rel's turn to laugh. <laughs> One thing's for sure. Admiral Richards knew what she was doing when she sent him on that mission and not you. He wouldn't have made it one week. You think so little of me? Borden asked. I would have made it two weeks easy. So what should we do? Lieutenant Saris asked after a minute. Is our EM signature suitably changed? Borden asked. Yes, sir, Pars replied. I registered us as a Carry 17, a local build of ship that's used for a lot of courier runs. So long as we get an external berth, and no one aboard the station looks out a window and sees us, we should be in the clear. Then let's make for the Maltese Falcon at best speed, Borden replied. Time to figure out what that woman is up to, and why she needs five mechs to do it. My money's on a heist, Pars replied with a laugh, earning him a sour look from Saris. Shut up, Corporal. Shutting up, ma'am. Falcons. Stellar date 12.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, Carl's Might, Maltese Falcon, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Allison checked her cloak one last time to make sure it was adequately covering her gun arm. It looked good, so long as she kept it close to her body and didn't swing it too much when she walked. She'd detach the barrel, hanging it from a sling over her shoulder. It dangled down between her legs, and she'd tried not to smirk at the image it created. But with a bit of a leg spread walk, she was able to keep her thighs from hitting the barrel. Sitting on a ledge that ran along the inner bulkhead of the small bay adjacent to the ship's portside airlock, she confirmed that the GNR's barrel wouldn't show then either, so long as she didn't slide back. It looks fine. Alice said as she walked into the small hold, a hood pulled over her head and her hair flowing out around the sides, partially obscuring her face. Her look was topped off with decorative glasses that looked a bit ridiculous on the normally staid woman. Nothing's going to happen up here. We're just going to meet a contact and see what he knows. If everything is on the up and up, then we'll go down world with the whole team and extract the president. Honestly, you can just leave your whole arm here. Allison did her best not to laugh in the lieutenant colonel's face. Alice may be her commanding officer, but if the woman thought she was going to go out onto a Nietzschean space station without her gun arm, she had another think coming. To her credit, Alice seemed to take a cue from the expression Alice wore and waved a hand dismissively. Or take it, like I said, I don't expect any trouble either way. Allison had a hard time believing that. If the lieutenant colonel thought that they would just waltz on and off a station that was in enemy hands with no trouble, she was either lying or delusional. Will we take the ship down to the surface? Allison asked, following the other woman out of the bay. I can have course start looking for good surface ports. Alice glanced back at her, eyes narrowed. I'd prefer if we kept calm traffic to a minimum. Querying public databases for surface ports won't stand out with a ship like this, Alice encountered. Fine, Alice said as the inner airlock door opened. Cor, I got you a bit of cover. Look for good surface ports while you're doing other stuff. Allison sent the AM-4. You got it. I wonder if the old president is really down there. If he is, I'm not so sure we should rescue him. Maybe shoot him in the head. I feel you, Cor. Allison replied, but it may be that he could be useful to Rika. If he is actually here, we keep him alive so that she can be the one to shoot him in the head. I feel like that way it can count for all of us. Fine, but I expect to get a commendation for self-restraint. I'll see that you get it. Stars will all deserve one, if he ends up being here, that is. The outer airlock cycled open, and Alice stepped out into a circular bay that four other freighters were also snugged up against. 
Flits and haulers moved about, shifting cargo from stacks piled in the center of the bay to the various ships. Allison suddenly wondered if they should have set aside some of the cargo in the ship's holds for transfer onto the station. Not that they had anyone to transfer it to. Stars, I have no idea how this sneaky spy shit works. Alice was striding purposefully across the bay, the logo for Carl's shipping appearing to shift back and forth on the back of the woman's slightly too large ship suit. Measuring her pace, Allison trailed a meter behind the lieutenant colonel, keeping her eyes peeled and feeling entirely naked without her helmet. From what she could see, several of the other ships had armed guards, but Alice had said that it would take too long to get the proper permits to walk about the station with armor and weapons. They were lucky that Fred had stuffed one of the marauder's cloaks in his pack, and that it was capable of masking a mech's EM signature. Cor had suggested that next time Fred should pack one for everyone, and the two had gotten into a shouting match about whose turn it had been to haul general gear. In the end, Genesa had stepped in and separated the two, but Allison knew that their patience was coming to an end. Alice must have known it as well, because even though the shouting had been audible across the whole ship, the lieutenant colonel had not mentioned it at all. The two women walked out of the bay and down a long corridor that connected the bay to one of the station's main concourses. From there, Alice summoned a station car. When the roofless automated conveyance arrived, they both settled into the seats and rode in silence the three kilometers to their meeting point. Alice had given Allison the name of the destination, a diner called the Silver Train, which was frequented by crews of both interstellar freighters and local in-system rigs. Allison didn't know a lot about where freighter crews tended to congregate, but she had never expected it to be at a diner. In the vids, they were always gathering in dimly lit bars, playing games of chance and skill at grimy tables while getting frisky with the help. Much to her dismay, when they arrived, the location was nothing more than a regular diner sporting a long seating area and a bar running along one side. Rather than alcohol, pots of coffee in a dozen different flavors sat behind the bar, along with something that Allison thought was alcohol until she realized it was maple syrup. Oh yeah, she said with a grin, all sorrow over not ending up in a seedy bar gone. I'm getting a full stack and drenching it. Keep it cool, Allison, the lieutenant colonel said with a scowl. Sorry, but do you know the last time I had maple syrup? You'd have to put me down to keep me from ordering that. Well, sit at the bar, Alice directed. I don't want you getting your sticky machine hand all over everything. Allison resisted a strong urge to strangle the other woman, but didn't say a word to her as she turned and gave the bar stools a measuring look. They seemed sturdy enough and several of the less than stock humans sitting on them hadn't crashed to the floor. She carefully settled onto one of the stools and hit the control to activate the menu, scanning it quickly before deciding on a full stack of blueberry pancakes with the delicious golden maple syrup. You pick yet? The woman behind the bar asked as she approached with a coffee cup in hand. My food? Allison asked, taken aback by the woman's abrupt statement. No, your next hair color. Yeah, your food. Coffee? Um, sure. Allison stammered as she glanced at the options arrayed behind the woman. The Maltese dark, I guess. Good choice. The woman grunted and filled the cup she'd set down on the counter. Cream? Allison asked, eliciting a laugh from the woman. <laughs> Not in my coffee. You want to drink watered-down tit juice? You can go somewhere else. Uh, okay? I'll have a full stack of the blueberry pancakes topped with the golden maple. Great, the woman said as she turned away. A man two seats down from Allison laughed and leant over to whisper, Meg's is the only spacer's joint where the help is coarser than the clientele. I heard that, Bart, the woman said over her shoulder, and I'm not the help. Bart laughed. Well, Jill, if you named the place after yourself and not some fictitious Meg, I'd stop calling you my personal serving girl. Jill turned and waved a ladle at Bart. I'd like to see you call me that. The only way I'm serving you is after I chop you up and put you on a plate. Ugh, Allison grunted at the thought, though Bart seemed unperturbed. Yeah, well, what do you call it when you bring me food? Bart countered. 
I'd call that you serving me. Jill turned away, but muttered loud enough for everyone nearby to hear, I'll serve you some spit in your next burger. Allison suddenly had an urge to cancel her order, but Bart smiled and shook his head. She'd never do it. Jill talks a big game, but she's really a softie. Best food on the Falcon, too. Okay, Allison said, having forgotten what it was like to live as a civilian. Granted, she'd been 17 when she was conscripted a decade ago, so heading off to seedy diners wasn't something she'd ever participated in before the war. And when she was enlisted, well, Mex didn't get to go carouse with the locals. Following that, she did a stint as one of Stavros's slaves with even less freedom. Easy, Allison. It's just some banter between civilians. They do this all the time. Shit, we do it in the Marauders, too. Even though she told herself the civilian chatter was no different, it was. There was no concern for rank, no clear boundaries on what could be said to whom and under what circumstances. Clearly, Jill was the owner and Bart a customer. That they spoke to one another as equals, and rather crass equals for that matter, didn't fit into a paradigm that made sense to Allison. She took a sip of her coffee while desperately trying to remember how to navigate society as a civilian. The problem was that she hadn't had a great childhood. It was mostly spent living in refugee camps with her mother and sister. Things there weren't that different than in the military. There was a hierarchy, consisting mostly of gangs. Once you recognized the colors, it was easy enough to tell who was who. The coffee turned out to be decent, but not so good that Allison couldn't have used some cream. Not that she was going to risk Jill's ire and push for some. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Alice ordering and hoped that maybe the establishment surly owner would actually spit in the lieutenant colonel's food. It only seemed right. Before long, her pancakes arrived, and she was just tucking into them when a man entered the diner and surveyed the room before ambling over to Alice's table. With her augmented SMI-4 hearing, Allison was able to listen in on the conversation, which turned out to mostly be niceties and discussions of trade routes and shipments. She assumed that most of the conversation must be taking place over the link, easily evidenced by the awkward pauses that occurred in their verbal conversation. As they chatted, a quartet of women entered the diner. Two sat at a table and the other two settled at the bar on Allison's left. She'd seen a variety of people on station that had unique looks, and these four didn't seem to stand out at first, mostly because of the long hooded cloaks they wore. But as Allison flipped through a few vision modes, trying to get a better look at the newcomers, she could tell they were heavily modded. Then one pulled her hood back, revealing a hairless jet black head. Her eyes were entirely yellow, as were her unsmiling lips. Their bodies were giving off a variety of EM signatures, and Allison came to the conclusion that their skin was made of some sort of polymer capable of color change and probably bioluminescence. Barely visible on the forehead of the one that had pushed her hood back was a convoluted symbol that appeared to be some sort of snake, or maybe snakes, twisting about and eating its own tail. Aw, oh, crap, Bart muttered and rose from his stool, tossing a few credit chits onto the counter. Jill turned and glanced at him and he gestured to the four women who had just entered on his way out. Oh, hey now, she said to the newcomers with a grim smile. I don't want any trouble. I'll serve you what you want, but please don't make any problems. No problems, the woman who'd pulled her hood back said in a voice that invoked a feeling of oily silk in Allison's mind. We just want to have some coffee. Any preference? Jill asked, her voice carefully moderated. Of course. The woman leaned forward on her elbows, a long yellow tongue sliding out of her lips as she spoke. Your blackest brew. Get ready for trouble, Alice said to Allison. My contact here says these women are here for him. Subtle, Allison replied, shifting in her seat. The rest of the gang is going to be pissed that they missed a good fight. Let's see if we can end this without a fight. Alice cautioned. Oh? Allison cut off a large piece of her pancake and pushed it into her mouth, chewing thoughtfully. How do you propose we do that? Well, you take out those two sitting next to you nice and quick. 
We'll see if that'll convince the other two to find somewhere else to be. Uh, sounds like a fight to me, she thought to herself, while wondering if the lieutenant colonel had learned such brilliant strategies at OCS, or if she'd pick them up from her favorite vids. Okay, say when, was all the reply she gave. Whenever you're ready, sergeant. Allison sent back an affirmative response, and then turned back to her pancakes. She folded one of the delicious slices of heaven over, and then cut it in half, stuffing first one piece and then the other in her mouth. Seriously, sergeant, any day now. You said whenever I was ready, you want me to fly into a pancake denial-induced rage and kill someone? Allison shot back. Just do it. They're giving us the side eye. Yes, your high and mightiness, Allison thought to herself as she turned and dropped her fork on the floor. Ah, shit, she muttered and bent over to retrieve the utensil, using the opportunity to grab the hem of her cloak and pull it up over her gun arm. When she rose, Allison slid off her stool and took a single step, which placed her behind the two women sitting at the bar next to her. She grabbed one's head with her hand and slammed it down into her coffee cup, while repeating a somewhat less graceful version of the action with her other arm. The woman on the left managed to shift enough that her head avoided the mug, but the one on the right took the ceramic cup right in the forehead. I don't like your attitude, Allison said as she stepped back. I think you and your other two friends should leave. The woman who had pulled her hood back turned, blood running down her forehead and sneered at Allison. Crap, she does not look intimidated at all. Oh, you're gonna get it, bitch. Yellow light began to flow across her face, twisting around her head and converging on the ruined emblem on her forehead. With a single deft move, she pulled off her cloak, revealing her body to be just like her face, jet black and covered in the yellow lights tracing their way across her skin. Oh, hey, can you take this outside? Jill called out as she ran into the back. Neither woman replied as compartments in the black and yellow woman's thighs opened up, and she drew out a pair of pistols, or began to at least. Allison wasn't going to wait for the thug to warm herself, and triggered her own cloak's release, causing it to split in two and fall to the floor. You want to play this game? Allison asked, pulling her GNR's barrel free from its sling. As they'd faced off, the second of the black-skinned women had risen, also freeing herself of her cloak, though Allison noted that the two in the booth hadn't moved yet. Then she saw that Alice had a pistol trained on them. Huh, she's not completely useless after all. A mech, the first of the women said, hands not quite on the grips of her pistols as she shook her head in disbelief. This should be fun. Allison gripped her GNR's barrel like a club. So long as none of her opponents had reinforced armor beneath their skin, they wouldn't damage the barrel, she hoped. You have a strange definition of fun. This isn't a fight you can win. Take your friends and go, last warning. Please, Jill called out from the kitchen doorway, where she was peering around the corner. Can you not destroy my diner? Allison didn't spare the owner a look. This wasn't the sort of situation that would diffuse over the risk of a little property damage. No one in the diner moved, save for a few of the patrons who were backing away into the corners. Then the first woman reached for her pistols, and Allison swung her GNR's barrel. It hit her adversary's left hand, the crunch of bones clearly audible in the quiet room. But that didn't slow the woman from drawing her other weapon and firing from the hip at Allison. It was a projectile round, and it hit the SMI-4 in the stomach, easily deflected by her flow armor skin. The woman barely had time to look surprised before Allison swung her barrel around and into her enemy's other wrist, breaking it as well. She cried out in pain and fell to her knees, just in time for Allison to realize that the other black-skinned woman was aiming a pistol at her head. Ducking to the side and narrowly avoiding a series of rounds, Allison jabbed her GNR's barrel at the woman, who also ducked at the exact same moment. The end of the barrel, which had been originally directed at the woman's stomach, hit her right in the throat, and with the might of a mech's arm behind it, proceeded to push through the woman's throat. Allison wrenched her gun's barrel free, and a spray of blood shot out, dousing her left leg. 
Not bothering to worry about a bit of gore, she drove a knee into the first attacker's face, ensuring that she wouldn't try anything further. Looking up, she saw that the final two women were still in the booth, mouths hanging open, staring in horror at their two comrades, one of which was bleeding to death on the floor, while the other writhed in pain. You want a piece? Allison began, when her gaze alighted on the booth where Alice and the contact had been. Alice, where the hell are you? We left out the back. Draw them away out the front. What? Allison exclaimed. How will I meet back up? Take your cloak, get away, then after a few hours, head back to the ship. No one will be looking for you by then. Allison found that to be highly unlikely. But at that very moment, rounds tore through the diner's windows, shredding the booth where Alice and her contact had been sitting. Before she could even make a move toward the door, the two remaining women had their weapons drawn and aimed at her head. Oh, hell no, she muttered, and took two long strides before diving through one of the windows and back onto the concourse. A hundred meters away, she spotted a light hauler with a chain gun sticking out of the back. It pivoted toward her and opened fire as she raced across the concourse to duck behind a thick balustrade. She frantically reattached her GNR's barrel and initiated a cleaning cycle that used jets of plasma to burn away any obstructions in the end. Alice, I'm taking heavy fire. A little help would be nice. She cried out, getting no response. Rounds tore into the balustrade, and she realized her cover wasn't going to hold out long. She surveyed the concourse, noting that it had no cross corridors for some distance, though there was no shortage of screaming civilians running in nearly every direction. As much as Allison wanted to save her own skin, she balked at the idea of running through the crowd and getting dozens of people killed. She gauged the distance to the mezzanine level above her and, without further consideration, pushed off from the balustrade, taking four long strides before leaping into the air and grasping the railing that ran along the next level. A few rounds struck her, but she didn't register any damage as she flung herself over the railing and landed at the feet of a group of men who had been looking down at the chaos below. Get back, she yelled, pushing them down as rounds from the chain gun streaked overhead. The men cried out with hands over their heads, and Allison scampered further away before rising and edging toward the railing. She got a visual on the hauler with the chain gun, which had ceased firing for the moment. Eat this, suckers she whispered, and a sabot round launched from her GNR and streaked toward the vehicle. The depleted uranium rod struck true, hitting the chain gun with a spectacular shower of shrapnel. Just as she was about to let out a victory cry, a voice from behind Allison cried out, Police! Freeze! She slowly turned to see a stocky man in an MFP uniform aiming a pulse rifle at her chest. Buddy? Allison said, doing her best to smile and appear disarming which was difficult, with her left leg drenched in someone else's blood. I was just defending myself. I don't know who those assholes were. She glanced over the railing, and the cop sidled closer to it as well. Below, the two cloaked women who had been sitting in the booth stumbled out of the diner, staring in disbelief at the ruined hauler. One pulled her hood back as she scanned the crowds, looking for Allison. Shit, hero girls, the cop said, moving away from the railing. I'm calling this in, and you need to come with me. Where? Allison asked with a frown. There's only two of them. We can finish them off. Finish, lady. You just started a bloodbath on the station. You're under arrest. SWAT can deal with those two down there. Alice? Allison called out. I think I'm under arrest. What should I do? No response came back from the lieutenant colonel. But suddenly Fred's voice came to her. Allison, are you okay? Some sort of dust-up is going on. Are you near it? I think I am it, Allison said. I'm under arrest, trying to decide if I should comply. Don't do- Fred's words cut out. Fred? Fred? There was no response, and Allison wondered if there was some sort of calm lockdown on the station, or if Alice was behind her loss of connection. Shit, she muttered, looking down at the stocky police officer again. I'm sorry, but I really can't go with you. The man frowned. You're sorry? Yeah, I need to figure out what is going on here, and I can't do it from inside a jail cell. Uh, but I have you under arrest. The man's voice wavered as he spoke. Allison took a menacing step toward him. With that? 
You're going to need a lot more than a measly pulse rifle to arrest me. The man visibly shrank. Look, please, I have a family. Then you won't mind giving me a little head start. Hero. Stellar date, 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Kusa District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Yaka Hiro strode through the halls of the apartment complex in the Kusa District that he'd long ago appropriated from its rightful owners. The news that had filtered down from the Maltese Falcon didn't make a lot of sense. The grab team he'd sent up after Lorne, the traitorous bastard, had somehow been attacked by someone, and only two of his girls had survived. What's worse, Lorne had made contact with his contact, a woman who'd whisked him away. Not how my fucking day was supposed to go, he muttered as he pulled open the door to apartment 4C, which used to be a rather nice suite, but was now the heart of his operation, his own little CIC. Illumin, he bellowed upon entry. What the ever-loving fuck is going on up on the Falcon? We were supposed to ID Lauren's contact and then grab them both. How do you fuck up and up this bad? The red-skinned woman sitting in the center of the room, surrounded by holo displays, didn't even glance up at him as she replied. There was a mech, an SMI, not sure if it was a two or one of those rare threes. Her build was a bit odd. She killed Kala and messed Olive up bad. The cops have her now. Angie got killed in the hauler, but Hannah and Vera got away. And the hauler? Did I hear that right? It got trashed. Illumin finally looked up at Yaka her solid gold eyes wide as she nodded. The fucking mech fired a DPU at it, blew it to smithereens. Yaka launched into a string of curses. Getting an armed and armored hauler up on the station had taken a fair bit of work. He'd planned to use it for a number of jobs, and now the thing was trashed the first time he'd sent it out. How the hell did Lauren hook up with people like this? Yaka finally demanded when he'd regained control of himself. He can barely pull on his pants without sticking both legs down the same hole. Still working on that, Illumin replied tersely, having turned back to her displays. So far as I can tell, two women, the mech and a vanilla from the looks of it, left a ship named the Carl's Might and went straight to the meat. After things went to shit, the woman and Lorne evaporated into thin air. And the mech? Yaka asked. She got spotted by the cops. Well cop. He tried to arrest her, but she just ran off. Station surveillance picked her up a few times, working her way back to the docks, but they don't have a precise fix on her right now. Yaka stroked his chin, which sported the fine red beard he'd taken to growing of late. A mech. Now that would be handy. Think of what we could do with one of those. Uh, what about Lauren and the woman? Illumin asked. What about them? Yaka shot back. Maybe the mech will know where they are. His ops manager, and chief amongst his girls, fixed Yaka with an incredulous stare. How do you plan to take down a mech and then question her? Hannah and Vera don't stand a chance against someone like that. Yaka shook his head, lips twisting into a sneering grin. Did Dell's ship dock before the station went into lockdown? Illumin's eyes lit up as she looked down at her displays, Fingers dancing over her panels. Oh, hell yeah, he made it, he's on station. Get him on it, Yaka said as he walked to the window and looked out over the cramped rows of buildings filling the Kusa district. I want that mech down here today. Juggernaut, stellar date 12.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, Carl's Might. Maltese Falcon, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Damn it, Fred swore, barely stopping himself from slamming a fist onto the console. If there was one thing he'd learned since being mechanized, it was that most things weren't made to withstand an angry mech. Genesa pivoted in her seat, staring at him with wide eyes. This can't be good. It's not. 
he said. Allison called in. She's in some sort of trouble, but then she got cut off. I'm not sure what's up. Genesa turned back to her console. Not sure why. Comms look good. Let me see if I can reach her. Fred, Lieutenant Colonel Alice's voice came into his mind. I'm with my contact, but we have people on our tail. We need you to come extract us so we can get down to the surface. Is Allison with you? He asked deliberately, not using rank or an honorific. No, she's on her way back to you. She called in, but we lost contact. Do you know where she is? Alice didn't reply, and Fred clenched his jaw, rage building within. Alice, so help me. Did you fuck her over? What? No, I ordered her back to the ship. Is she injured? Fred pressed. No, we got separated. What's going on? Genesa asked. You look like you're about to tear your console off the deck and crush it with your bare hands. It's Alice. She says that she and Allison got separated, but she told Allison to come back here, but she wants us to go to her. Fuck, Genesa swore. That doesn't make a lick of sense. There's no way we're closer to her than Allison is. Why call us? That means, Fred nodded, either Allison is dead or that bitch hung her out to dry. You there, Fred, I gave you an order. I'm sending you my position. I want you here now. Thanks, Alice. Now I know where to find you so I can kill you. Fred growled at the woman. You think you can use us like we're your expendable soldiers? Guess what? We don't work for you. We work for Rika, and in Rika's book, the team comes first. What are you talking about, Fred? Alice's words came fast like she was panicking, which Fred hoped she was. You hung her out to dry, didn't you, you fucking bitch? Made a nice little distraction, I bet. Well, we're going to find her. You're on your own. Fred! Alice cried out, but he cut the connection. A second later, Cor walked onto the bridge, a confused expression on his face. Why is the LC in my head demanding I come rescue her? Randy, meet us in the armory. We're going on station. The bay they met in wasn't really an armory but it was where the mechs had stowed what gear they'd brought along in the Carl's might. Once the team was assembled, Fred explained the situation. So we're just going to storm the station and tear it apart till we find Allison? Randy asked, a frown settling on his brow. There are a lot of innocent people here. We should probably make some sort of announcement first. Genesa laughed as she lifted her arms for Cor to attach her breastplate. Stop that, Cor muttered. Can't get this thing slotted in place if you're chortling. Let's get one thing straight, Cor, Genesa said as the AM-4 got her armor in place. I do not chortle. Focus, people, Randy grunted at the pair. This place is loaded with civilians. We can't just run through it shooting down everyone we see. Most of these people are Genevian. What if we see needs? Cor asked. Actually, what do I care? Our people treated me like shit after the war. You guys never got to see what it was like, what with being in the Politica, but the Genevians hated on us as much as the Neats. Still can't kill civvies, Fred said with a shake of his head. But Allison is top priority. If the cops try to stop us and won't listen to reason, then we'll mow them down. Real civilized, Fred? Randy shot back. Okay, what do you propose? Fred asked, throwing his hands in the air. We're fucking mechs. We don't have any more cloaks, and stealth only gets us so far on a crowded station. Eventually, we're going to have to engage, and when we do, shit's gonna get real. Well, we can at least start out in stealth, Randy replied. Get to where Allison was last seen and go from there. He's got a point, Genesa said as she slammed a fist into Cor's back, getting the armor in the right spot for the mounting pins to engage. We do have the fancy ISF stealth gear, I bet it will get us close to Allison's position faster than shooting our way there. Fred nodded. Right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I guess I still default to guns blazing. Randy slapped him on the back. It's okay, Corporal. We're mechs. Guns blazing is sort of our M.O. Getting off the Carl's might had proven to be more difficult than Fred had expected. Before they'd even finished armoring up, a squad of station police was at the ship's airlock demanding access. Cor was all for blowing past them, non-fatally, he insisted. 
but Randy suggested simply cycling the lock and letting the cops in, and then slipping out once they'd stormed the ship. Fred hated the extra time it took, but he had to admit that killing all of the police wouldn't have been any faster. Ten minutes later, they were on the concourse, moving as quickly as they could toward the side of the attack on the Silver Train Diner. Though the station was technically in lockdown, a lot of people were still going about their business, apparently unconcerned with any danger that may be present. They seem pretty blasé, Jenissa commented as the team worked their way down the concourse. Especially for such a quiet system, Randy added. Cor snorted over the team's combat net. I guess you guys were all on ice when the neats hit this place. The Maltese Falcon used to have two sister stations, both of which are at the bottom of the planet's oceans now. They know what real shit looks like, and this isn't it. Huh, Randy grunted. I guess that explains it. A little dust up with, well, with whoever this was isn't a patch on that. I'm catching chatter that it's related to some gang activity, Jenissa chimed in. Some group called Heroes Girls. I wonder if Hero is a guy, Randy mused, and what he does to attract a whole gang of girls. Looking for pointers? Cora asked with a laugh. Stow it, people, Fred ordered. We're coming up on the site. Ahead, they could make out the diner set against the concourse's curved bulkhead. On the near side sat a still smoking hauler, and Fred could make out a twisted mass that looked like the barrel assembly of a crew served chain gun after the crew and the gun had gotten served by a DPU. The diner didn't look much better. One of its walls was all but shredded, and out front stood a red-haired woman who had one hand raised above her head, while the other alternately gestured at the diner and the cop she was tearing into. Wow, I can make out what she's saying from here, Jenissa laughed. Look up there, Fred said while highlighting the mezzanine level on the team's HUDs. Looks like that took fire from the chain gun. That too, Cora highlighted a deeply pitted balustrade. Okay, so Allison bailed out of the diner, took cover behind that barrier, and then jumped up onto the next level. Fred worked his way across the concourse to get a better view of the second level. On his right, in the direction they'd come, people were milling about, but to his left, there was a long space where only a few police were visible. Damn, she went away from the ship, he said. Guess she didn't want to bring the heat down on us, Randy suggested. Sure wish we could reach her. I've been working on that, Cor said. I think the LC slipped some sort of override into the ship's comm system. I can't verify from here, but it lines up. So how come we can't reach her now? Jenissa asked. We're not routing through the ship anymore. I know, I... Cor stopped and let out a long groan. That sneaky bitch. Damn, if only she used her powers for good and not evil. What is it? Fred asked, wishing Cor would just spit it out. She planted a fun little worm in the software we use for our combat networks. We established the network on the ship, and when we moved off the ship, it mapped all the exclusion rules she'd put into place. I'm gonna kill this combat net and establish a new one. Fred saw the active channel to the combat net disappear, and then a new team network came up. He joined the channel and was immediately bombarded by Allison's anger-filled voice. Where the hell have you been? She demanded. I've been trying to reach you for half a fucking hour. Sorry, Sergeant. Fred apologized. We lost you and feared the worst, but Cor just figured out that Alice left a worm in our combat net software. We think she excluded you from comms back when we were on the ship, and then it propagated. I'm gonna propagate her, Allison growled. That fucking woman used me to make her clean getaway. When I find her, I'm gonna- We'll cheer you on, Sarge, Cora said, his tone vehement. But for now, where the hell are you? I'm halfway across the frickin' station. I was heading toward you, but I got cops all over me like cockroaches on last week's beef stew, and didn't want to bring them on you. I don't have my outer armor or helmet, and I forgot my cloak in the diner when those asshats blew it to bits. It's still over half there, Randy supplied. Not quite blown to bits, the diner, that is. Seriously, Randy? Jenissa asked. Is something wrong with the flow armor in your skin, Sarge? A groan came from Allison. Yeah, it doesn't work so well when I'm caked with blood and my gun's hot. 
I forgot that the new hotness we have from the ISF can clean armor, so I have that going now, but it doesn't help much with a hot GNR. Saw your handiwork down here, Fred said. So what do you want us to do? Oh, shit, Cor muttered. There's a Nietzschean garrison here. It didn't show up on the public network, but folks are chattering that the Nietzsche have deployed to find that crazy mech. Crazy? Allison all but shouted in their minds. Damn ingrate! Cor passed the information he'd gleaned on the public feeds, where people were helpfully posting where the cops and Neats were. Looks like you have a lot of company around you, Sarge, Fred said. We can cut in through that central shaft on the station. Mow down a few Neats and then get you. Damn, get you where? Good point, Allison said. I'm guessing it didn't take these guys long to figure out that Alice and I disembarked from the Carl's might. They came by for a visit, Fred replied. Didn't find us, though. Either way, Genesa added, Carl's might would take about two shots from the station's point defense guns, then that would be that. Alice had made a humming sound. Here's how I see it, then. Shit, just a sec. She went silent and then resumed after half a minute. Found the neats. Okay, where was I? Oh, right, two options. First, we find something tough enough to take a pounding and get off the station. Either drop down to the planet or just pick up and leave the system. Those the only options? Fred asked when Allison paused. No, sorry, I was busy killing someone. Some merc, I think. Anyway, our third option is to take the station. Genesa made a strangled sound. Sorry, what? Actually... We should do a combo, Allison replied. People are saying that there's a Nietzschean destroyer on its way from their base on the moon. It docks, we take the station's control center, and then take that ship. Other than a cruiser patrolling way out on the far side of the system, that destroyer accounts for nearly all the military firepower in the Iberia system. There's still the local police patrol craft, Randy supplied. We saw a lot of their fast pursuit ships on the way in. Right. Allison replied, but they're not going to fire on the Maltese Falcon. And if we have a destroyer's worth of Nietzschean hostages, that cruiser's not going to blow us away either. Not right away, at least, Genesis said warily. Don't forget, we got word to chase, Allison replied. There are more marauders inbound. We just have to hold out. I, for one, would rather do it up here than down at the bottom of a gravity well. I second that, Randy added. Okay, Fred, Cor, you two go for the station's command center. I'll head for where the Neats are docking. Genesa and Randy, meet me at the location I'm sending. I... Allison's voice cut out, and the combat net registered a full disconnect from her. What the hell? Randy swore. What now? Damn, she's totally gone, Cor muttered. Could be a local relay outage or something. Okay, Genesa and Randy, you two get down to our last location. It's close to those coordinates. Cor and I will head to station command like she said. You sure? Genesa asked. The Neats haven't docked yet, so either the cops got her or this hero gang did. Either way, two mechs should be enough. If it was the cops, they'll take her to their central holding, which isn't too far from command. Good deal, Randy said. Let's move, Genesa. Way ahead of you, Genesa shot back, her location marker already halfway through the cordoned off space in front of the diner. Damn it, woman, Randy swore as he took off after the SMI-4. Escalation. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, ISS Cuaderos. Approaching Maltese Falcon. Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Okay. Sarah said, her brow furrowing. This station was nice and quiet 20 minutes ago, and now it's like all hell's broken loose. Mex, Borden muttered, shaking his head. This is why we can't have nice things. How do you know it's Mex? Lieutenant Gemma asked from her seat behind Sarah's. Really? Sarah's asked, remaining focused on her approach vector. Flip on the public feeds. There's video of Allison leaping onto a mezzanine level and firing a DPU at some truck with a chain gun in the back. Gemma didn't respond for a moment and then sighed. <sighs> okay, Max. What do you think is going down, Colonel? 
Saris asked. Borden grunted and shook his head. Damned if I know. My money is on Alice using the mechs as a distraction to do whatever the hell it is that she came here to pull off. Which is? Saris pressed. Lieutenant, what do you think I am? Some mystic who is going to roll the bones and divine that woman's plan. She's here to get something that she lost during the war. It's either a person or something of such immense value that it's worth throwing away everything she's done since to get it. Which is unlikely, Gemma added. Just the armor we provided the marauders is enough to set a person up for life in a lot of places. If she wanted to live large, she didn't have to sneak in here. What if her play is selling five mechs, upgraded by the ISF and with said armor, Sarah suggested. Good point, Gemma replied. Borden shook his head. Won't work. Oh? Gemma glanced at him. Why not? Our people saw to it. They left the ports for the discipline chips in there, just in case they want to fake anyone out. But they won't work anymore. Try to chip a Mark IV and you're in for a very, very bad day. Huh, Saris grunted. Sneaky. Phineas's idea. I think sneaky is his favorite way to operate. There's another angle, Gemma suggested. This could be some sort of revenge play on Alice's part. Maybe we got close to Iberia, and she figured with a few mechs in her back pocket, she could get some payback against someone who wronged her. I think that theory falls under my person category. There's one other possibility, though, Borden ventured, drawing the words out. She could be operating on orders from her organization. The Marauders? Saris asked. That would be a dumb move. They'd lose Rika in a heartbeat. Think so? Gemma asked. She'd just ditch her outfit? Saris twisted in her seat to meet Gemma's eyes. If they treated her mechs like they were expendable, anyone who does that better start running now. Gemma's lips twisted under Saris's steely gaze. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Rika doesn't have a lot of patience for that sort of shit. Any commander worth their mass doesn't. Borden interjected, then paused and shook his head. Shit, station just reached out. They're denying our docking request, telling us to move into a holding pattern. The two lieutenants looked to him, eyes questioning. Oh, cut it out, you two. Gemma, get back there and make sure the teams are in order. Cirrus, keep us on course for our berth. I'll just give them the fuel excuse and tell them to shoot us down if they feel so strongly about it. Stasis shields make you bold, sir. Sarah said with a soft laugh. Well, unlike that contemptible woman, Alice, I'm not going to leave our people high and dry. The marauders are our people now? Sarah asked with a smile. Borden frowned at his lieutenant and still bedmate. Don't give me that, you know they are. Now get us down there already. Mechs like to blow shit up, and it would be nice to not have this station falling through the atmosphere by the time we reach them. I kind of like to blow shit up too, Saris replied quietly. I'm sure you'll get your chance. Last known location. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Maltese Falcon, Malta. Region, Iberia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. We're almost there. Fred announced over the team's combat net as he and Cor crouched behind a counter in a furniture shop. They're throwing everything they have at us, but we're driving them back. Would already be there if they hadn't wised up to our stealth, Cor added. And Fred turned to see the other mech trying to wipe some of the white paint they'd been sprayed with from his armor. This paint just won't come off. Forget it, Cor, he said aloud, gesturing to the concourse they had to cross. Door to the command center is just on the other side of that nice little road out there. Well, other side and down a few hundred meters. We get over there, get in, and take control of this station. Paint? Genesa asked with a laugh, responding to Cor's prior statement. Your armor should be cleaning that off automatically. You'd think so, he shot back. It's some sort of ceramic coating. The armor's working on it, but it's slow going. Just be happy they didn't get it on our heads. Fred replied, then chuckled at the white splotch on the left side of Cor's helmet. Well, not too much, at least. We've avoided pain-induced catastrophe so far. Randy joined in the conversation. I've had to hold a few of these hero girls, though. 
There's a lot more of them than just those two who got away up at the diner. No sign of Allison? Fred asked as he sent a fresh set of drones around the corner to survey the command center's defenses. Well, there are signs, all right, Genesa said. We've come across a few slagged examples of her handiwork. So far, no sign of her, though. We haven't run into the neats yet, either. Keep us posted, Fred ordered. Oh, really? Genesa barked a laugh. And here I thought you wanted to be kept in the dark. Fred considered a response, but decided it wasn't worth the trouble. There's a lot of shit out there, he said to Cor. I count at least 50 cops. They have CFT and graph shells set up in four locations. Plus, I see a lot of auto turret portals. Sure wish we had Potter here. She'd knock that shit out. Fred patted the rail guns mounted to each of his forearms. Well, I suppose these'll just have to do. I hear they can take out auto turrets, too. Okay, here's the plan. You backtrack into the service corridor behind the shop and then come out at the position they have set up on the right. Do what you do best. Once you have them engaged, I'm going to hit them in the center, and we'll see if we can make them break and run. Cora lifted his arm, and they smacked their rail guns together. Let's ring their bell. Eh? Just made it up, trying some new sayings. Fred shook his head and turned his focus back to the feeds from his drones as Cora moved to the rear of the shop. One of the enemy emplacements was directly ahead of him and had a clear line of sight on the storefront. He knew that if he engaged it, they'd light the whole place up before he could get past their shields. Think, Fred. There's gotta be a way to take them without going into that killing field out there. He studied the corridor, his examination moving to the overhead, which was vaulted with transparent plas, providing a clear view out into space between support arches. It probably looked beautiful once, but in the years the station had roved around Malta, someone had seen fit to add a series of conduits and pipes above the concourse. One bore the unmistakable markings of a water main. Oh yeah, this'll be good. He waited patiently for Cor to launch his assault. It didn't take long, just a scant minute later. The sounds of weapons fire erupted from further down the thoroughfare. Having preset his weapon to aim, Fred moved through the furniture store, each arm aligning with the ends of a 30-meter stretch of the massive pipe. He braced his right foot against a column a few meters back from the front of the store, took a deep breath, and opened fire. Rail shots blasted through the windows and streaked up toward the pipe, striking it on either end of the segment, blasting holes clear through it, a few slamming into the thick, clear plas overhead. Fred was unconcerned with the vacuum breach. In fact, he'd welcome it, Many of the squishies on the concourse weren't wearing EV-capable gear. What he was concerned with was that the pipe hadn't fallen, though water was spraying out from the holes. A few shots came his way as he fired at a brace in the pipe center, and then again at one on the far end. Following his final rounds, there came a thundering groan, and the massive main finally came down on the defensive emplacement. Shit, man, why didn't I think of that? Cor asked. Corporal Stripes, Cor. Really doubt those make you any smarter, Fred. Prettier, but not smarter. Shut up. Fred took aim at a group of enemies. No, just local cops doing their jobs, he reminded himself, who were retreating further up the concourse, sloshing through the water that was now ankle deep, as a torrential flow still came from one end of the broken main. Fred wasn't shooting to kill, but the cops fell further back, a few flat out running to the next position further to Fred's left. A high-pitched whistle caught his attention, and he realized that the rounds that had struck the clear overhead must have cracked the thick plas. With the corresponding arm still firing pot shots at the retreating defenders on his left, he raised his right arm and sent a series of rounds toward the weakened plas above. Each of his rounds hit the same location, their staccato impacts audible over the general cacophony. For a moment, the plas held, but then, with a terrible screech, an entire ten-meter section fractured and exploded out into space. Hell yeah! Fred shouted as he stepped out and took aim at the auto turrets further down the concourse, as the human defenders began to retreat further from the mayhem. Emergency grav shields snapped into place high above, their fields holding the air in the station, but Fred casually fired at the emitters, blowing away enough of them that the air once again began to vent out into space. Oh, they don't like that, Cor laughed, 
and Fred saw the other AM dash for a hundred meters further down the concourse, laughing as he fired at an armored personnel carrier that was backing away. Then Cor shrugged and lobbed a thermite burn stick at it. Squishies need their air, Fred chuckled as he took out another auto turret, before ducking behind a piece of fallen water main to avoid fire from a group of cops that were falling back to his left. The ones at the entrance to the command center have retreated inside, Cor advised. I'll just grab a cup of coffee while I wait for you to get here. Oh, yeah, Fred asked as he crept alongside the pipe. Get me a toasted bagel while you're at it. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. You got it. You want cream cheese? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you think those assets in the command center will want some, too? Cora laughed. I can't see why not. Think we should make a delivery? Fred sent his drones further down the concourse, getting a clear view of the double doors that led into the command center's lobby and the wide staircase inside. They'd better be good tippers with all the trouble we're going to. Well, that's nice, Genesis said with a groan. There's a pressure breach alert. I wonder who might have done that. It's like you expected something else from those two, Randy replied as he leaned around a corner and fired his heavy coil gun at a group of hero girls. There were at least seven of them. They had appeared a minute earlier in a park that lay between the pair of marauders and Allison's last known location. You keep lobbing snowballs at them, Jenissa instructed Randy. I'll circle around. Snowballs, right. Randy snorted and fired a few more rounds, one blowing a hole clear through a large oak tree. Jenissa patted him on the shoulder before she fully enabled her stealth systems and backtracked down a corridor, took a right, and headed down a parallel passage to the one Randy was firing from. She confirmed on the station's public map that if she took a right in 50 meters, she'd come to the back of the park. Then we'll have those creepy black and yellow women right where we want them. A minute later, she was nearly at the turn she needed to take when two of the hero girls came around the bend. They were walking down the middle of the passage, one holding a railgun and the other toting a beefy electron beam rifle. She considered slipping past them and alerting Randy to the incoming pair, but she didn't want to risk him getting caught in the crossfire. So she pressed herself up against the side of the passage, waiting for them to pass. The yellow lights tracing their way across the women's bodies formed mesmerizing patterns, and Genesis' optical tamper detection systems alerted her to the signs of light hypnosis from the images. Damn, that's kind of insidious. I wonder if that's why they don't wear heavy armor. They trust their ooky, lightly armored skin to mess with people's heads. Genesa also suspected it was because they weren't used to going up against anything more serious than the rather ineffectual station police and rival gangs. Without further consideration over her foe's appearance, she fired two projectile rounds from her GNR at the furthest of the two women while activating her light wand and cutting the other's head off. The headless woman spasmed as she fell, and her body flipped around, the business end of her electron beam rifle swinging toward Genesa. Fuck, she swore, diving to the side as the weapon fired, and a bolt of relativistic electrons hit her in the chest. Genesa's armor locked up and she fell to the ground, initiating a rapid reset on the energy absorption systems as the beam rifle kept shooting, now aimed at a bulkhead. As the flow of electrons burned their way through the plaz, bolts of lightning arced all around, and the ionization of the air in the corridor went off the scales. Her armor reset, and she got enough movement back to kick a foot out and knock the weapon away from the woman's hand, then rolled over to check on the other hero girl grunting with satisfaction to see her laying still in a pool of blood. The air was still thick with free electrons, and all of Genesis' drones were down, along with her armor's stealth capability. Damn it, she muttered while struggling to her feet. I'm supposed to be the only one that hoses people with an E-beam. Her armor completed its mobility reset, and she checked her weapons only to see that her light wand was fried, as was her PR-111. She looked down at her GNR. Well, baby, at least you're not letting me down. Then she flexed her left hand, deciding that it may be time to give her new toy a try in the field. Randy lobbed another shot from his coil gun at the never-ending supply of hero girls that seemed to be growing out of the park's very soil. He'd just blown away a fountain they were using for cover, 
when his armor sensors registered a massive EM spike and Genesa fell off the combat net. Damn it, he muttered, edging around the corner and firing at a tree before moving forward to a column on one side of the passage. Genesa, you there? No response came back, and Randy forced himself to remain calm. There were a dozen ways an EM burst like that could have happened, and she'd be fine. It was just disrupting comms. Genesa, he called out again, and then moved further down the passage, wishing his coil gun wasn't so hot that it rendered his stealth systems useless. He considered pulling it off his left forearm, but his armor read only 80% stealth effective, even without the heat source bolted to him, and he decided it wasn't worth it. He was about to move further down the passage, across the final 20 meters or so to the park, when a series of rounds hit the column he was crouched behind. His drone triangulated the source and showed that there were now enemies targeting him from three locations. For all the stars' sakes, where are you all coming from? He shouted, considering backtracking to follow Genesis' route when his drones picked up movement further back in the park. He moved one of his drones toward the overhead. It circled and got a clear view of Genesis as she ran down a path at full speed toward where several hero girls were clustered. A sigh of relief escaped Randy's lips as he saw that she was okay, though her armor was covered in scorch marks. Genesa! He tried to reach her again, relaying the message through his drones, but there was no response. He shook his head, realizing that she was going to take out the remaining hero girls in close quarters and switch from his coil gun to his PR-109 rifle in case she needed some support fire. In the time it took for him to do that, the overhead view from the drone showed that Genesa was within a dozen meters of the rearmost enemy. Suddenly, her right arm elongated into a five-meter whip, and Randy almost shouted with glee. He'd wanted to see one of the new whip arms in action since Genesa had shown hers off the day they were all upgraded. Genesa swung the whip, its tip catching a hero girl across the back, cutting through polymer skin, muscle, and bone. The woman let out a blood-curdling shriek, but Genesa jerked her arm, and the whip coiled around the screaming enemy's throat, choking the life from her. He saw one of the other hero girls spin to face Genesa, and was ready to send a few shots as a distraction, but the SMI-4 gun arm was already firing and the would-be attacker's head turned into a fine spray of gray matter, blood and bone. Even as the second enemy collapsed, Genesa was already on to the next, her whip arm lashing out, cutting away an obscuring hedge before slashing back at another hero girl, cutting her right arm from her body. There were two more of the black-skinned women in the park, and one rushed Genesa from the right side, earning a series of rounds to the head from Randy's rifle as he stepped out of cover and walked into the open. Genesa didn't slow as her whip came around again, cutting an obscuring branch off one of the oaks, and then wrapping around the fifth hero girl and pulling her from her perch. As the fifth enemy died, Randy approached Genesa and fired around into the head of the woman who'd only lost an arm. I had them all, you know, Genesa said as she flayed open the last woman's body. You can't hog all the fun. By the way, I thought it would be cool, but your whip arm thing is really just gross. Genesa looked down at the long, sinuous appendage that hung from her right elbow and shook it, pulling the flow metal back up into the form of an arm and hand. You're not wrong, but it was still pretty awesome. Is your link totally out? Randy asked as he stepped past Genesa, scouring the park for any more enemies that his drones might have missed. Yeah, antennas fried. Both the armors and the one running down my back. Safety's trip before the surge got to my noggin, though. Repair time? Randy asked as they both began trotting across the park. My head reads 15 minutes, for the internal one at least. It'll be low gain inside the armor, though. Randy nodded as they approached the far end of the park. What happened anyway? Dead woman spasmed, and her E-beam hosed down the corridor. You decapitated her with your light wand, didn't you? Randy asked as they moved into a wide passageway, only a hundred meters from Allison's last known location. Genesa shrugged. It's just too much fun, though my light wand got fried. Serves you right. You know dead people do the chicken dance as often as not when you do that. Seriously, who made you the fun police? Damn it, Randy whispered, gesturing for Genesa to move back against the passage's bulkhead. Probes have picked up movement ahead. We got neat. Why do you sound so upset? Genesa asked. 
and he could just imagine the grin she wore behind her helmet. This is the main event. Shut up. They're up where Allison disappeared. I'm getting my drones close enough for a... Yeah, there are some dead hero girls and damage that is consistent with a GNR. No sign of Allison, though. I guess if the Neats are searching, they aren't the ones that got her, Genesa said, apparently unnaunted by his admonition to remain silent. He nodded absently, holding up a hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's EMP damage there. I think someone hit her with a pretty big burst to take her down. I can hear some of the Neats chatter, and they're not sure who did it either. Damn, that sucks. Do they have any leads? They're talking about Hero's known accomplices. I can't believe all these women work for one guy. Maybe they're clones, Genesa interjected. Everyone knows clones become unstable if they realize they're copies, Randy replied. Genesa shrugged and leaned back against the bulkhead, examining her rifle. Maybe that's why the Hero girls all have that creepy light show skin, to keep them from realizing they're clones. They'd figure it out the first time they went for drinks. Randy shot back. Stars, why are we talking about this? All that matters is that the Neats think some guy named Dell was on station and may have taken Allison. Wait, I thought only girls worked for Hero. Though I don't know if you can call being cloned working for someone. Oh, for fuck's sake, Genesa, would you give that a rest? I guess at least one guy works for Hero. Who knows, maybe there's a whole other segment of his organization called Heroes Boys. What does it matter right now? We need to get on that dude's tail, if he's still on station. Genesa punched Randy in the arm. So see if Fred and Cor have taken command yet. I can't since I'm linkless. There can't be too many ships coming and going right now, though. Right, Randy nodded. On it. Let's go kill us some Nietzsche in the meantime. Fuck, now you're talking. Reinforced. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Maltese Falcon, Malta. Region, Iberia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Fred finally got to the top of the staircase, having given up on not killing any of the locals when they started firing crew-served rails at the pair of mechs. The death toll was low, though. Only two from what he could see and he tried not to think about it too much. Rika had talked to the mechs about how going into Genevia was going to be hard. There would be times when they'd be fighting against their own people, people who had thrown in with the occupiers or who had little choice depending on circumstance. Knowing that didn't make anything easier, though. Clear on my side, Cora said from his right. Everyone else up here must have retreated back into the main op center. Okay, Fred said as he took up a position behind a pillar, and sent a batch of drones down the corridor. We need to be careful in there. Our goal is to take control of the station via their central command, which means it has to be functional. Cora laughed aloud in response. <laughs> You're the one who dropped that water main down below. I can still see a few centimeters of water out on the concourse. Yeah, well, there was nothing to wreck there. I'm just saying that in the op center, we take it easy. Fred replied, wishing that for once Cora didn't have to be so mouthy. Randy and Genesa need us to get a lead on that Dell guy and the ship he's on, if he's on one at all. Think you can do that? A disembodied voice asked, startling both men. Before they could reply, a figure appeared in the corridor, their body covered in the unmistakable matte gray of the ISF's Mark X flow armor. Fred was about to ask who they were talking to when the man's face was exposed, revealing the speaker to be Colonel Borden. Nice of you two to provide one hell of a distraction down there. Gemma and her team are inside, taking control of the facility. I just thought I'd let you know so you didn't come in guns blazing. Fred shook his head, unimaginably glad to see a friendly face. Colonel, how did you get here? In a ship? Colonel Borden replied with a wry twist of his lips. Captain Chase got the beacon you dropped, and I volunteered to come after you so the rest of the marauders could go after Colonel Rika. So they found her? Cor asked eagerly. Borden nodded. Her and Captain Leslie both. Plus, they found a massive Nietzschean shipyard that was refitting a bunch of big cruisers called Harriet's. Fuck, Cor muttered. I hate those things. Well, they're back at Pira now, getting put to good use. Fred slapped Cor's back. 
Now that's the best news I've heard in months. Everyone's safe and the Neats got stomped on. Damn straight, Cora said with a nod. Everyone's safe except Sergeant Allison. We picked up some of the chatter, Borden said. She got taken out down near Randy and Genesis' position? Fred nodded. Nearly 40 minutes ago now. Lieutenant Saris dropped my team off before circling around to where that Nietzschean destroyer docked. She's breaching it now. They'll meet up with Jenissa and Randy once they have it. He paused and looked Fred and Cor up and down. Why don't you come into the op center while your armor gets that stuff off you? Shouldn't someone watch the entrance, sir? Cor asked. Already here, a voice said from next to Cor, causing the man to jump. Damn it, you guys really like doing that, don't you? A laugh was all that came in answer, and Borden turned and began walking down the hall. Let's go see if we can hunt down this Dell person. Kev will let us know if we get any company he can't handle. Fred glanced at Cor and shrugged as they followed after Borden. Then he realized that Randy would probably like to learn that help was on the way. Randy, how are you and Genesa doing? Good, killing Nietzsche is way more fun than those hero girls. You take the command center yet? Fred sent a laugh in response. Funny thing that. We bumped into an old friend. Your mom? Randy replied with his own laugh. No, your mom. Colonel Borden was banging her. Fucking ISF. Wait, Borden's there? Stars, Randy. You're slow on the uptake today, Fred replied. There was a moment's pause before Randy replied. Well, we are in the middle of combat down here, not getting served hot tea and crumpets by the ISF. What the fuck is a crumpet, Randy? Um, I really have no idea. Fred rolled his eyes as they arrived at the op center, noting that there were a dozen station personnel huddled in one corner with Private Callie standing over them. Daphne and Gemma stood in the center of the room, gesturing at the central holotank while two visibly sweating station administrators worked at the consoles before them. Well, you can ask Lieutenant Saris when she shows up to serve you your helping. They're taking the Nietzsche and Destroyer because you and Genesa were too slow. Shit, really? Are you asking if you were really too slow or about Saris? Fred replied. Randy chuckled mischievously. You have to ask? Saris? That woman is so hot, I expect to get third-degree burns whenever she walks by. I don't care if crumpets are neat testicles. I'll eat them if she's serving. For fuck's sake, Randy, I'm never getting that image out of my head. You're welcome, Corporal. Fred closed his eyes, wishing it would wipe away what he'd imaged. Well, keep your helmet on so she doesn't see the drool. I'll let you know if we find any leads on Dell. You got it. Drool contained. It'll protect me from the hotness, too. Oh, just fucking kill those neats already. Cora punched Fred in the shoulder. I'm saving that conversation. That's a contender for the Hall of Fame. What did I do to get saddled with you yahoos? Fred asked as he followed aboard into the room center. Look, just tell that freighter to dock at Bali Station out by the moon, Jenna was saying to one of the administrators. It's what you tried to tell us to do. Fat load of good that did, the man muttered. Okay, I gave them the orders. What do I do if they don't change course? What do you normally do? Borden growled. The man glanced over his shoulder, paling further at the sight of the bulky man who was dwarfed by the pair of AM-4 mechs. Uh, we tell them again? And then? Gemma pressed. Well, after a few more attempts, we'd fire a shot across their bow. Good, Gemma nodded. If they don't comply... We'll just go right to that option. The man swallowed and nodded. How do things look? Borden asked once the man had sent the message. Well, Gemma glanced at Fred and Cor. Pretty much everyone in the system knows that Maltese Falcon is under attack by mechs, or they will, once the calls for aid reach them. The surface government and the other stations are all on the horn, alternately demanding updates, asking if they're safe and offering assistance. The public is mostly listening to shelter-in-place orders, though there's some looting. Based on what I see, we have five hours before that cruiser out at the edge of the system gets word that things have gone south here. Borden nodded slowly, stroking his chin. We'll have to assume that they'll get updates from other stations in their own base on the moon. So, five hours from now, at the latest, they'll be boosting for us here. I make their best time to be, what, just over a day? Give or take an hour, yeah. Fred replied. 
Depends if they break or do a flyby and drop assault ships before slowing to come around. That would be preferable, Gemma replied. Rika's fleet is three days out, based on their last updates. We just have to hold on that long. Updates? Kor asked. You know, our quantum entanglement communication network, Borden said, glancing back at the two mechs as he switched to the link. The thing we're supposed to keep under wraps? Kor kept it so under wraps he already forgot all about it. Fred chuckled. I didn't know you guys had a blade on your ship, though. Yeah, we do, Borden replied. And there are a few in Rika's fleet now, too. They've worked out some production issues back at New Canaan and have ramped up production. What sort of surface weapons does Malta have? Borden asked the two men sitting at the consoles. Can they hit the station here? Uh, the Nates got rid of most of it. There are a few missile silos, but most of the defensive stuff is on the moon. One of the station's administrators replied, John, what are you doing? The other man hissed. Are you an idiot, Sal? These are our people. You heard the rumors? The mechs are coming to destroy Nietzsche. They smashed them at Albany, Sepe, and then at Blue Ridge. Now they're freeing us. John turned in his chair and looked at the group surrounding him, some of the color returning to his face. Right? That's what's going on. You're not just some pirates coming through to strip us bare, are you? Rika's marauders are not pirates, Fred said without equivocation. Our business is killing needs. And business is good, Cor added. Easy now, guys, Borden said with a laugh as he shook his head. You've heard right, John. The marauders have joined up with the Alliance, and our mission is to topple Nietzsche. We're the vanguard. We got started a bit early here, but when the fleet arrives, there won't be anything the Neats can throw at us that we can't handle. All we need to do is hold out three days like Gemma said. See? John said, punching Sal in the arm. I told you they were the good guys. Sal didn't say anything, only giving John a dark look. What about the moon base? Gemma asked. Where that destroyer took off from, can they take out the station? Maybe, John asked, a note of concern entering his voice. They have rails, so if they decide to blow this place away rather than wait for the cruiser, yeah. Sounds like a new objective, Daphne said, speaking for the first time. Fred chuckled. That it does. Take the station, take the neat destroyer, take the moon. Easy, what should we do tomorrow? Take the planet? John asked. I found the ship Dell came in on. Well, I found the one he left on. He and two of those creepy-ass hero girls have your friend. Cora punched Fred in the arm. See? Creepy, not sexy. The main display changed to show an image of Allison strapped to a hover sled as it was being pushed by one of the hero girls onto a pinnace. Fuck. Fred swore. Where are they now? John shook his head, looking apologetic. They've already hit Atmo. They'll be headed for Cerulean. That's where Yakahiro has his base. Or at least that's where everyone thinks he has it. That's where the other woman went as well. Sal added sullenly. Other woman? Fred asked sharply. The holo switched to show Lieutenant Colonel Alice, along with the rather scared-looking man, yeah, we managed to trace her to a shuttle that left over half an hour ago, John said. That thing made a beeline for Cerulean. When I get my hands on that bitch, Cor muttered. Easy now, Private, Borden said not unkindly. She's secondary. Getting Allison back is top priority. Right, after not getting blown out of the sky, Gemma added. I'll pass this on to Rika, Colonel Borden said to the group. When she comes in, She'll have up-to-date intel and can hit hard and fast. That's what she does best, Fred replied, so long as she hits in time. A mystery. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Kusa District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Tremon, a voice whispered close to his ear. Tremon. Stars, what? Tremon muttered, pulling away from the insistent voice. It's only three in the morning. Something's going on, the voice said, and Tremon groaned, finally realizing it was Jakob. 
the man wouldn't wake him in such a fashion if it wasn't important, and that knowledge caused Tremon's mind to claw its way to full consciousness, or something approaching it, and he rolled over, trying to focus on the silhouette of his friend as he crouched next to Tremon's bed. What is it? Up on Maltese Falcon, there's some sort of attack going on. Tremon pulled himself upright. An attack? Who from? A hollow vid appeared on Jakob's hand, its harsh light finally illuminating the man's face. Tremon rubbed his eyes, focusing on the vid as it showed a woman racing across a concourse on the station, then ducking behind a balustrade. After a moment or two, she leaped up onto the next level, swinging over the railing in a single deft move and disappearing from view. That was a mech, Tremon whispered. An SMI. What? Three. Her build looked strange. Not a two or a three, Jakob said. Not exactly. Quality work, from what little I can see. Not like she got upgraded in a chop shop or something. I don't know if this is worth waking up in the middle of the night for, Tremon said as he turned the hollow image, looking at the woman from all sides. Other than all that blood, she seems to be in remarkably good repair. Jakob changed the vid and it was from a different view, a feed from another observer. Public nets are full of these. Dozens of people caught it. Watch. He started the playback, and Tremon could see that the observer could see the mech woman up on the mezzanine level. She stepped toward the railing, and suddenly a blast of fire erupted from the barrel of her built-in weapon. There was an explosion, and then the observer turned to look at a light hauler that was a little more than a smoking ruin. Fully armed, too, Tremon said, then groaned at his own pun. Too early, sorry. That's not all, Jakob continued. There are reports of fighting all across the station. The Neats even sent a destroyer loaded with troops from the moon. It docked and then came under attack from inside the station. I don't know for sure what's happening with it yet. For all I know, the Neats might have lost that ship. Shit, Tremon muttered. You can stop hovering now. I'm getting up. I'd rather not discuss all this while tucked under my covers. Right, sorry, Jakob said, standing up and giving Tremon room to rise. After Tremon stretched out his knee, they reconvened in the apartment's kitchen, where Jakob prepared a pot of coffee while continuing. The taps I have in the Hero's network show a lot of chatter there, too, but most of it is encrypted. Oh, it was his hauler up on the station that ate the mech's uranium round. He had several of his girls up there, two are dead that I know of, two more at large. There are rumors of a bunch of others that were cut to pieces in a park. Shit, Tremon muttered as he glanced out the window. Why didn't you say so? He couldn't see the apartment block Yakahiro had taken over. It was beyond, by a few other buildings. But he stared in its direction nonetheless. I was going to, but you didn't want to talk in your bedroom. Oh. Okay, so what do you think this is all about? Beats me. Hero made a play for something, and it went sour. Maybe he was trying to nab that mech. They go for a good bit on the market. Fuck, Tremon muttered. He opened his mouth to say something, but then put his head in his hands. Fuck, fuck, fuck. We really ruined those poor people's lives, didn't we? The war ruined their lives. Jakob countered as he opened the chiller and grabbed the cream. Yeah, but the war was waged by people, and those people did a lot of bad things. The other man shrugged as he collected a pair of cups from the rack next to the sink. That's war. Tremon lifted his head and stared at Jakob. Don't you feel a little bad for those mechs? Most people that survived have a chance to move on, to put this behind them, but not the mechs. The needs didn't turn them back into people just took away their weapons and armor and sent them back out. How do you move on from the war when it's staring you in the mirror every day? Yako grabbed the mugs and set them down on the table where they clacked against one another loudly in the early morning quiet. What makes you think it's not staring at us every day? Tremen met Jakob's cool gaze and wondered if the other man was referring to himself or Tremen, or maybe both. So what are we going to do about it? Tremon asked. 
About Max, nothing. Tremin grabbed his glass and then the cream as Jakob set it on the table. I mean, why are we awake? What's our plan? Jakob blew out a long sigh. While Tremin poured his cream into the empty cup, something that gave him a strange pleasure whenever he did it. For some reason, everyone else in the universe prepared coffee backwards. They put the coffee in, then the cream, dirtying or wasting an implement of some sort to stir them together. Simply preparing the drink in reverse solved the issue. Put in the cream, and the act of pouring the coffee mixed them together. No wasted stir stick or dirty utensil. Well, if Euro is up to no good, there could be a sweep here in Kusa. If that happens, we need to be prepared to hit the bolt hole. Jakob grabbed the pot of coffee, which held enough for two cups, and filled Tremon's mug and then his own, before sliding the pot back into the machine. Think that's likely? Tremon asked, and Jakob shrugged as he sat. The cops are already on alert. My taps show the day duty officers already being called into their precinct stations. They're mobilizing. Could all blow over, Tremon said with a shrug. Jakob nodded in agreement and took a sip of his coffee. Could. Tremon picked up his mug and drew in a deep breath of the liquid, savoring the smell of the brew. He wondered if the fact that he and Jakob hadn't moved on from Malta had something to do with the coffee on the world. It was some of the best in Genevian space, courtesy of the volcanic soil that had just the right pH balance for growing the perfect beans. He rose from the table, cup in hand, and walked to the window, looking up at the points of light in the sky, knowing that one of the larger ones was the Maltese falcon. As he was staring out, a sound from below drew his attention and he glanced down into the alley. He could just barely make out two figures moving through the shadows. One appeared to be holding a weapon on the other, and he could hear some hushed swearing. Then the pair passed through a beam of light shining down from a window. It was a man and a woman. He didn't recognize the woman, but he certainly recognized the man. It was Lorne, one of the few men in Hero's organization. Huh. No, that's suspicious, he muttered. What is it? Jakob asked, rising and stepping to Tremon's side. That's Lorne down there with some woman. Jakob swore softly. Shit, that's the woman that went into the diner up on the Falcon with that mech. I just pulled her face from a feed. Any idea who she is? Tremon asked. Sure do, Jakob said with a grim expression. She was in the roster Gloria sent us. She's one of Mild's marauders. Risks. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Furylands. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika strode through the ship on her way to meet with her command team. She was pondering some changes to their force deployment, when Nikki broke into her thoughts. We're getting a message over the ship's QC, Rika. Nikki's voice was grave. It's from Colonel Borden, relayed through Carden. The idea that the ISF colonel had just sent a message from less than a light year away that instantaneously crossed nearly 3,000 light years to Carden, somewhere Rika hadn't even known existed until a few months ago, and was then routed to her a few seconds later was still mind-boggling. It was an amazing tactical advantage, though one they had to use sparingly, as every use of a QC blade caused some of the rubidium atoms to lose their entanglement. From Borden's prior update, Rika knew that the colonel's team had to be close to their objective. While she'd been hoping for a declaration of success, given Nikki's tone, those hopes were unlikely to be fulfilled. Lay it on me. Reached Malta, secured Maltese Falcon Station, Alice has gone down world. Allison captured by local gang, also down world. Rest of team present. Taking neat destroyer. Plan to secure moon base and hit Cerulean City on Malta. One day till neat cruiser arrives at Malta. Rika stopped and whispered a curse. Damn it. There's no way we can make it to Malta in a day. We'll just be reaching the heliopause. Once we dump out of the dark layer, we're looking at two more days to get that far in system, even if we burn like mad. And a lot can happen in a day. But don't forget, Borden's pinnace has decent stealth tech. 
They can hide from the needs if they have to. Right, but what about Allison? They can't just leave her with some gang for days, Rika countered. Even if I gave Fred a direct order not to go after her, which I wouldn't, you know he'd still try to rescue her. Mechs don't leave mechs behind. Let's meet with the team. Maybe they'll have some ideas, Nikki counseled. Yeah, maybe someone has a miracle in their back pocket. I might have an option, Vargo Clinton said after Rika explained the situation in the Iberia system. Oh, Barn asked. Does it involve telling us at which point you used to be the governor of some planet? Vargo snorted. <laughs> right, like it would be that easy. How big's the pool? 7,000 credits, Chase supplied. What? Vargo exclaimed. That's it? Leslie's tail is at 50. Wait, my tail? Leslie asked, looking around the room where the battalion commanders were meeting. What are people betting on, that it'll get chopped off in battle? Gruesome, Adira muttered. I'll bet against, if that's what the wager's about. Barn patted Leslie's shoulder. Nothing like that, just how long you'll keep it for. Leslie hugged her tail to her chest. Forever. Shit, Chase muttered. I'm out a hundred credits, though I still have two hundred on it getting chopped off at some point. Chase, Heather exclaimed. It's our good luck charm. How could you bet on that? Yeah. Leslie glowered at Chase, then glanced at Barn. I thought you said there was no pull for that. Uh, Barn made me do it, Chase admitted, and Leslie threw him a dark look before turning back to the sergeant major. Barn, care to explain? Okay, folks, Rika said, raising her hands. As much as I love talking about Leslie's tale, I bet in the five-year-plus range, so forever is a win for me. I want to hear what Vargo has to say. Thanks, Colonel. It's about the Asura. While we were stuck shaking hands and kissing asses back in Blue Ridge, Chief Ashley, my flight leader, was reviewing some of the Nietzschean scan software and realized that the Azura has an experimental scan suite that was intended to be used for more precise dark layer navigation. Which is to say, Barn prompted, that if there is a possible FTL route deeper into the system, the Azura can take it. Rika glanced around the table. Huh. That actually seems like a solid option. The Azura has good stealth, too. It would get us in fast enough if there's a clear path through the dark layer. Azura can take a cruiser, too, Vargo said with a grin. And we missed out on the recent action, so, you know. You know what? Barn grunted. It's our turn for some pew-pew. Vargo held his fingers like they were pistols and made shooting motions as he spoke. Rika shook her head. Glad we're all so mature. Okay, while you all goof off, I'll look over the DL maps for Iberia. Nikki's tone was sour, but Rika could tell that the AI wasn't really upset. She just liked to remind them all she was there. Oh, huh. There's actually a route into Iberia that smugglers used to use, maybe still do. Records on the land show that the Neats patrol its exit points. Well, they used to before they lost 70,000 ships and then a major shipyard. I feel like there might be some sort of idiom in there, Barn mused. It's all law and order until you lose 70,000 chips. Lame, Heather shook her head. So how well does the DL navigation system work? So far as I know, you can only fly in a straight line in the dark layer. So if the scan suite picks up on anything, do we just have to dump out? As excited as Rika was about the option, she wondered what an actual use of the tech would involve. Rika. What about the ex dolly things that Tannis told us about? Nikki asked. You mean the things she said live in the dark layer near stars? In her story, Tannis told us that the ISF summoned them. If this route is often used by smugglers, it should be safe enough. Should we tell everyone about them? Nikki's tone seemed to imply that she thought they ought to. It won't change anything. We still have to risk it. If we don't, our people are going to face that cruiser alone, and they may not make it. Time is of the essence right now. Nikki didn't reply, and Rika refocused on Vargo, who was describing how the sensor tech worked. Um, well, Vargo rubbed a knuckle on his chin. It seems to pick up dark matter objects with very impressive fidelity. The test data that's in the system says that with that added clarity, the grav drive can actually be used in the DL for limited maneuvering. 
From what Ashley was telling me, any ship can push and pull off dark matter with a grab drive. It's just not the sort of thing people try out a lot. Probably because it would normally be terrifying, Chase said as everyone absorbed what that would mean in practice. Yeah, Vargo nodded. But if it worked, it could get us there in time. And if it doesn't, Heather asked. Vargo shrugged. Then you never find out where I was a governor. Score, Captain Scarcliff shouted. I had 500 on it being true, and that sounds like a confirmation to me. Maybe, Barn drew out the word. Care to confirm, Vargo? Confirm what? Chipped. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Kusa District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Allison heard random words fade in and out before her mind fully returned to consciousness. At first, they didn't make sense, but after a while, she was able to piece them together. Active defenses make different. Maybe SMI-3 found port try plin. The words twisted around, nearly forming meaning, then not, then coming back again. Suddenly, Allison realized what was happening and tried to sit bolt upright, only to find that she couldn't move. Seconds later, a voice came into her mind, sounding soft and gentle, but tinged with a note of humor. Shh, it's okay. If you're hearing this, that means someone tried to put a discipline chip in you. Of course, that's not gonna do bupkis, but they're gonna think it's got you under their control. Now that her mind was mostly in order, barring the throbbing headache from what she suspected must have been an EMP of some sort, Allison realized that the person talking was Phineas, the transcend scientist who had upgraded the mechs to their Mark IV versions. Okay, on the lower right of your HUD, you're gonna see a new visual gauge. As the recitation played, a caricature of Phineas's face appeared and winked at her. This is your painometer. You can use my lovely mug, or you can just use a numerical gauge. I hope you use my face. That'd be hilarious. The word stopped for a moment, and Allison wondered if that was all, but then Phineas's recording said one more thing. You're probably in serious shit if you've been chipped. Remember, you're one badass mech, and whoever did this to you is gonna suffer big time. But play it cool. Make them think they have you under their control, and get the lay of the land before you make your move. Okay, I'm done now. You can move again. Good luck. Allison wondered what she would have done without that gentle admonition to play it cool. She told herself that she probably would have, but she still appreciated Phineas leaving the message to calm her nerves. Like all the mechs and the marauders, her greatest fear, the one she never spoke of, was being chipped again. Stars, I sure hope he did this right. With Phineas's message complete, she considered the ramifications of being captured by someone with the means to chip her, until she realized that speculation was pointless. She began to focus on the sounds in the room around her. There was no telltale hum of a starship, but there was the sound of air movement. It didn't seem like it was coming from a ventilation system, and as she concentrated, it became clear that it was the sound of wind blowing outside a window. Okay, I'm planetside. After cycling her helmet's optics a few times, she realized the reason she couldn't see was because something was over her head. It was more than just a simple covering. It was blocking all EM, though, strangely, not sounds. Of course, the secondary pickups on my arms. That's how I'm hearing. Huzzah for being a Mark IV. Allison reviewed the system checks her body was running through and realized that, while her GNR and all her limbs were still in place, another benefit of being a Mark IV, only she could trigger limb removal. Her ammunition had been removed. Her drones were also all fried. She could still fire an electron beam with her internal batteries, so whoever it was she could hear shuffling around in the room with her was either very brave or very stupid, or maybe some of each and well compensated. 
I can tell you're awake, the voice said suddenly. Your EM signature changed. I don't know if you've realized this or not yet, but I've put a discipline chip in your head. I came across some a few years back. Never thought I'd have a use for them, but hung on to them anyway. Good thing I did. I'm going to remove the EM dampening sheet, but if you try anything, I'm going to give you a walloping dose of discipline. You got it? Allison nodded, and a moment later she sat up and lunged for the speaker, a tall man who looked half jubilant and half terrified. On her HUD, the painometer showed Phineas's face scrunched up in agony, though Allison felt nothing. Knowing she had to play the part, she froze and then doubled over, miming pure anguish. Well, looky there, the man said as the fear fled his face, to be replaced by a smug grin. I've got my own pet mech. The painometer changed to show a winking Phineas again, and Allison straightened and stared down at her captor. Can you speak? He asked. Yes, of course, Allison replied. The man had been standing partially in shadow, but the moment he stepped closer, everything that had happened over the last two months suddenly made a lot more sense. Whoever this guy is, he's a damn close relative of Alice's. From the shape of the nose, cheeks, and brow, to the curling sneer of the lips, the man before her was just a gender and a few small differences away from looking just like Alice. She suspected brother, but he could be her son as well which meant someone would have had to have slept with the wicked witch. The man regarded her for a moment, a hand rising to his chin. He was about to say something when a woman stuck her head in, this one with red skin, her golden eyes and the lines on her skin glowing brightly in the darkness. We might have a lead on Lorne, she said. Okay, Lumen, Yaka said absently and waved her off before looking back at Allison. So you have to do whatever I say, right? Well, I don't have to, but you can make me wish I did, Allison said, trying to mix the right amount of morose defeat with simmering anger. Like when you tried to take a swing at me just now. Yeah, Allison replied. I'm not a remote control robot. I still have to do things. You just control punishment. The man, who Allison was pretty sure was Hero, nodded slowly. Okay, I get it. Seems a bit sloppy, but I guess I can see how it would work in a military setting. Allison didn't reply, and Hiro suddenly let out a laugh. <laughs> what if I told you to go out there and kill a lumen? I don't think you'd have to use any discipline at all to prompt that, Allison replied. I suppose not, Yaka said as he looked her up and down. Not that I'd do it. You and your people killed a lot of my girls up on the Falcon. I'm not too happy about that. Luckily, Dell was around and took you down. Allison shook her head as she regarded the man in front of her, wondering how he really thought something like this would play out. You've made a pretty stupid mistake, Hero. Look at that. You figured out who I am. Does the mech want a cookie? What kind do you have? Hero frowned as he took a step closer. Allison considered reaching out and crushing the life from the man, it would be easy. He'd be dead before any of his girls realized what was going on. But Hero represented a connection to Alice, and she suspected that Lauren was the contact that had met with the lieutenant colonel in the Silver Train Diner. Does Hero not want to be found by Alice? Does he even know it's her that is looking for him? I thought Mex didn't have faces, Hero said after a moment. You're certainly a pretty thing, not as good looking as my girls but I wonder if we could get you fixed up to look like one of them. Now that would be hot. Huh, Allison grunted. Thought you'd be in it to sell me, make some quick credit. Maybe down the line, Hero said as he stepped back and looked her over again. But things are going a bit sideways in Iberia right now. Your friends are making a real mess up on the station, and I think it'll only be a matter of time before they come looking for you. I guess you're not as dumb as you look, Allison said, then grimaced in pain as the indicator on her HUD showed that Hero was hitting her with a mild dose of discipline. No need to be a jerk. What's your name? Allison. Nice name for a piece of hardware, Hero said as he turned away and walked out the door. Come along, let's see what a lumen wanted to show me. Once he'd turned away, 
She took the opportunity to examine the room she'd woken in to see that it was small, likely a bedroom before being converted into a med station. The next room confirmed that this was not some sleek hideout, as it was obviously an apartment's main space. Through a door to the right, she could see a kitchen, and on the left was a San. What do you have, Illumin? I've been reviewing feeds from around Kuza, looking to see if we've got any company coming, and I found him, Lorne. He was down near Lord Street, and the woman was with him. Hero stepped closer to the array of hollow screens that Illumin had arrayed in front of the room sofa. Did you get a visual on her? Who is she? I didn't. Illumin shook her head. She keeps her face covered, and those glasses create some sort of distortion that messes with the facial recognition systems. The gang leader turned from his red-skinned accomplice and stared into Allison's eyes. Do you know who she is? Allison made a split-second decision and decided not to reveal anything about Alice. If they really were related, the last thing she needed was for them to team up. No clue. She never showed her face to me. Hero turned on Allison, his eyes hooded with suspicion, and her painometer spiked. She fell to her knees, hoping that her groans and moans were convincing. Seriously? Hero asked. Do you really expect me to believe that? Allison gasped and nodded frantically. Yaka. Elumin placed a hand on his arm. Please, is that necessary? Hero glared at Allison and then the pain stopped. Damn mech. Damn squishy. Allison shot back, glaring at him as she rose. A trickle of discipline was sent her way, and the Phineas face made a mock grimace and then stuck out its tongue. Watch your tongue, mech. Hero's eyes narrowed as he regarded her. How's about you only speak when spoken to? Allison nodded meekly, while Illumin spared her a brief look of concern before she turned to Hero. I don't like that thing. You know those mechs were all crazy, right? Maybe. I don't think this one is. She's just a pig-headed fool. I'll make her one of my girls soon enough. If you say so, Yaka. The man placed a hand to his chin once more, and then blew out breath. Well, we have Dell Downworld. Let's send him on another hunt, this time for Lorne and his friend. But I want them both alive. A golden-lipped grin appeared on Illumin's face. This should be good. Ambush. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Kuza District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Despite their curiosity regarding what one of Mill's marauders was doing on the streets of Kusa in the middle of the night, Jakob and Tremen remained in their apartment until morning. Jakob's fear of a widespread police sweep didn't come true either. It was unclear why not, but Tremen suspected that the continued chaos on the Maltese Falcon had caused the surface forces to keep their options open. Getting into a street fight with the hero girls while they could face an attack from above was not wise. At least, that's what Tremen and Jakob had arrived at after a healthy debate. Though the police had not made a sweep, the streets were uncharacteristically empty throughout the night, with the residents remaining indoors, waiting, just like the police, to see what was going to happen next. Come morning, nothing dire had occurred, and a few of the district's denizens began to appear outside, some likely looking for whatever opportunity there was to be had in the unrest, and others going to work, if their employers were the sort who opened no matter what. The two men were amongst those venturing out, and as Tremen followed Jakob onto Lord Street, he couldn't help but notice that Flora's den was open, and a few patrons were entering. That wasn't too surprising. He'd never seen Flora's clothes, not even when there was a shootout inside a few months back. What was more surprising and telling was the lack of hero girls anywhere on the street. That was a first. They must be getting ready as well, he said to Jakob as they made their way toward the Maglev station. Their ultimate destination was Cartagena, the southernmost district of Cerulean. Though it was separated from Cusa by only a half dozen kilometers of green space, it may as well have been on the other side of the planet when it came to crime and living conditions. Jakob had a small apartment rented there, 
It was a studio, and they'd be sleeping on the floor. But it was better than being just a few blocks from where Yakahiro operated at a time like this. They made good time down the street, and for once, Tremin managed to suppress his urges to speak with those they passed. In all honesty, it wasn't too hard to pull off, since everyone about that morning had a look of determined isolation about them. When they reached Avonlea Boulevard, traffic on the road was nearly non-existent, though there were a few more pedestrians out and about. Some were milling around the steps leading down into the maglev station, and when the pair of men arrived, they saw why. At the top of the stairs stood a group of police officers, arrayed behind a makeshift barricade and denying entrance. A man in the crowd tried to push his way past the barricade, but a low power shot from a pulse rifle set him back on his ass, and the crowd quickly dispersed. What do we do? Tremon asked Jakob. We keep walking. If the next station's not open, then we'll cross Cartagena Avenue and go down to Jordan Street. Lake Pleasant Transport will send auto cabs at least that far into Cosa, and we can trust them to actually take us where we want to go. Tremon nodded in agreement, hoping his knee would hold out that long and walked silently alongside Jakob until they came to the next maglev station entrance. There, they overheard one of the cops telling a woman who was desperately trying to go down so she could get to work that all the maglevs in Kuza district were offline. Offline, my ass, Tremon said sourly, hoping the woman wouldn't lose her job, whatever it was. I'm not surprised they're locking down. They want the tracks free to move their own voices about, should the need arise or to trap the poor people here and not let them spill into the rest of the city. Trust me, Jakob said as he glanced at a group of men who were strolling down the street, wearing the telltale red armbands of the Rollers. Most of the folks in Kuza are not the spill-out types, unless there's looting and burning to be done, which I suppose might be what the cops are worried about. A block later, they turned down a narrow street that cut diagonally across a few kilometers of city and would get them to Jordan Street faster. Tremon was doing his best to stay alert, but found his mind wandering, perseverating on the events that had occurred on the station above. While the presence of Alice on the planet and Mex on the station hinted that the marauders were here, the attack did not seem like a well-planned military strike. If the mercenaries were really focused on taking the system, they would have hit multiple installations simultaneously, and then followed those strikes up with an inbound fleet. Other than unconfirmed reports of fighting at a Nietzschean base on the moon, there were no other indications of a larger force moving into Iberia. Those thoughts brought him back to imagining what would happen if the marauders did show up and liberated Iberia. Despite wanting to do the right thing, and wanting the best for his people, the idea nearly caused Tremon physical pain. He'd spent so much of the last five years trying to forget his part in the war, or at least dull the memory of it, that he'd never even considered the idea of taking up the torch again. What soul-searching he'd done had led him to believe that he didn't have the spirit for it anymore. He blinked and shook his head, reminding himself that he needed to pay attention to his surroundings. He glanced around and spotted a man and a woman walking in the same direction on the far side of the street, their arms were intertwined, and their heads were lowered, though he could tell by the slight head movements that both were keeping their eyes peeled. Then the woman turned and glanced in their direction, causing Tremon to nearly swear aloud. Shit, that's her. Yes, it is, Jakob confirmed. I've had eyes on them for over a minute now. And you didn't warn me? You seemed suitably distracted. I didn't feel the need to agitate you. For a moment, Tremon wondered what Jakob really thought of him. The man was normally personable enough, but sometimes he said things that made it seem as though he thought Tremon was little more than an itinerant child he'd been saddled with. So what are we going to do? Tremon asked as they continued along at a leisurely pace. If we're lucky, nothing. Don't you want to know what is really going on with all this? Jakob glanced at Tremon and his eyes narrowed. Yes, but from a safe distance. I didn't spend the last six years of my life protecting you to get killed in some street fight. Tremon nodded, but didn't give any other reply, once again wishing that he really understood Jakob's motives. 
The man said he served Tremon out of loyalty, but so far as Tremon was concerned, there was nothing of value to be loyal to. Still, they'd formed a strange bond over the years and mostly enjoyed one another's company. Suddenly, Jakob tensed. Not a lot, but Tremon had learned the man's subtle signs. A slight shift in his shoulders, nostrils flaring ever so slightly. Tremon didn't see anything out of the ordinary. They were on a stretch of road with no intersections for some distance. Most of the buildings were apartments, and the few street-level shops and evidence were closed. Other than Alice and Lorne, the only other people on the street were a mother and her two young boys. She was struggling to corral them and get to whatever destination warranted a journey in the current climate and didn't appear suspicious at all. Then he saw two hooded figures slouch around a corner ahead and cross the street, and then turn down the sidewalk headed toward Alice and Lorne. Don't look at them, Jakob cautioned. There are three more behind as well. They must be heroes, people, right? It's a safe bet. Tremon kept his head down, but still snuck a few sidelong glances. He could tell that the pair walking down the other side of the street was aware of the impending altercation as well. Both had slowed, looking for a good place to make a stand, but there was none. The street offered no cover, and the shops were all shuttered. There weren't even any ground cars nearby to take cover behind. Suddenly, one of the hooded figures pulled a pistol from inside her long cloak and called out for Alice and Lorne to halt. What happened next occurred almost too fast for Tremon to follow. A flurry of rounds flashed back and forth as the two would-be captives fired on the cloaked figures. One of the cloaked figures fell, its hood slipping off to reveal the face of a hero girl. But then shots came from the opposite end of the street, one hitting Lauren in the head and the other striking Alice in the shoulder. Oh shit, Jakob muttered. That's Dell, one of Yaka's top guys. We need to move. Tremon had barely taken two steps when Dell called out from behind them. You two, stop. Before Tremon could even react, Jakob's foot slid to the side and tripped Tremon. He went down, landing hard on his side, with his knee aching all the more. Stay down, the man barked as he spun, a pistol in either hand. He fired a short burst at the hero girl who was now crouched next to Alice, clipping her in the side with the gun in his right hand, while firing the one in his left at the enemies approaching from behind. Tremon shifted where he lay on the ground to look behind, and saw the figure of a large man with two women on either side. One of Jakob's shots hit the woman on the left, and she fell in a heap. Jakob became a blur of motion, suddenly halfway across the street, as a series of rounds tore through the air where he'd been a second earlier. Though he did not have much of a stomach for violence, Tremon was always amazed when he got the opportunity to witness Jakob ply what had once been his primary trade. This time was no different. While continuing to fire on the man and remaining hero girl, Jakob also put two more shots into the girl next to Alice, near Lorne's body. He noted that Alice had pulled herself toward the shuttered storefront behind her. Blood was pouring from her shoulder wound, and once propped up against the building, she placed a hand over the wound, grimacing while pressing on it. While that was going on, Jakob continued to fire on the remaining two attackers. The man shifted behind the final hero girl, using her for cover as he fell back and fled around the corner. Not realizing she was functioning as a human shield, the woman took two in the chest, falling to the ground as Jakob raced after, firing a few shots around the corner before turning back toward Tremon. Get back up, we have to go. What about her? Tremon asked, gesturing toward Alice as he rose. We can't just leave her there. We don't need to borrow trouble, Tremon, especially not that sort of trouble. Jakob began walking down the street at a brisk pace, but Tremon didn't move. So much of his life over the past five years had been about cutting and running, leaving behind dead weight and focusing only on his own survival. Here this woman was, working with a band of mercenaries, hired guns, who were doing more for the people of Genevia than he. Without speaking to Jakob, he grabbed his cane and limped across the street, holding his hand out to Alice. Can you walk? Come with us. Alice glared up at him suspiciously. Who the hell are you, and why would I go along willingly? 
Tremon was taken aback by her brusque manner. But he supposed it made sense, given that she'd just witnessed Jakob kill four people and seriously wound another. He crouched down next to her. Look, I know you're with the Marauders. I know they're moving into Geneva, liberating worlds. We'll keep you safe till they arrive. A strange expression came over the woman's face, as though she doubted his words, or maybe the marauder's eventual arrival. That her eyes cleared and she nodded, okay. She tried to lift her injured arm, but there was no strength in it, and the limb fell back down. Suddenly, Jakob was there muttering, fucking bleeding heart. He knelt down and flung Alice's injured arm over his shoulder, eliciting a pained gasp from her, and then lifted her like she was a child, much to her continued alarm. Sorry, Alice, but we need to move fast. If Euro comes after us because of this, Jakob muttered darkly to Tremon, this is the right thing to do. Tremon shot back, hoping it quelled any future argument. Well, Pleasant Lake is gonna hit my account hard for the cleanup in their auto cab after this. Tremon resisted the urge to laugh while they took the next corner and Jakob led them through a warren of alleys and side streets. Before long, they reached Cartagena Avenue, which was the fastest way to Jordan Street. But Jakob took them through a pedestrian underpass and into another series of closed side streets. Tremon's knee was throbbing. He almost pushed for taking Cartagena Avenue but then chastised himself for not considering the risk of carrying an injured woman down a broad thoroughfare that was sorely lacking in cover. If the cops didn't accost them, they'd likely meet up with a gang of some sort. After another 10 minutes, they finally arrived at Jordan Street. The road ran roughly east-west through the southern end of Kuza, and to their left, they could see the 12-kilometer height of Upper Imdina Tower as it soared over the city. Beyond it, a sliver of Targian Tower was also visible. Just over a hundred meters to the right was the intersection with Cartagena Avenue, which was their ultimate destination. The sight of it caused Tremon to sigh with relief as his knee was close to giving out. Car's on its way, Jakob said as he strode briskly along the road. Tremon nodded, knowing that Jordan Street, being in the nice part of Kuza, had a stronger police presence. Elsewhere in the district, Carrying a bleeding woman down the road was a guarantee that you'd be given a wide berth, but here, it may not play out as well. Luckily, no police appeared, and none of the other pedestrians did more than give them worried looks as they passed. Tremon saw that the bleeding from Alice's shoulder had slowed, but she was deathly pale and appeared to be having trouble keeping her eyes open. For some time, she'd tried to hold her head up, but eventually she gave up resting it against Jakob, rocking slowly with his loping stride. Should we give her something? Tremon asked as they reached the car without further incident. We'll give her water in the car. Otherwise, we just need to let her med nano repair the damage. Okay, Tremon said as Jakob gently set the woman on the seat and then gestured for him to get in, which he did with a sigh of relief. The protector circled around the vehicle, his eyes sweeping the surrounding buildings and then got in as well. Jakob gave Alice a long, measuring look, and then glanced up at Tremon. You're a damn fool. He didn't feel like it. He felt as though this was the first time in a long time he'd done the right thing. Maybe I am a fool. But today we saved someone. It's been a long time since that happened. Sure, Jakob grunted as the auto cab lifted into the air. Let's just hope it's not the last thing we ever do. Ruination. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, MSS Asora. Region, Iberia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Less than a minute after the Marauder fleet shifted out of the dark layer at Iberia's standard FTL transition point, drop ships and shuttles launch from the Fury Lands. As M Company's first platoon moved to the Asora, over a hundred mechs, pilots, and medics crowding onto the destroyer. A half-click ship like the Asura could normally hold a thousand troops without issue, but mechs were a different story, especially with K-1Rs in the mix. The van and Biddy could barely move around in the bays, and with the mechs' larger dropships crowding things further, 
most of the mechs were spread out in various equipment bays, galleys, and corridors. On the bridge, Rika watched as Vargo Clan turned the ship and fired the engines on a braking maneuver that also shifted them onto a near-direct trajectory for Malta. One thing they'd all readily agreed on during planning the operation was that it was wisest to slow the Azora to 0.1c before attempting their in-system dark layer route. Depending on the multiplier the dark layer would provide this close to a star, it could take less than eight minutes to traverse the 50 AU to Malta. They'd exit less than one AU from the planet if the route got them in far enough. There was a nervous air on the bridge that Rika tried to keep from affecting her thorough examination of the scan data flowing in. This far from Malta, the information reaching them was almost seven hours old. Confirming the latest update from Borden, they received updates that the Maltese Falcon was under the control of hostile forces, though from what the public feed said, it seemed more like the station had decided to change sides, though no one was quite certain what side they'd change to. It wasn't visible from this distance, but the local traffic relays confirmed that the Nietzschean destroyer Borden's team had taken was holding in geo over the city of Cerulean, and the feeds were rife with rumors about some sort of fighting on the moon. Rika double-checked the system information feeds, curious what the name of the moon was, only to find that it had never been named. Everyone just called it the moon. People are weird, she muttered while pulling up the view of the rest of the fleet. It felt strange to be breaking so they could ultimately arrive faster, while the rest of the fleet was accelerating to catch up. What was that? Chase asked from her side. Oh, just the moon's name. Real creative, isn't it? He replied with a snort. <sighs> Though, after a while, you start to wonder, why is it that we have to name everything? Could we maybe just give some stuff numbers or something? Rika opened her mouth to reply, but Chase held up his hand. Never mind, that was stupid. I'm just on edge. We've done a lot of crazy things since we started this adventure, but this one takes the cake. I mean, you realize we're putting our lives in the hands of experimental Nietzschean tech, right? Sure, Rika replied with a grin, not to mention Vargo Clans. The ship's captain, currently sitting in the pilot's seat, glanced over his shoulder at the pair. You realize I'm right here, right? Uh-huh, Chase said in a mildly mocking tone. Now fly good and don't get us killed and all that, okay? Fly well, Nikki corrected, and Chase groaned and gave Rika's forehead a dark look. You guys are so funny, Vargo muttered as he turned back to face his displays. Burn us for another 30, then we transition. Backwards? Rika asked as she looked over Vargo's shoulder at his plotted burns and maneuvers. Yeah, the man nodded. The Asura's strongest grab drives are on the stern, so if we need to push and nudge ourselves off any dark matter blobs, this is the best way to do it. Have I mentioned recently how this is totally nuts? Chase asked. Vargo shook his head without turning. You're starting to undermine my confidence, Captain. Don't forget, pirates have used this route with no special scan suite. Oh, I know, I looked at the data, Chase replied as he gestured at one of the side displays, which showed the current in-system dark matter map. They didn't do it when things in the DL were configured like this, though. I mean, according to the maps, there's a big hunk of the stuff right in the middle of your projected flight path. It'll be fine, Vargo muttered. Now can you please shut up? Ashley glanced up from her station, a carefully schooled expression of utter innocence on her face. Hey, Captain. Before we face this possibly life-ending scenario? Yeah, Vargo growled. What system were you a governor of? So help me, Ashley. The transition into the dark layer went smoothly, the stars winking out in the utter nothing of the subdimensional space, almost as cleverly named as the moon, surrounded them. Directly in front of Vargo, a new navigational holo appeared, showing the existing maps of the inner system's dark matter orbits, which were never that well maintained, since no sane person traversed the dark layer within the outer planet's orbits, with the Asura's scan data superimposed over top. Both the ship's scan and the map agreed that there was nothing to worry about for the next several AU. Most star systems didn't have dense dark matter around them beyond 30 AU, a line they would cross in about three minutes. 
The fact that the entire in-system journey would take them only nine minutes was harrowing, to say the least. Reaction times would approach zero, and it would take every ounce of skill Vargo had to manage the approach. Passing 40 AU, Ashley announced aloud, though they could all see it on the screen. I picked up a big clump close to 29 AU. I see it, Vargo replied, his voice sounding far calmer than Rika would have expected, nudging us as much as I can to give it a wide berth. Ninety seconds later, Ashley announced that they'd passed 30 AU. The scan system was starting to pick up small flecks of dark matter all around them, none too close to the ship, but the density was increasing. They passed within a few hundred thousand kilometers of the lump of dark matter Ashley had flagged. At least that's what the scan report said. Rika had no idea if measurements like kilometers really applied in the dark layer, or if it was just an approximation that the navigation system showed to the humans. He's doing really well, Nikki commented suddenly, the utterance startling Rika out of her intense focus. He's a fantastic pilot. I mean, not if you ask Ferris. Rika replied with a laugh. You've been pretty quiet since we left the Lance. Anything up? Uh, I've been thinking about something I want to tell you about. The AI's mental tone held a note of uncertainty, and Rika felt a sliver of worry form at the sound of it. Something bad? No, not bad. Not bad at all, really. But a bit weighty. It's about my past and what I hope for the future. We'll talk about it after all this, though. It's nothing that should weigh you down. You're making me a bit nervous, Nikki. The AI laughed, her tone sounding much lighter. <laughs> Sorry, I really didn't want to bring it up now. This little jaunt is one of those mortality questioning moments, you know. Thinking about all the things left undone? Rika asked as Ashley called out the 20 AU marker. A bit of that. Plus some things I wish I could go back and make undone. Seriously, though, we need to be frosty. Push it from your mind. Rika was about to respond that such a thing was easier said than done when suddenly Ashley cried out, Impact imminent. That piece of dark matter just shifted course. The fuck? Vargo swore, firing maneuvering thrusters to rotate the ship. It's only a 100,000 clicks away and closing fast. Ashley's voice wavered as she gave the update. Rika clamped her mouth shut as Vargo got the engines facing the approaching object and blasted negative gravitons at it. Its approach slowed, and then it seemed to remain equidistant from the Asura longer than Rika would have thought possible, before the space between the two objects suddenly began to increase faster than the thrust the ship was giving off. Okay, Vargo muttered as he corrected the ship's course. Either physics just burped, or that thing was moving under its own power. There's a lot we don't know about the dark layer, Chase muttered, especially this close to stars. Orbital mechanics are orbital mechanics, Vargo shook his head defiantly. All the dark matter maps treat matter as matter, and they're mostly right. If things were that wonky in here, none of our jump point math would ever work. Rico wondered if the blob had actually been one of the things, the ex dolly. A feeling came from Nikki and Rika could read between the lines. The AI was worried. Three minutes to go, Ashley said. Looks clear from here on out. So long as physics doesn't change the rules again, Vargo muttered as he rotated the ship to have the engines facing their direction of travel once more. The next 10 AU passed by without incident, but then the ship's scan suite began to show the open corridor through the dark layer narrowing more than it should. Maybe we should dump out now, Chase said as the gap continued to shrink. We'll be too far for Malta to get there before that Nietzschean cruiser. If we don't beat it to the planet, this whole thing is for nothing, Vargo said while shifting the ship a little to port, pushing off a blob of matter to starboard. Transition just takes a second. We can wait till it gets tighter. Suddenly, the blob of dark matter that Vargo had pushed off moved toward them. Oh, damn. He rotated the ship and fired negative gravitons at the approaching matter, but this time it didn't seem to slow it the thing kept approaching. Vargo, Rika said as the matter closed within 50,000 kilometers. Just a bit longer, Vargo replied. It's smaller than the last lump. Maybe there's some sort of graviton to mass ratio that isn't being reached till it's a bit closer. 
Rika nervously watched the Asura's indicator on the main display as it moved deeper down the shrinking path that led to Malta. It was only a hundred thousand kilometers wide at this point, with smaller bits of dark matter encroaching further into the funnel. Vargo's thrust against the approaching blob pushed them to within ten thousand kilometers of the fringe. She was about to order a transition, when suddenly the large object that had been closing with them reversed course just as the previous one had. Vargo let out a long sigh of relief as Ashley announced, Five AU. Okay, shifting the ship back into the center, he said, angling the vessel, and then firing out a broad stream of positive gravitons to draw the ship toward the middle of the still narrowing funnel. Is it me, or is this route narrowing at an increasing rate? It's like the walls are rushing in, not us rushing down a narrowing passage. Chase said privately as his hand found hers and clasped it gently. A bit, yeah, Rika replied, about to offer a rationale, when suddenly the scan lit up with movement across the board. The small motes of dark matter began to move rapidly toward the Azora, converging on it at a rapid pace. Vargo, dump us out, Rika ordered, knowing exactly what that reading meant. Holy shit, initializing transition. His hands flew across the console preparing the grav bubble protecting the ship to push them back into regular space. A three-second countdown started, and then stalled at one as the ship shuddered and impact alerts flared on consoles across the bridge. What the hell? Chase swore as he rushed to a console. We've got movement down here, Lieutenant Chris called from amidships. Something, fuck, don't shoot it. Chris, what do you see? Something's in the ship, it's... I don't know what it is. It's eating everything. I can't transition, Vargo shouted. The bubble's set. We should be shifting out, but it's like we're being held here. Negative graviton pulse, Rika ordered. Set every dampener and grav plate on the ship to do a max negative pulse. I, Vargo began when Nikki announced, already on it. Rika activated the mag locks on her feet and called out over the ship net. Everyone hold on to your britches. She barely got the warning out when gravity inside the Asura went haywire, pushing and pulling in every direction. Rika felt like she was being torn apart, ducking her head as everything that wasn't bolted down on the bridge went flying. Damage indicators began to light up on consoles, and then a tendril of inky darkness ripped through the overhead and slashed down into the bridge. It swiped right through Ashley's console and then her legs. Rika gaped as she watched both the console and the woman's legs disappear in the thing's wake. Suddenly it was gone, moving so fast that Rika couldn't tell if it had disappeared or retracted. At the same time, normal space snapped back into place on the external view screens. There was a momentary pressure decrease, then emergency grav fields activated, though they did little to diffuse the nervous feeling Rika got from looking up through a hole cut right through the ship. It's gone, Chris called up. We've got some minor injuries down here, but nothing we can't bolt on a replacement for. Get a medic up here, Rika ordered in response. Ashley's lost her legs. On it. Chase was already next to Ashley, who was gasping short breaths while the captain grabbed a canister of biofoam and sprayed it onto the stumps of her legs. The chief's eyes fixed on Rika for a moment, and she moaned. Guess I get to be a mech now. Whatever you want, Ashley. The woman began to fall forward and Rika caught her. Shit, she's passed out. Blood loss is staunched, Chase said. She's in shock, though. Damn it, Ashley, Vargo muttered from his seat. You'd better pull through. Rika glanced up at the system map. Shit, we're still half an AU from Malta. Yeah, Vargo nodded, and our engines are out as are the stasis shields. Oh, and that Nietzschean cruiser we were trying to beat to the planet? It's three light seconds away. Chase clenched his jaw and shook his head. What the hell were those things? I once heard a rumor that there were creatures in the dark lair, Nikki said quietly. I dismissed it out of hand and never gave it a second thought. You didn't think that it would be nice to let us know? Vargo shot back. One rumor? Nikki retorted. One over thousands of years? Would that be top of mind for you against all the other reports containing no news of anything living in the dark layer? Thousands of years? Rika asked, 
trying to parse that piece of incredulous information to everything else that was bombarding her at the moment. Look, Rika, I just took the fall for you and gave them something to latch on to so they can deal with what just happened. Don't put me in a position like that again. Next time you share all the intel you have in mission planning, don't turn into one of those need-to-know assholes. Well, neither of us knew they would attack like that, Rika said lamely, wondering if, on top of putting her crew in more danger than she'd realized, she'd damaged her relationship with Nikki. I'm sorry, you're right. The AI didn't respond and Rika drew a deep breath. Pull yourself together, Rika, there's work to be done. Ma'am? A voice said from behind her, and Rika realized that the medics were trying to get past. She shifted out of the way while still holding Ashley upright. We got her, the other medic said. Watch the hole in the deck, Chase said as he relinquished his position as well. One of the medics placed a med scanner on Ashley's forehead. Okay, her heart rate is stabilizing, but blood's leaking behind the biofoam and into her body. Let's move, the other man said, and they carefully lifted the woman and set her on the hover skiff behind them. Keep me informed, Vargo said, his voice croaking at the end of the statement. Of course, sir. Rika shook her head and stepped to an auxiliary console, trying to force everything from her mind but what they were going to do about the Nietzschean ship. I'm on with the boys in engineering, Nikki said. I have them focused on the stasis shields first. Right, Vargo nodded. We're gonna need them, because that Nietzschean fucker is headed straight for us. Think they know we're not really a Nietzschean ship? Chase asked. Not a lot of ships would have made it here from Blue Ridge before us. Uh, yeah. Vargo muttered, they're hailing us as marauder pirates and ordering us to stand down. Not sure what they expect us to do. We have no shields or engines. We'll just keep on standing as we are. Well, we have weapons and mechs, Rika replied with a grin. So long as they don't just blow us to atoms, Vargo added. Chris, Chase called down to the platoon leader. Get everyone patched up and loaded onto the dropships. We may be abandoning this poor girl, Oh, but keep a team ready to get the medics and Ashley off if we need to. I'll be there in a minute. You got it, Captain. What about the Colonel and Captain Clinton? There's a small pinnace in the forward bay, Rika replied. We'll get to that or the escape pods, if we really do have to abandon ship. You'd better. I'll be pissed if you die. Me too. Chase gave Rika a quick embrace and his lips brushed hers, whispering encouragement before he was gone, rushing from the bridge to prepare his company. Rika watched him go before biting back a sigh and turning to gaze at the forward display once more. You know, Rika said as she watched the Nietzschean cruiser bearing the name Torrent of Fire close with them. At least we drew them away from Malta. Do you see the destroyer Borden's P? Oh, there it is, just came around the planet. Even at max burn, it would take them hours to get here, Vargo said as he flipped through auxiliary systems, checking their status. I wonder. I bet we could get the starboard graph shields back online if we disabled internal gravity and routed the secondary trunk line to their emitters. I think that could work, Nikki said in agreement. Do you think I should have the engineers get on that? Vargo glanced at Rika. Um, depends how close they are to getting the stasis shields back up. Nikki? Uh, shoot. They just got eyes on the stasis field generator. One of those things swiped through the chamber. It's gone. Fuck, Vargo swore. Well, I guess you have your answer. Okay, we're on the trunk line transfer. Rika drew in a deep breath as she watched the torrent of fire draw closer. Chase, get the medics prepped to move Ashley to one of the assault ships. Here's the plan. We're holding course, Vargo Clint said to the captain of the torrent of fire, a rather stern-looking woman named Alina. Rika had stayed off the comms, not wanting to let the Nietzscheans know that there were mechs aboard the ship, and especially not her. Of course, Varga was a mech too, but with his armor and the standard limbs he used for piloting, it wasn't easy to tell. You do know that they must suspect mechs are aboard, Nikki had said when Rika explained her logic. Sure, but suspecting and confirming are two different things. The Neats still aren't really used to getting hit by our all-mech forces. I see that. Alina said, her lips drawn into a line so thin, Rika wondered how she could form words properly. 
We're pulling up to your starboard side, as you've requested. Fargo shrugged. Well, you can come around to port if you want, but those bays are all inoperative. We took some damage recently, then we got stuck in the dark layer too long. Yes, so you keep saying. Alina cut him off. Coming down the same route that smugglers have been known to use in this system. Surprise, surprise. Hey, I'm just glad we're alive, Vargo said. And Rika could tell he wasn't faking that gratitude. The maps had this clear spot, and we did our best to stay in it. And that damage? How did you get it? Parts of your ship look twisted, Vargo shrugged. Beats me. It was Nietzscheans that attacked us. Some sort of gravity field distortion weapon. You must not be in the loop. He's a really good bullshitter, Nikki commented. I mean, everyone knows he's bullshitting, but he honestly sounds like he believes what he's saying. I don't know, Rika said as she studied Captain Alina's expression. I think our friend over there is wondering if there's some new weapon she's missing out on. I bet she feels pretty left out, being stuck in this backwater. Yeah, there is some new weapon that does this sort of thing, Nikki muttered, and it's right on the other side of the veil that separates normal space from the dark layer. I wonder if we could, no, Nikki's denial was emphatic. Don't even think about a way to use whatever the hell we encountered as a weapon. Right, yeah, that seems like a bell that can't be unrung. They have to know about those things, Nikki muttered. They must suppress the knowledge. Who? Rika asked, while half listening to Captain Alina give Vargo a ream of instructions and directives. Nikki's voice was filled with suspicion. The transcend. Maybe the ISF, too. We'll have to see what Borden has to say when we link back up. We're ready down here. Chase reported up. Let's execute a patented Rika's Marauder smash and grab. Okay, Rika replied. If it's patented, do I get some sort of money from it? Not if your people are the ones doing it, Chase replied. Ha, damn, I need to talk to our marketing department, Rika said with a laugh before turning to Vargo. Okay, Clint, wrap things up with your girlfriend there. We need to get to our pinnace. Yeah? Vargo asked, turning to grin at Rika. You see it too? I thought the spark between Alina and I was all in my head. What do you think? A girl like her and a mech like me? Shut up, Vargo. Rika tried to sound stern, but she couldn't help but grin at the man. And no, she's way out of your league. Burn, Nikki proclaimed. But that's a lie. I see the looks he gets from women. Organic girls think Vargo's hot. I kind of like him too. Hush, we don't need to inflate his ego more than it is. Vargo signed off with Alina and rose from his seat. When I was a governor, no one talked to me like that. Oh? Rika's eyebrows rose. And where were you a governor? Some place that was too damn polite. That's why I joined it with the Marauders so I could get my daily dose of abuse. Rika laughed and led the way down to the pinnace, which they found ready to depart with Corporal Yig standing at the bottom of the ramp. Colonel, Captain, he said with a nod, your chariot awaits. You yahoos coming with us? Vargo asked as he slapped Yig on the shoulder. Yeah, Captain Chase sent us to make sure you two didn't get all blowed up. Goob's up front, and Fiona and Cole are in the back. They've got spare ammo if you need any. Rika gestured for Yig to proceed her up the ramp. I'm ready for beer, Vargo. Get them to bring me some, Vargo said with a worried look. I don't trust Goob in the cockpit. Dork always messes with my seat. Yig chuckled and retreated to the small bay at the rear of the pinnace, while Rika followed Vargo to the cockpit. To his credit, Goob was sitting in one of the rear seats, looking perfectly innocent. A little too innocent. Vargo gave the private a sidelong glance as he looked over his seat, which looked to Rika like it was situated properly. We don't have all day, she commented as she settled into the co-pilot's chair. Right. Vargo turned and sat, only to have a feminine voice emanate from the forward console. Hey, big boy. I love it when you sit there. You can pilot me any day. Goop? Vargo shouted as he turned to glare at the AM-4, only to have Nikki laugh in their minds. What? Goob lifted his hands. I didn't do a thing. 
Sorry, I couldn't resist. It was me. And here, I thought we were friends, Nikki. Vargo muttered as he ran through a quick pre-flight check. Rika only shook her head as she brought up the exterior scan view of the two ships. The torrent of fire was drawing close to the Asura, far closer than Rika would have approached, where their positions reversed. Based on their vector, she suspected that the Nietzscheans planned to perform a shield breach. It was a maneuver that required getting within roughly a hundred kilometers of an enemy vessel before launching assault craft, while at the same time boosting toward the target and extending forward shields. The idea was to protect the assault craft as long as possible, but never push your shields past the hull of the enemy ship, or it could fire directly on your vessel. What Captain Alina didn't suspect, at least Rika hoped she didn't, was that the Marauder ship was going to perform the same maneuver, with a twist. They've launched six assault craft, Vargo commented as the torrent of fire continued to close with the Azora, its shields extending before the approaching craft, exactly as Rika expected them to. I have the Asura slave to my console. You okay with flying this bird out of the bay? He asked Rika. I've never flown a dropship other than in Sims, but I can fly a skyscream in vacuum, so I think I can do this. I'm brimming with confidence, Vargo muttered. Don't worry, I have her back, Nikki said in comforting tones. I've flown hundreds of starships. I can pilot the Azura if you'd prefer. No, Vargo blew out a long sigh. If anyone's sending my girl to her grave, it's me. I've confirmed that all personnel are on our dropships, Nikki added quietly. The torrent of fires assault ships past the 500-kilometer mark, turning to slow as they approached the Asura. With one eye on the scan, Vargo peered out into the small bay and whispered, You've been a good ship. Then he hit a control on the console executing his pre-programmed routine. A second later, the deck lurched beneath them as the Asura fired its maneuvering thrusters and rotated on its axis, turning so the ship's port side faced the torrent of fire. Here goes nothing, Vargo muttered and hit the command for the destroyer shields to activate. There was a moment when nothing happened, and then the Asura's grav shield umbrellas kicked on, eliciting a cry of delight from Goob. Sorry, I was worried for a second, he said meekly when Vargo glanced back at him. His dirty look delivered, Vargo turned back toward his console and hit the boost sequence. With the internal agrav and dampening systems now completely offline, the deck shuddered again as the Asura's starboard grav drives activated, pushing the ship toward the torrent of fire while also advancing its own shields. Three seconds ticked down with agonizing slowness and then the shields from both ships touched and passed right through the others. Shit, it worked, Vargo exclaimed. I told you it would, Nikki replied. Once you know their shield's field pattern, which we do, a pre-mapped phase inversion will cause the shields to have no interaction at all. I know the science behind it, Vargo said in relieved tones, but it's nice to see things work in practice. The torrent of fire's forward momentum combined with the grav drives boosting on the Asura's starboard side, kept the ships rushing toward one another. Rika watched the six assault craft that the torrent of fire had disgorged slide off their attack vectors to avoid colliding with the fast-approaching destroyer. The enemy cruiser slowed its approach, but it wasn't fast enough. A second later, the Asura slammed into the torrent of fire shields, the ship shuddering for a moment before Nikki inverted the destroyer shield field nullifying the enemy ship's shields long enough for the marauder ship to slip inside. They had a clear line of fire on the Nietzsche and Hull a scant hundred kilometers away. All you, Vargo, Nikki announced. Rika hoped the Asura could deliver a powerful enough strike on the Nietzsche and cruiser. To hide the fact that they were planning an attack, the Asura's reactors were running at low power, just enough for the shield maneuver, while also trickling energy into the SC batteries. It was just enough for a single full power salvo. Lighting them up, Vargo said, as the ship's port side beams activated and fired at the Nietzschean cruiser. The two functional railguns, the others had been lost in the dark glare, added to the barrage, each getting one shot off before their reserves ran dry. Normally, such an assault from a destroyer against a cruiser would have little to no effect. But given that they were within the larger ship's shields, every shot from the Asura struck true. While they could have dealt crippling damage to the enemy ship, the shots were focused on the cruiser's weapons, 
disabling as many as possible to make way for the twelve dropships that suddenly burst from the Azores' starboard bays. Joining in, Rika hit the emergency release on the bay doors and punched the pinnace's engines as it rocketed down the rails and out into space. She banked the ship around the Azora, pursing her lips at the sight of the vessel's crumpled hull and the strange warps and bends from whatever the things in the dark lair had done to it. Tearing her eyes from the destroyer, she boosted toward the torrent of fire, firing at one of its still functional beams before launching a salvo of missiles at an enemy assault ship. Her beams disabled its engines, while the pinnace's shields managed to shed the return fire the craft delivered. The Asura shields have two, maybe three minutes left on them, Vargo announced, broadcasting to the Marauder assault craft. Once those are down, they can hose us with point defense fire. You all need to board that cruiser any way you can. Staying just behind the Azora's still advancing shields, Rika made for a forward bay on the cruiser, firing two missiles at the doors. One was shot down by a point defense beam, but the other hit its mark, blowing one of the bay's doors off. She punched the engines and passed beyond the Azora's shield coverage, swooping in close to the torrent of fire's hull, firing on other defense turrets and bays as she angled toward her target. Shit, you're not bad, Colonel, Vargo said. Rika nodded, her teeth gritted. Just giving our people as much cover as I can. On scan, she watched as the 12 Marauder dropships closed the final 20 kilometers between them and the cruiser. What beams the enemy ship still had were blazing against the Asura's shields, but the defense still held, keeping the dropships safe behind its barrier. Then, when the leading Marauder craft were a kilometer from the torrent of fire, the Asura's shields failed. Rika watched the dropships all initialize jinking patterns and prayed that they'd all make it. Point defense beams reached out from the enemy cruiser, slashing through space, desperate to track the small ships, but they failed to move fast enough to maintain focus on the inbound craft for long enough to do significant damage. Then the dropships were upon the torrent of fire. Two breached, destroyed bay doors and disappeared inside the cruiser, while another three settled on the enemy ship's hull. Rika was close to her forward bay, but turned back, sweeping across the enemy ship once more in an attempt to draw as much fire as possible. One of the drop ships was angling for a bay, but the doors weren't yielding under its beams, and Rika fired a missile at the doors to lend a hand, while firing another at a defense turret. The bay doors blew open and the ship made it in, but then a nearby explosion caught Rika's attention. She glanced to her left and she saw one of the marauder ships auger into the cruiser's hull. Fuck, she exclaimed, trying to take comfort in the fact that every other one of her dropships had made it. That was the van ship, Nikki said quietly. Rika only nodded silently as she angled toward the bay near the cruiser's bow, spinning the pinnace at the last moment and firing the chem thrusters to break the ship as it slid past the half-destroyed bay doors. Well, if there was anyone in there before... Vargo muttered as the pinnace slid to a halt on a cushion generated by its grab drive. Rika saw a defense turret in the corner of the bay turn toward the pinnace, and she fired the ship's forward beams at it before turning them on the doors that led out of the bay, burning holes through them in seconds. We're dropping the ramp, Yig called up. Thanks for melting the deck, Colonel. It can't be that bad, Rika retorted, and then pulled Yig's feed to see that parts of the deck were glowing red hot. Damn, what sort of cheap alloy did they use in here? I need physical network access to start a breach, Nikki said. Right now, there's too much interference from all the damage to reach the other teams on wireless. Okay, people, let's move, Rika said as she rose and followed Goob out of the cockpit. When she and Vargo reached the top of the ramp, they paused, waiting for Yig to declare the bay clear. Once he had, she walked off the ship taking care to step on the coolest parts of the deck on her way to the inner doors. Behind her, she heard Vargo moan in dismay. Ah, oh, look at her, my poor girl. Rika glanced over her shoulder to see the Azora drift past the bay's outer doors, gouts of flame erupting from hull breaches, while a stream of plasma came from the rear of the ship. That looks like a serious reactor leak, Nikki said quietly. I hope Alina has the wherewithal to fire up her engines and get out of here before that thing blows. Vargo made another pained sound as they reached the doors. Yig waited in the passageway while Cole covered the sternward direction and Fiona advanced toward the bow. 
This ship is a class larger than our Republic, but it should be laid out in a similar fashion, Nikki said. If we head forward and then take the first right, then the second left, we'll come to a major data node, and I can get us into their network. You heard the lady, Rika said aloud. Let's get rolling. Ooh, I'm a lady now. I feel so special. Chase was the first one out of his dropship, the PR-109 in his right hand blazing as he turned to fire on a pair of neats to his left. They were only lightly armored, and when Kelly came out behind him and added her GNR to the mix, they were torn to shreds. He stepped aside to let Kelly and Shoshin out, and then peered back into the dropship to where the two medics crouched next to the med pod containing Ashley. How is she? He asked. Good until that final maneuver, one of the medics said. Her heart rate's been erratic since. I have her on a drip to help steady it, but I'm afraid she might get a bleed going again. Sorry about that. Ferris said as he appeared in the entrance to the cockpit. It was either that or eat missiles. Can you treat her here? Chase asked. The two medics looked at each other, then one shook his head. I don't think so. The pod can keep her stable. But we were in the middle of rerouting her femoral arteries to get the caps on her legs when we had to stop and get to the shuttle. What he means is that she's in a precarious state, the other man said. Okay, Chase said with a nod. Ferris, Grab a helmet and a weapon. We're headed for the Nietzsche med bay. You've been good to me, girl, Ferris said, patting the hull. You captain the undaunted, Chase frowned at the man. How is a dropship your girl now? Ferris shrugged. Every ship I fly is my girl. Plus, the girls I fly. Ferris, just get a helmet on already. Okay, okay. Look who it is, Kelly proclaimed over the combat net and Chase turned to see Sergeant Crunch enter the bay. Damn straight, it's me. Need to make sure you lot don't get the old man blown up. The sounds of weapons fire came through the open doors into the passageway, and then Chase saw a Nietzschean run past, only to slam into an AM Dash Force fist. Or maybe that was the other way around. We need to get Ashley to the ship's med bay, Chase ordered. Leave me your first fire team, and then take three and four toward the bow. I saw Rika heading for a forward bay. See if you can link up with her. I saw that too. Crunch nodded as he turned, yelling something into the passageway. I'll find the colonel and keep her safe. Should just take a few minutes for us to get control of this tub anyway. Don't get cocky, Crunch, Chase admonished. Eighty mechs against one cruiser's worth of neat? I'll have the coffee on before your medics get Ashley in an auto dock. Uh, Chase shook his head as the sergeant jogged out of the bay. Talk like that is the very definition of cocky. Kelly turned back to Chase from the bay's entrance. I think if we take a right out of this bay, we'll come to a bank of lifts. That should take us down seven decks to medical. Chase glanced back at the medics pushing Ashley's pot out of the dropship. Okay, keep your fire team in the rear. Corporal Ben, you're on point. You got it, Captain. Ben replied from his position out in the passage. Fire team 1-1 one, one and moved down the corridor in the direction Kelly had indicated, while 1-2 hung back to cover the rear. The medics had just pushed the pod out into the passage with Ferris right behind them, when Chase spotted motion out of the corner of his eye, and turned to see one of the Nietzschean assault ships that had been bound for the Asura heading straight for the bay. Go, go, go! We've got company coming! Rika sent a pair of drones around the corner and down the next passage. Looks clear. You know, Colonel, we all have drones too, Cole said with a soft laugh. Stars know you have double in those oversized AM-4 legs you have, Fiona replied, shaking her head at Cole. I mean, look at those things. They just look weird on your RR frame. Cole twisted side to side as she strode down the passage. I think they rock. Besides, Bondo hooked me up with the ones that have full agrav. Said there was room for the bats because they don't need to support an AM's weight. Great. Go muttered as he came around the corner last. You can fly around inside a starship. We're not always in starships, Cole said with a mocking tone. Stow it, you two. Yig called back from his place in the lead. Nikki, you sure this comm note is finally gonna be on this? Fuck! The corporal dove backward, hitting the deck as a grenade bounced off a bulkhead and exploded a meter from where he'd been standing. The blast was followed by weapons fire and the mechs pressed themselves up against the bulkheads, 
while Yig rolled over and then sat up. Close one, Corporal, Rika said as she activated her armor stealth systems, waited for a break in the inbound hail of projectile rounds with the odd kinetic slug mixed in, and then leaped across the passage, where she began to work her way down to the intersection where the shots were originating. Good to finally meet some resistance, Nikki said. I was starting to wonder if this was all but a ghost ship. Well, they did send out six ships full of troops. I bet half the people still aboard the Torrent of Fire are just Navy types who know they'd last about two seconds against mechs. Now that you mention it, it would have taken their boarding craft about this long to turn around to get back on their own ship. What with our drop ships blocking half the bays? Rika nodded. That was my thought, too. She reached the cross corridor where the grenade had been thrown and caught a glimpse of the neats firing on the mechs. There were two shooters in heavy armor, with another ten in similar gear behind them. They held the sorts of weapons one rarely saw on a ship. Rails, electron beams, high-powered slug throwers. Damn, they're loaded for bear. It's like they don't care if their ship gets trashed, Rika commented. Well, they were bringing all that over to our ship, Vargo said still sounding remorseful over the loss of the Azora. Rika wanted to tell him that it was just a ship, but she knew that wouldn't help matters. Okay, I'm going to circle around. Her statement was interrupted by weapons fire from the rear of her team's position, followed by a curse from Fiona as she took a shot in the leg and went down. Oh, hell no. Without further hesitation, Rika fired her electron beam right at the two shooters who stood only five meters from her, then she shot two sabot rounds at the neats in the back of the group. There wasn't enough distance for the sabot's extra charge to boost the uranium rods to max speed, but one still blew a neat's arm off, while the other missed its intended target, continued to accelerate, and then tore a rather large hole in a bulkhead a hundred meters back. On me, she shouted to her team, and a second later, Goob was at her side, firing down the cross corridor with his chain gun, while Vargo and Cole directed their shots at the second group coming up behind them. Yig was pulling Fiona along the deck, while the SMI Dash 4 jammed an emergency stint into her leg. Shit, these flow metal stints don't hurt as much, but damn they feel weird, she exclaimed. Goob was taking a lot of hits, but six of the Neats were down. Rika knew they couldn't hold out much longer, but with Neats advancing down both corridors, there wasn't any line of retreat. It was forward or nothing. A moment later, she saw three figures step through the hole at the far end of the corridor where Rika's sabot had hit, and Crunch's voice called out, Down! Rika dropped, pulling Goob with her as rail shots tore through the remaining six neats, shredding armor, flesh, and bone, and unfortunately spraying it across the two mechs who had hit the deck. Ugh! Goob cried out. What's on my helmet? Rika glanced over at Goob and felt a moment's revulsion. Pretty sure those are lungs. Oh, and part of someone's ass is on your chest. More heavy fire tore through the other corridor where Yig and Fiona had been shooting, and then relative silence fell, the only sounds being the scraping of mechs rising to their feet. Dude, Cole said with a snicker as she walked up to Goob, who was pulling bits of lung from his face. You've got butt boobs. Ahead of Rika, Crunch ambled through the haze with a fire team at his back, and to her right, she saw Carrie and her team appear, the RR-4 in the lead helping Fiona to her feet. Really, Colonel? Crunch asked. You were pinned down by, what, 20 neats? They surprised us, Rika shrugged. We're in a rush. We're trying to get to a comm node. Not anymore, Nikki groaned, highlighting a door behind Rika on her 360 vision. Crunch's rescue took out our objective. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that, Crunch muttered. What's the next closest node where you can do whatever it is you wanted to do? The bridge, Nikki replied. Rico waved an arm in the air. Okay, Mex, let's get a move on. In typical crunch fashion, he saved our bacon and then trashed our goal. Luckily, this way we'll have more neats to kill. Rika, the Mex cried out as they advanced. I think that's starting to grow on me. Area is secured. Whispers called up from the medical deck. Kim and Harris are sweeping the level. Hit it, Chase ordered Ben, and the mech nodded before activating the lift, which held himself, the two medics, and Ferris, who'd taken a shot to the stomach and now needed medical attention as well. Express elevator two. 
Okay, moderately quick elevator too. Ferris stammered out. Shut up, Ferris, Ben muttered. You're getting woozy or something. Pretty sure this is how I always behave, Ferris replied with a wheeze. What was I thinking, volunteering to come along for this ride? Chase glanced at Kelly and Kelly, who had taken up positions at either end of the deck's lift foyer, while Shoshin took up a position at the hatch above the ladder-like stairs that led down through the ship. When they hit the bottom, we move down the ladders, he ordered. You got it, Kelly and Kelly said in unison. Stars, do you two practice that? Practice what? They asked together. Shoshin groaned from where he stood over the hatch. I hate it when they do that. We're down, Ben announced a moment later, moving Ashley to one of their auto docks. Let's go, Chase ordered, dropping down the ladder right after Shoshin. Kelly and Kelly followed a moment later, and the group leapfrogged their way down several decks, briefly engaging with a group of Nietzscheans halfway down. When they reached the medical level, the fire team took up positions at the entrance to the section, and Chase went in to check on Ashley. She's doing well, one of the medics said as he entered the room they'd appropriated. Ferris is in the next one. His liver took a hit, but from the looks of it, he needed a new one of those anyway. Chase laughed and nodded. Now that I can believe. Their doctors are all still down here, and there are a couple of neats in the other rooms, brought down after we shot up their ship, the man continued. Figured there would be. Chase replied and was about to check on who was watching them when Kelly suddenly shouted over the combat net. Shit, we've got company. Neats are forming up out at the lifts. They've got some serious battle rattle, but they're being cautious. I think they're trying to avoid trashing their med bay and their doctors. Chase returned to the entrance of the medical section, where fire team 1-2 was trading fire with the Neats out in the lift foyer. These guys don't suck, Kelly said as she fired an electron beam at a Neat. It scorched his armor, but didn't slow him down as he moved into position to get a clear line of fire on her. Chase saw that the enemy had a rail gun and was about to tell Kelly to fall back when the deck shook like the ship had just taken external fire. He was about to check for alerts on the ship's general network, which had just begun responding again in the medical level, when the doors blew off one of the lifts, bowling over several neats. A hulking figure stepped out of the lift's wreckage, and Chase breathed a sigh of relief as he recognized the unmistakable figure of a K-1R mech. Nice of you to join us, Van. I was wondering if that impersonation of an auger your ship did was going to be the end of you. No chance, the Van replied. Stooping to avoid scraping the overhead, the mech aimed the chain gun on his right arm at a group of neats and opened fire, while grabbing one of the nearby enemies with his left and flinging him into his companions. Chase and Shoshin directed their fire at the enemies on the van's right, finishing them off while the massive mech focused his attack on a group of neats who were concentrating their shots on his torso, trying to crack the shell that kept him safe. Puny Nietzscheans. He rumbled the words aloud, followed by a laugh as he took a step toward them and swept his chain gun's blazing fire across the enemies. Four fell, but the final two retreated behind a bulkhead, only to be exposed once more when the van ripped the wall apart and then sprayed a hail of rail shots at the last two neats. You make quite an entrance van, Chase said as he walked through the lift foyer, making sure the neats were dead. Where's the rest of your team? Lieutenant Chris is coming. The van gestured up the lift shaft. We have entered, but no fatalities. Chase slapped the K-1R's back. Good to hear. Soon as we hear from Kara and CJ, we'll know the whole tune's okay. What about Rika? The van asked. She made it in, I'm certain of it. I sent Crunch forward to find her. The K-1R shifted his shoulders back and forth in his make's approximation of a head shake. Hope he doesn't blow the ship up. Hitting Dirt. Stellar Date 12.23.8949. Adjusted Years. Location. Descending onto Malta. Region. Iberia System. Old Genevia. Nietzschean Empire. Sure was nice aboard and Delonis's pinnace, Fred said, as Gemma disabled the stasis shields before she brought the ship into Malta's stratosphere. Gemma gave Fred a measuring look. Think of it less as a loan and more like a ride. Once I drop you four off, I need to get back up to the moon so I can get the colonel and the rest of my team. And then you'll come back for us? Randy asked a note of apprehension in his voice. 
Gemma laughed as she slid through the clouds. I'll sure try, you know how things go. Worst case, we grab our own ride or find a hidey hole until the fleet arrives, Fred said over his shoulder to Randy. I'm not really a sit in a hidey hole sort of person, Genesa said, a scowl forming on her brow. Un her words were cut off as an alarm blared on the console, and Gemma swore, suddenly diving the pinnace toward the planet's surface. We've got incoming missiles, she said through clenched teeth. Can't you turn the stasis shields back on? Cor asked, picking up on the worry in Gemma's voice and mirroring it in his own. She shook her head. Not in atmosphere. Stasis and thick swaths of atomic nuclei don't get on well. I'll see if I can lose them. But if not, we'll have to climb back into space. The ship was traveling west to east along Malta's equator, with the peaks of the Sierra Pyrenees below. The mountain range ran north-south and was covered in glaciers, even at the equator. It was toward those peaks that Gemma dropped the ship, banking amongst the towering spires of rock. It's no good, she muttered. They're staying overhead, either waiting for us to come out of the mountains or to slow enough for them to pursue more closely. Doesn't this thing have any of its own missiles? Fred asked, looking over the unusual configuration of the ISF consoles. Sure, yeah, Gemma grunted as she banked around a cliff face and then over a scree-covered slope. Just that we use them all securing a landing on the moon. The automated defenses are trying to tag our friends out there with beams, but they're jinking around too much. Gemma wove further east through the mountains, then came around a tall peak to find a wall of seven-kilometer-high peaks before them. Damn it, she muttered as she punched the pinnace's throttle, boosting it up over the towering spires and into the clear, before diving down the other side. Suddenly the skies turned white, and the ship's exterior displays all dimmed. Nuke, Fred exclaimed, and the boards lit up with failures as the electromagnetic wave washed over them. Sparks cascaded from equipment, and a massive discharge arched between the bulkhead and core, causing the mech to swear as it burned away part of his thighs a blade of plating. Suddenly the nav console went dark, and the ship tipped forward, angling toward the ground. Without missing a beat, Gemma stomped a foot down on a plate between her legs, and a stick swung up from the deck. What the fuck is that? Randy asked as Gemma grabbed it and pulled back. We're a damn glider now, Gemma grunted. This is the hydraulic control. Most advanced pinnace I've ever been on, and it has hydraulics, Fred muttered as the ground grew closer on the forward displays. Any chance a prop engine is going to pop out? One just did but it's powering the hydraulics. We like to be prepared, Gemma said as the pinnace finally leveled off a kilometer above the ground. Plus side, I think when the nuke went off, it took out the other missiles. Why do you think that? Randy asked, peering out the windows on the side of the pinnace. Because none of them have hit us, Fred replied. Now shut up and let the lady fly this brick. Thanks, though it's more like a large wing, Gemma muttered. Stars, the colonel is gonna be pissed. He rather liked this bird. We're close to Kapara, Fred said, looking over the map of Malta on his HUD. We gonna try to sit down there? Close, Gemma replied. We have to blow the pinnace, though, so I don't want to be near people. Not that it matters, our glide ratio won't get us that far anyway. Fred nodded solemnly, knowing that the ISF was very particular about their stasis shield technology. He understood why. If the tech were to fall into the wrong hands, it would instantly turn the tide of the war. The ground continued to creep up toward them as Gemma banked around some of the taller foothills marching down the eastern side of the Pyrenees Mountains toward the forested lowlands. Keep your eyes peeled for a clear patch, she advised as they passed below 800 meters. Agrav is totally out, so hitting trees would really suck. Maybe we should jump, Fred suggested, then find the wreckage and finish it off. Gemma looked like she was seriously considering that option when Cor pointed out the left side of the craft. There's a lake there, will that do? Yeah, the pilot nodded, gently banking the craft. That'll do just nicely. Someone go to the comm node and pull the blade labeled AUX-19A out and put it in the case below the rack. We need to bring that with us. We'll jump before the pinnace hits the lake, and I'll set it to go off after it hits. On it, Cor said as he rose and left the cockpit. I hope everyone packed their chutes carefully, Fred said, as he rose and gestured for Randy and Genesa to make their way back to the portside ramp. Don't go yet, 
Gemma said as she centered the forward view on the lake. Hold the stick while I get up. Fred complied, easing into the seat behind her and reaching over her left shoulder to hold the stick in place, while Gemma shifted around it. Once she was in the aisle between the seats, she checked the ship's trajectory, then knelt down and locked the base plate around the control stick. Okay, let's roll. Partway down the passage, Gemma paused and slid aside part of the bulkhead. Within stood a large cylinder with an inactive control panel near the top and a large dial in the center. Crap, she muttered. I hoped this thing would still be active. Can you believe they put a mechanical detonator on this? This being? Fred asked, worried that it was what he thought it was. The microgram of antimatter in there, my marauder friend. Damn, you people don't take the prospect of losing your tech lightly. Gemma turned the dial to a five-minute setting and then punched a button next to it. Fuck, it even ticks, Fred muttered as he rushed to the ramp where the rest of the team waited, Cor holding the case Gemma had instructed him to grab. Is it in there? Gemma asked as she pushed past Fred. No, I just like to carry around empty cases. Fred was about to admonish Cor when Gemma stretched out a booted foot and kicked him off the end of the ramp. That's what you get for being a smartass, she called after him. There's an antimatter bomb about to go off on this thing, so any time you two want to join Cor, Fred said to Randy and Genesa, making a shooing motion with his hand. The hell? Randy managed to blurt out before Genesa pushed him off the ramp and jumped after Gemma held out her hand and gestured for Fred to go next. I gotta be last. Fred stepped to the end of the ramp, but suddenly Gemma kicked him from the pinnace as well. And that's for letting that idiot Alice sucker you into coming to this stupid system. He spun as he fell, looking back up at the pinnace, worried that the ISF lieutenant was going to go down with their ship. But then he saw her dive out after him. When he passed 300 meters, Fred triggered his chute, jerking sharply as it deployed from his back, and 400 kilograms of AM-4 rapidly changed velocity. His HUD showed the rest of the team spread out over a few kilometers, with Cor already on the ground. He looked for an opening in the forest's canopy, spotted one and angled toward it. The gap wasn't big enough for his chute to fit through, but once he was over the clearing, Fred cut his chute free and dropped the final 40 meters to the ground, firing the dampening agrav units in his thighs before he touched down. He looked toward the lake and saw a figure pass through the trees roughly 80 meters away. I'm down. Sound off, Fred ordered. A-OK, no thanks to Gemma, Cor responded first. Case and its contents are safe. Good here, Randy added, followed by Genesa a moment later. Safe and sound, Gemma said last as she raced through the brush toward Fred. We should try to put as much distance between us and... Her words cut out as the ground shook beneath them, and a sound like the universe had split apart tore through the air. A blinding flash of light lit up the forest, and Fred's heat gauges topped out at over a thousand degrees. Trees all around burst into flame, and Gemma grabbed his arm as she ran past. Seriously, you dumb lump of steel, get moving! Somehow, he didn't take her words as an insult and took off after her wondering if her tone had been more general worry or if he'd really heard an undertone of affection. Damn it, Fred. Seriously, worry about getting out of the raging forest fire first, then wonder if the girl is into you. A few minutes later, they reached Cor's location in a clearing just beyond the edge of the fire. That's something else, Genesa said as they looked up at the cloud overhead. That's a mushroom cloud made of lake water, right? I think so, it must be. Gemma nodded. Yeah, that's definitely rainfall. Maybe it will put out the fire. Fred checked his map and traced the best route to Cerulean. We still have an objective, people. We're 70 clicks from Kapara, at best speed. We can be there in just over 30 minutes. Then we take the maglev line that runs from there to Cerulean. Hour and a half tops, we can be in the city. Think they're just gonna let a bunch of mechs onto a maglev? Randy asked. I'd like to see them stop us. Fred replied, looking over the mechs and ISF lieutenant. Well, what are you waiting for? A picnic? It gets worse. Stellar date 12.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, Torrent of Fire, approaching Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire.
They'd made it a hundred meters without running into a single Nietzschean. And Rika was beginning to wonder if the enemy had taken that many losses, or if they'd all fallen back to a last line of defense at the bridge. From the general map Nikki had managed to pull in a brief moment of wireless connectivity, Rika had learned that there was a small CIC-like area directly aft of the bridge. As her two final micro-drones raced ahead and flew into it, she saw that it was there the Neats had decided to make their last stand. However, that last stand would be woefully inadequate. Arrayed against 15 mechs, there were only 12 Nietzscheans. And while they all wore some armor, only four held anything other than pulse rifles. Relaying her voice through her drones, Rika called out, So, I know that when you sign up, you swear an oath to defend Nietzsche to the end, or something like that. I'm curious, how many of you woke up today expecting this day to be your end? No one replied, but she could see several of the Neats glance at one another. I know that the door behind you is reinforced, and beyond it, hiding on her bridge, is your Captain Alina, or maybe Ipina. Weak, Nikki commented, and Rika was glad that the AI had resumed mocking her like normal. You could help. I am. I have drones taking a nice big dose of breech nano to the bridge door. Keep them busy. Okay, I can see that didn't really sway anyone. Thing is, we're taking the ship. We've taken larger craft with fewer mechs. We're still well under par, and I want to set a new record. So this is your last warning, surrender or die. Though a few of the defenders shifted uncomfortably, none made a move to stand down. Rika drew in a deep breath, ready to move in with the three SMI mechs and take out the enemy heavies before the rest of the mechs attacked. At least they're loyal, Crunch said. Dumb, but loyal. Rika nodded absently, and had just signaled the other SMIs to activate stealth when the bridge's door opened. That was fast, she commented to Nikki. It wasn't me. A figure appeared in the doorway, hands raised, and Rika saw that it was Captain Alina with a look of miserable disgust on her face. We surrender, you murderous bitch. Five minutes later, Rika stood on the bridge with Alina before her. The captain had broadcast an order for her people to surrender to the mechs. Your people fought well, Rika said as she settled into the captain's chair. Better than most. Alina didn't reply, and Rika sighed. The captain was the only member of her command crew left on the bridge, and with four mechs present, Rika decided it was safe enough to remove her helmet and look her adversary in the eye. You never had a chance. You must have realized that when we boarded your ship. You couldn't have stood up to a platoon of mechs, even if the torrent of fire was brimming with troops. The Nietzschean woman's eyes narrowed, and she folded her arms across her chest. You're not immortal. You're still human. You bleed, you can die. Rika gave a respectful nod. Not a lot of Neats grant us that much respect, calling us human. The captain shrugged. Well, you're deformed and disfigured humans, but still human. Ah, Rika gave a mocking laugh. <laughs> There's the Nietzschean arrogance we've all come to know and love. I thought I'd bumped into one of you who actually had a soul. No one has a soul, Alina replied with narrowed eyes. That's just nonsense that weak people spread to give themselves hope. Life is what you make of it. Sheesh, I've really ruined your day, haven't I? Besides, I don't know about all that, Rika replied with a shrug. But if what you say is true, then I'm a lot better at making something out of my life than you. How does it feel to know that a deformed and disfigured Genevian mech beat you? She leaned forward, unable to keep herself from giving the Nietzsche a smug grin. I'll admit, when the Asura hit your shields, I thought we were done. But then we got the phasing right and passed on through. No wonder you surrendered. You don't want to have to face your superiors after getting shield breached while you were shield breaching. Alina's jaw tightened and she spoke through clenched teeth. Are you done yet? Well, I wasn't. But if you're going to take all the fun out of it, I guess I am. The captain didn't respond, her cold blue eyes boring into Rika's. Okay, fine, Rika straightened, 
This is where you give me all your command codes and actually surrender the ship to me. The Nietzschean shook her head in disbelief. You really think you're just going to win without any trouble here, don't you? Without any trouble? Rika asked, eyes widening. Were you here a minute ago? When I was talking about breaching your shield breach and all our brilliant tactics? That wasn't easy. For a bit, I thought the van had died. The who? I'm in, Nikki announced. Same vulnerabilities we used to take our first fleet back in Hercules still work here. I have full control. Guess I don't need you now, Rika said, gesturing for Kelly and Kelly to take the Torrent of Fire's captain to a holding room. We have the ship, and in a day or two, we'll have the whole system. A smile lit Alina's face. Well, you'll have most of the system. What's she playing at? Rika asked. I don't. Oh, shit. Something's boosting out of a mining facility out past the moon. Rika turned to the holo tank as a view of space surrounding Malta appeared. The planet floated on the left, with the moon in the upper right. The Maltese falcon was 40 degrees from passing between the moon and the planet below. Trailing behind the moon, out beyond the fourth Lagrange point, was a cluster of small asteroids and an old mining platform. In her initial review of the system, she'd noted it, and assumed that it was abandoned after being shut down during the war, or some time not long after. That supposition had just been proven wrong. A group of 12 asteroids were moving away from the mining facility on a course that would lead them directly to the Maltese Falcon. We call them planet punishers, Alina said from the entrance to the bridge, a look of Pyrrhic victory on her face. We might lose Iberia, but you won't win it either. You can see that they timed it just right. When the Falcon falls, it's going to hit Cerulean. One shot, a quarter of the planet's population dies. Alina's calm delivery of the news that half a billion people were about to perish caused a burning rage to form Enrique's chest, and she felt every muscle and carbon sinew in her body tense. She could see that she wasn't the only one that felt that way, as evidenced by Kelly's fist rising slowly. Before Rika could order her not to, the mech's hand came down, striking Alina in the face and splitting the woman's lip and half her cheek open. The captain screamed in agony, trying to raise a hand to her face, only to have Kelly slap it away. Kelly, Rika admonished without any conviction. We don't abuse prisoners. Of course not, Kelly replied. Is it okay if I just kill her then? Every fiber of Rika's being wanted to say yes, but somehow she managed to mutely shake her head, and the two mechs hauled the captain who was trying to ask for a medic from the room. Despite everything going on, Rika felt a small mode of pity for the ship's captain. At the very least, Alina had done the right thing in surrendering and sparing the rest of her crew a death at the hands of the mechs. Kelly, get a medic to look at her. Seriously? Kelly sounded incredulous. I should have torn her jaw off. This is a truly heartless bitch. Rika had to admit that Kelly was right. But she could also tell that Alina's concern for her own people and her pure loathing of the Genevians was a sign that she'd been conditioned all her life to believe that others had less value than her own people. The conversation she'd had with Nikki not long ago about what she was willing to do to win the war came to mind. I don't know. Tell the medic to make it leave a scar or something, if it makes you feel better. But don't hurt her anymore. That's not who we are. That's who they are. Fine. Rika knew there was a thin line, and she'd probably stepped over it more often than she cared to admit. But in this case, she was only going to sidle right up to the edge and no further. I have options, Nikki said on the command net, and Rika turned back to the holo display. Lay them on me she said with a resigned sigh. Those rocks they're lobbing at the Falcon aren't moving too quickly, in the grand scheme of things. Most asteroids don't really have enough structural integrity to boost them hard and fast. At the rate they're boosting them, they'll reach the Maltese Falcon in just over an hour. The torrent of fire is only eight light seconds from the station. We can boost hard and laze the rocks before they hit. Some debris might make it through, but I think the station will survive. Rika nodded. I suppose that no matter what option we pursue, we need to get over there, fire things up. Can I fly her? 
Vargo asked with a wide grin as he sat at the pilot's console. It might help my sorrow over losing the Asura. All yours, Nikki said, and the pilot's console lit up. I've dropped a plot on the nav system if you want to use it. Think this ship is good enough for the governator? Rika smirked wanly at her weak attempt at levity as she glanced at Vargo. Gah, that's gotta be the worst thing I've ever heard. What about the Nietzschean destroyer Borden's people have? Rika asked Nikki as she turned back to the holo tank. Are they close enough to engage those rocks? If they have the weapons for it, Nikki announced. I'm working on raising them. Rika nodded as the torrent of fire shuddered beneath their feet. Just lost the port side main engine, Vargo muttered as he quickly adjusted the ship's thrust to balance against the load. Shifting ballast, giving it as much as I can get. Rika pursed her lips as she watched civilian ships begin to boost away from the Maltese Falcon in droves. What about missiles? Rika asked Nikki. A ship this big must have enough to boost over there and blow those rocks away. I'm in their inventories now. Damn, looks like they haven't had resupply in some time. They fired the last of them at our dropships. Crap. Rika ran a hand through her hair. First time I ever wished a Nietzschean ship had more missiles. Lieutenant Saris here. A voice came into Rika's mind. Glad you took the torrent of fire. We were considering some pretty crazy options to take it out, like ramming it and bailing, which I guess is what you did in a way. How the hell did you get here so fast? Anyway, we're moving to engage those rocks the Neats just launched. I think we could take them out early enough for the debris to clear the station. It'll be tight, though. Glad we saved you from having to do anything crazy by doing it first, Lieutenant. Rika sent back with a laugh. We're limping along as fast as we can, but I don't know that we'll make it soon enough to help. Can your team on the Maltese Falcon use the station's point defense systems to help? Rika tapped a finger on her thigh impatiently during the seconds it took her message to get to Saris, play, and then for the lieutenant to send a response. Sorry, Colonel. The fucking neats remove most of the station's point defense. They're trying to get the civvy ships to help, but most are just boosting out. We don't actually have anyone on the Falcon anymore. A few of the station administrators took the opportunity to stand against the Neats, but without our muscle on their decks, I don't know what more they'll be able to do. Options? Rika asked the team on the bridge, which currently consisted of her, Vargo, and Nikki. The rest of the mechs were still busy securing the Nietzscheans and dealing with a few holdouts. Our dropships are still fueled up, Vargo said, as he worked to balance the torrent of fire on its starboard engine fusion and auxiliary boosters. You know, this damn ship has an AP drive, but they don't have any antimatter for it. Oh, I have an idea, but it's nuts. He glanced at Rika and she realized what he was suggesting. Ferris, are you still down there in medical? Yeah, Rika. Uh, Colonel. Took a slug to the gut. Dogs are growing me a new liver. Damn, Rika muttered. I have a suicide mission and I thought you'd be right for it. Mad Dog is here too. Ferris replied with a strained laugh. He loves crazy shit. Rika didn't reply before switching to Chief Charles. Chuck, I need you on a bird and back on the Asura yesterday. We need the reserve bottles of antimatter. Take Jenny and Ainsley. I'm letting Lieutenant Chris know to have them meet you at. I'll sync up with them, Chief Charles replied. Mad Dog's delivery service? Uh, at your service. Think this will work? Rika asked Vargo. He glanced at her, sounding more than a little uncertain. Maybe. That plasma plume on the Azura cut out, so I don't think the ship is gonna blow anymore. You still there, Colonel? Lieutenant Saris asked. We're running into some trouble here. There's a flight of fighters escorting those rocks, and we didn't see them at first, tucked into the shadows or something. But we're doing everything we can to keep them at bay. Rika bit back a curse as the relayed scan data from Saris's destroyer showed 22 fighters peeling away from the inbound rocks, headed for the destroyer. What about Borden? She asked. Is he still on the moon? He is. He has control of their rails, but they're in fixed positions and can't hit those rocks. Not until they're already on top of the Falcon. And your handy stasis shield pinnace? Rika knew it had to be tied up, otherwise it would be protecting the destroyer from the Nietzschean fighters. Gemma has it. She was flying Fred and his team down to the planet to get Allison. There was a nuclear explosion, and then another antimatter blast. I think the thing's gone. The antimatter one was a bit later, so I think it was a controlled detonation by Gemma. 
crap, Rika muttered aloud, before sending Sarah a message to hold for a minute. She fought down the worry that Gemma and Fred's team had died before she could even get there, and glanced at Vargo. Why the hell is this all so difficult? If it was easy, anyone could do it, Vargo replied through gritted teeth. Stars, this thing's a fucking slug. Now I know why the Neats left it behind when they took their fleece to Albany. Rika told herself that Fred and Gemma would be fine. They had to be. Then she glanced at Vargo and gave him a reassuring smile. She's your new girl, Vargo. You should be nice to her. My what? Vargo glanced up, eyes wide, then stroked the console. Oh, hell yeah. I have a cruiser now. Come on, sweet thing. You know you want to do a good job for daddy. Mad Dog and his team are away, Lieutenant Chris reported in the command net. He estimates they can be back with antimatter in 15 mics max. That fast enough? Rika asked Vargo. Barely. Make sure they dock at Bay 17, Lieutenant, and get runners ready to get those bottles to the AP chamber. What about our dropships? Chase asked as he walked onto the bridge, giving Rika a quick embrace before turning to gaze at the holo tank. Been following along? Rika asked. Yeah, Nikki gave me an audio feed from the bridge. I didn't have any good ideas till now, so I wasn't chiming in. What about the dropships? Vargo asked, glancing at Chase. You think they can get in there in time? Can they? Rika asked at the same time Chase said. You tell me, Captain. I'm just a ground pounder. Can't hurt, Vargo replied. But with those fighters, it could be a suicide run. Put me on the pinnace with another pilot. Ferris jumped into the conversation. I can remote pilot the dropships and take out any rocks that get through. Can you move? Rika asked. I'm patched up. Just can't have any celebratory drinks when we're done but I don't need my gut to shoot down rocks, just my brain. Rika gave the necessary orders and then updated Lieutenant Saris with the multiple plans they had in play to help take out the rocks. Roger, Saris sent back, sounding harried. These damn fighters are tearing us to shreds. I'm going to pull back toward a nearby shipyard, see if I can draw this batch away with me. Understood, Rika replied. Rika, Nikki cried out triumphantly. I managed to raise Fred. His team is trying to reach Allison, but they're running into heavy opposition on the surface. Looks like the Neats have put bounties on the mechs, and every thug on the planet is gunning for them. Oh, for shit's sake, Rika swore, clenching her teeth as she looked up, wishing the overhead could give her some sort of answer. Go, Chase said, placing a hand on her shoulder. Get down there and save our team. It's what we came here for. You sure? Rika asked. You got things up here? Me? Chase laughed. I'm just emotional support for Vargo. Look at that guy, he's sweating bullets. I'm a mech now, I don't sweat, Vargo replied. So what is that, drool? Chase chuckled. Shut up, Captain. Nikki, I need a ship that can get us down to the planet yesterday. If Ferris takes our pinnace and the dropships, what's left on this tub? This tub you're besmirching is my girl, Vargo called out as Rika gave Chase a quick kiss and pulled her helmet back on. You're in luck. Looks like Alina has a rather nice pinnace that she keeps for herself, a Genevian Starskipper 192. Must be a spoil of war she picked up somewhere. It's just two decks down. Rika, Chase called out from behind her, and she turned to see him standing at the bridge's entrance. What? You're taking backup, right? Rika realized she'd been planning to drop to the planet alone. Stars, he knows me too well. Of course, I'm taking Kelly's team. Right, he winked. Bring them home, all of them. She nodded and then turned and ran to the lifts. Bringing the pain. Stellar date 12.23.8949, adjusted years. Location, Kuza District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. The Star Skipper 192 streaked through Malta's stratosphere, coming down over the Alboran Sea to Cerulean's east. Given the missiles that had chased the ISF pinnace over the Pyrenees Mountains, they decided not to come in over the continent. She knew the ocean wasn't necessarily any better. The waters could hide all sorts of fun surprises. But it was faster, and she also hoped that a civilian pinnace was less likely to be fired on than an ISF craft. 
Of course, she knew that hope was not a plan, and the moment they were subsonic, she dropped as low as possible, flying just a few meters above the cresting waves. Ahead, the four towers of Cerulean began to rise over the horizon, and she remembered the multiple training sims they'd run on the trip to Iberia, preparing to take the city. One thing they'd never trained for was hitting it with just four mechs. Rika's original plan had been to only take Kelly and Kelly, but Shoshin had informed her that he'd climb onto the back of the pinnace and ride it down if she thought he'd be left behind while his girls went into battle without him. You're not doing a harem thing with him, are you? Rika had asked Kelly when they'd begun the drop. With Shoshin? Rika, even with the Mark IV mods, he didn't get a face. He's still all mech down below, too. So you'd consider it if he had? Rika pressed. Stars, no. Shoshin thinks of himself like our dad. When he says, my girls, he's being all fatherly and protective. So far as he's concerned, we're his celibate little angels. Ah, Rika had replied, feeling a lot better about the situation. So I shouldn't tell him about how you used to be a prostitute? I'm regretting ever telling you about that. It was a dark time, you know. I have bad feelings about it. Rika wondered if that was true. Back in the war, Kelly had worn her sordid past as a badge of honor, but now she seemed ashamed of it. She gave Kelly an apologetic nod and pushed the recollection from her mind, focusing on keeping the ship as low as possible as they approached land. Any word from our team? She asked Nikki. Not after the last update I shared, but the city is a total mess. It hit the feeds that the Maltese Falcon is projected to crash into the city when it comes down and people are pouring out of the place any which way they can. The civilian feeds have picked up on our attempts up top to stop the incoming rocks, but no one's taking any chances. Rika shook her head in remorse. The people of Iberia had already watched the Falcon sister stations fall in years past. Cerulean was their largest population and the remaining jewel of the system. The one city that had survived the war mostly intact. Now they faced losing it too. While she sometimes worried that maybe liberating Genevia from the Nietzscheans wasn't worth it, Rika reminded herself that there was no scenario where living under the rule of an empire that kept weapons in orbit, whose sole purpose was to kill the civilian population, was better than the losses incurred in the struggle for freedom. I just hope they all see it that way when this is over. Her thoughts were interrupted by landfall. The last known location of Fred's team was in the Kuza district on the city's west side, and Rika banked the pinnace around the Gibraltar highlands, and then kept close to the Italis River. Ahead, Kuza was shrouded in smoke. The poorest district of Cerulean, it was likely filled with looters and roving gangs, grabbing what they could before leaving the city. The last message they'd received from Fred's team put the stranded marauders in the southern end of the district trapped in an underground maglev station on Cartagena Avenue. They'd come into the city on the maglev lines, but every time they'd tried to come out onto the surface, swarms of gangs and mercs had driven them back down. As much as Rika wanted to strafe the street with beam fire and simply set down over the station, she knew that a pinnace landing in Kuza right about now would look like a gift from the gods, and it would be swarmed in seconds. Circling the area, she spotted a 10-story building a few blocks away on Avonlea Boulevard that had an old landing pad on its roof. She settled the ship atop the semi-stable structure. Once she was certain they weren't about to fall through the roof, she turned to her team. Shoshin, I need you to stay with the pinnace. Worst case scenario, this city is a crater in just under an hour. We need to be sure that our ride out is still here. She could see the mech tense, as if he was going to fight her over the order, but then he nodded understood. Kelly and Kelly both placed an arm on Shoshin's helmet, and he grasped both their shoulders. Good luck. The women nodded and exited the cockpit, followed by Rika. Behind them, the AM-4 moved into the pilot seat, activating the ship's ground defense systems. Once outside the ship, the three SMI-4 mechs activated their stealth systems and leaped from the top of the building to the roof of the next structure, a dozen meters below. They worked their way across several rooftops in that fashion until they reached Cartagena Avenue. They crouched at the edge of a four-story building, overlooking the wide street and the pair of entrances to the underground maglev on the far side. 
the entrance on the left, 60 meters down the road, was guarded by a group of hulking toughs that Rika's perusal of the public feeds had identified as the callers. They'd set up CFT barriers at the exit and had a rather impressive crew-served railgun set up to boot. I think that thing's from a Nietzschean heavy APC, Rika noted. Fires five gram rounds, if memory serves. Yeah, two clicks a second. No dodging that thing at this range, Kelly noted. But those weird black and yellow women have some mean-ass chain guns over at the other entrance, too. I'm going to see if I can get some drones close enough to establish comms with the folks down below, Rika said. You two stay up here, pick your targets. When I say go, take out those heavy weapons and then their operators. Fish in a barrel, boss lady, Kelly replied. Rika touched each woman on the shoulder, one with a hand, one with a GNR's barrel. Stay safe. We all come out alive. You too, Colonel, Kelly replied. You're the one that's always running into the maw of death. Rika shrugged, even though they couldn't see it with her stealth gear active. I like it there. Feels like home. I know what you mean, both Kellys replied at once. Upon reaching the rear of the building, Rika dropped over the edge, landing as lightly as possible in the rear alley. To her surprise, a large man, who was wearing good enough armor that she'd picked up no heat from his body, detached from the shadows under an awning. She held perfectly still, watching as he looked around for the source of the sound, hoping he wouldn't see the divots her feet had made in the pavement upon impact. She recognized a red band on his right arm that matched the collars out front and determined to kill him instantly and quietly so that no alarm could be sent out. He advanced toward her, and Rika carefully lifted her right leg in the air, extending her foot's claws, she brought it up to the level of the man's head. At the same time, she slowly reached back and grasped the hilt of her light wand. His rifle was ten centimeters from her outstretched thigh when she brought her left foot down on his head while sinking her right foot's claws into the pavement, then twisting to the side as she drove her light wand into his chest. His helmet crumpled, and the light wand pierced his heart at the same time. She hoped it would be enough to kill any sort of emergency transmitter he may have. She almost squeezed harder to completely crush his skull, but remembered that stealth gear didn't work as well with brains on it, and instead let him fall and then sliced his head in half. The unexpected guard taken care of, she crept down the alley toward the western maglev entrance, which was guarded by the black-skinned women. She figured that the meager protection their peculiar skin likely offered made them easier targets than the group of callers at the other end. As she approached, she overheard a pair of the women at the rear of the group speaking in low tones. If we don't get them in the next half hour, I'm leaving, the first one said. I don't care what Yaka says. When that station comes down, that's it. This place is done. I'm not arguing, the second replied, nodding her head emphatically. No bounty is worth that kind of risk. You have a way to leave Cerulean? The maglevs out of town are packed. The first woman tapped a foot on the ground. Yeah, but not out of Kuza. They shut the tracks down last night when shit went sideways on the Falcon. Word is that there are cars stopped down there waiting. We get one, then get out to Kapara. Kapara, hell no. That's where those nukes went off just a few hours ago. That seems like the wrong way to go. I heard Hannah say that Yak has a penis in Cartagena, though. Why not go there? You think he'll let us on? Besides, how are we going to get to Cartagena that fast? If he hasn't already buggered out of here. Look, none of the maglevs are going out toward Kapara. All we have to do is get a car and switch the tracks. It's simple and guaranteed. The second woman's yellow lips split into a grin, revealing bright yellow teeth and a black tongue. Okay, I'll admit that's more of a sure bet. Even if we don't go all the way to Kapara, we'll at least get far enough from the Falcon when it falls. These two aren't so good at orbital mechanics, Nikki commented. The Maltese Falcon is on an equatorial orbit, and Kapara is due west of here. I was thinking that too, Rika replied, as the two women continued to talk about other ways out of Cerulean. And even if most of the station hits this city, it's not coming down in one piece. Everything along the equator is going to get hit with debris. Still, a person could hop one of those maglevs and get to Alberton. Barcelona is further. I kind of like further. Rika stopped herself and shook her head. What am I saying? We're going to stop that from happening. 
Contingencies are nice. Rika looked over the hero girls in placement and noted that the two crew served chain guns were the extent of their heavy weaponry. She sent that information up to Kelly and Kelly, and then flushed a swarm of nanoprobes down the stairs, noting that the station was much nicer below than above. Would you look at that, she said to Nikki. There has to be at least 30 cops down here. They're all set up to cover that maglev car. I guess the bounty the neats have on mechs is pretty compelling. As they spoke, the nanoprobes worked their way across the platform and down onto the tracks, where Rika caught sight of Fred and Randy. She set a group of the probes on the side of the car and relayed a low bandwidth connection through them. So you guys taking a breather down there? Rika asked the moment she linked up to their combat net. Fred started and Randy nearly jumped upright. Shit, Colonel Rika? Fred asked. Crap on a stick, are we glad to hear your voice? Is the fleet here? On its way. I came ahead, but we've run into a few problems. Like the station about to come down on our heads? Randy asked. I kind of feel like we set all this in motion. Don't go there, Rika sent back, adding extra steel to her voice. It's the Neats who are trying to murder half a billion civilians. So why are all you holed up down here anyway? We're hunting for Allison, Fred replied. We know she was taken by one of Hero's people, a guy named Dell. Gemma tapped the local feeds and found a civvy's vid of him in a firefight with two guys near here. Well, one guy was fighting. The other guy was trying not to get shot. Anyway, Dell got away, and we were trying to find him when suddenly half the damn city came down on us. We're effing low on ammo, though. Gemma is down one end of the tunnel, trying to stealth her way past the cops that have it barricaded, while Jenison and Cora are going the other way. When they're ready, we're to provide a distraction here. Tell her the other part. Randy's voice carried a mixture of urgency and anger. Shit, yeah, almost forgot. That Dell guy was going after fucking Alice of all people. Those two guys saved her. Well, I think one wanted to, the other didn't. Either way, they left with the lieutenant colonel. Wow, small world, Rika muttered. Okay, well, as much as I'd gladly rip out Alice's spine if I see her, I'm not going to waste any time hunting her down. I have Kelly and Kelly up top, I also heard two of the hero girls talking on the street. Yaka Hero is in Cartagena now. He's getting ready to get out of here. And given that the Dell guy you saw works for Yaka, I'll bet he has Allison with him. Damn it. Fred shook his head. We're in the wrong damn district. Well, I have Shoshin on station with a pinnace, so we just have to dig you out and we can be on Yaka's doorstep in a few minutes. I have a question, though. Yeah? Randy asked. The cops... Are they with the callers and hero girls, or are they trapped by them? The two mechs glanced at one another and laughed. We have no idea, Fred said. I kind of think it's changed a few times in the last ten minutes. Figures, Rika muttered. Okay, signal the rest of the team to get on the combat net. I have a plan. Two minutes later, Cora and Genesa attacked the police barricade down the eastern side of the maglev tunnel, Immediately, some of the cops on the platform below tried to come up both exits, and while the callers allowed it, the hero girls fired down the stairs, yelling out something about the deal not being good enough. Thirty seconds later, Gemma attacked the barricades in the tunnels to the west, and the three groups of enemies fell to arguing about where to press their advantage. After a brief exchange of shouts between the cops and callers, both groups began to move back down the stairs, likely planning to flank their prey. Hit them, Rika ordered the two SMI-4s on the rooftop. A pair of DPUs streaked down from two separate rooftops, converging on the caller's railgun and blasting it to pieces. None of the enemies had been paying close attention to what was happening on the street level. And after a moment's consternation, one of the callers pointed at the hero girls 30 meters away, bellowed a challenge, then opened fire on them. The hero girls responded by swinging their chain guns up and opening fire on the callers. Three of the gang members and a cop that was handing over a wad of credits were mowed down in an instant. A moment later, weapons fire burst out of both staircases, hitting the callers and hero girls. Wow, now that's some self-destructive behavior, Nikki commented. You're up, Rika instructed Fred and Randy, who moved out from behind their maglev car and hit the cops from the rear. At that point, Kelly and Kelly began taking shots at both callers and hero girls, firing on anyone who seemed to be doing too well. They focused more on the callers, 
as the heavily armored brutes were giving the cops a run for their money. Then a pair of police emerged on the hero girl's side, and Rika blew them away before they could open fire on the last three black and yellow women who had just turned to flee. Rika let two of them go, but ran after the one who'd spoken of Yakahiro being in Cartagena. She caught up to the woman with little trouble and clamped her hand around the girl's neck, stopping her cold. Not so fast, my little friend, Rika whispered, still fully stealthed. You've signed up to be my guide. Behind her, Kelly and Kelly had switched to electron beams and were burning through the lightly armored cops spilling out of the underground platform with wild abandon. Okay, Fred called up when no more enemies were spilling out of the entrances. All five of us are here, coming up the hero side. Shoshin, we're ready for our ride. All Rika got in response was a grunt, which she translated as, I can't believe you made me sit that out. Eye on the prize. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Cartagena District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Allison had been presented with plenty of opportunities to escape Yaka Hero, but she'd not taken any yet, mostly because she still didn't have a good plan for getting to safety. So she'd played her part doing her best not to laugh at some of the expressions Phineas's face periodically made on the panometer. She'd gone along with Yaka when he abandoned his headquarters in Cusa and moved to his secondary location in Cartagena. They'd arrived two hours before at a small house on a quaint residential street situated in the western outskirts. Over that time, the frenzy over the Maltese Falcons' impending fall had reached a fever pitch as the populace watched the captured destroyer which everyone thought would blast the approaching asteroids away, get chased off by Nietzschean fighters. She had just decided to leave Yaka and Illumin to their fates, plus steal their hover car, when two things happened that stayed her hand. Allison was standing in the kitchen, near the doors to the house's main space, where Yaka and Illumin had set up their impromptu operations center, when she overheard them talking about Dell's latest report. Great, so he killed Lorne. Yaka muttered, but what about that woman he met with on the Falcon? Did Dell at least see her face? No, Illumin replied, sounding equally annoyed. I guess her back was to him. Jessa and Mel saw her, but they both got greased in no time by that fucker who made trouble for us a few months back. I told you we should have taken him out then. What? That weird, friendly guy's bodyguard? Yaka asked. Damn, I thought we'd established a truce with him. Yeah. I guess everything's out the window now. One of the girls caught sight of them helping the woman to an auto cab, but her face was against the guy's shoulder. Jakob, that's his name. Anyway, she couldn't get a visual. What about those other mechs? Yaka asked. The ones that people saw come in on a maglev from Kapara. You're not gonna like this, Illumin said in a quiet voice. The Neats have put a bounty on the mechs. Five million creds a pop, it's chaos out there. Fuck. Yaka's exclamation was accompanied by a loud thud, and Allison imagined that the man must have kicked something. Whoever goes after that bounty is an idiot. The Neats have all bailed, pulled off world. Who do they think is going to pay them? Not to mention that when the Falcon comes down and wipes out Cerulean, they'll have nowhere to spend it. Time to start thinking about an exit plan, Illumin replied. We have our pet mech. We pull in some of the girls the ones who can actually shoot straight, and we get off this rock. Malta's done, Iberia too. Yeah, you're right, Yaka said in resigned agreement. I'm going to get Dell to gather the hard currency and ready the pinnace. I'll send whatever girls are still on Kuza after those other mechs. Who knows, maybe they'll get lucky. Doubtful, Elumin said with a heartfelt sigh. Next time, let's establish the cult of personality around me and attract big burly types that we can mod up more practically. Hey, Yaka laughed. You're the one that came up with the black and yellow sexy girl thing. A snicker came from Illumin. <laughs> well, I suggested it. I didn't think they'd actually do it. It was cool, though, seeing all those people mod themselves just because we told them to. There's a few boys in your girls, too, you know. Well, they were boys. What can I say? Yaka replied, and Allison could just imagine the haughty look on the little weasel's face. I have a commanding presence. 
people want to please me. A moment later, he walked out of the main space and almost ran into Allison, who had just decided that waiting for Dell to arrive with Yaka's penis was now her best option. Damn it, what are you doing there? Yaka scowled up at her. Allison shrugged. Standing? Why don't you go outside and patrol, Kate? Turning to walk out the front door, Allison said, You want me out there when there's a five million credit bounty on my head? Seems a bit risky. Illumin called out from the other room. Wait, Allison, stay. Like I'm a fucking dog. Yeah, I guess don't do that, Yaka added lamely. Allison nodded and leaned against a wall. Somehow her new owners didn't realize that she could use the link whenever she wished. And now that Yaka had just given her a lead on the rest of her team, she connected and began searching the public feeds for any sign of them. Hurry up, Dell, she thought, clenching her jaw. Allison had every intention of putting him in a world of hurt. He'd rue the day he'd ever learned what an EMP was. Then she'd grab his penis and her team and get the hell off Malta. The Call Stellar Date 12.23.8949 Adjusted Years Location Torrent of Fire Approaching Malta Region Iberia System Old Genevia Nietzschean Empire Chase looked at the countdown. Just over 30 minutes until the asteroids hit the Maltese Falcon. The station administrators, those who remained, were working at shifting the massive station's orbit, but the Neats had apparently paid off some locals to initialize emergency fuel dumps, and the Falcon's maneuvering systems were offline. Though the station carried enough deuterium to fuel a thousand starships, those tanks were nowhere near its own thrusters, and the few remaining people who weren't panicking were utilizing drones to haul fuel around the station from tanks to engines. Two of the boosters had fired momentarily, but all the station administrators had managed to do was stabilize their orbit and gain a smidgen of the altitude they'd lost when the mass exodus shifted its orbit. Crazy that everyone fleeing the station in panic stands almost as good a chance of dropping the thing on the planet as the incoming rocks. Granted, if they had fuel, it wouldn't be a problem. Chase didn't have reports from the station itself, but the estimates that the Torrent of Fire's tactical NSAI came up with suggested that over 50 million people were still trapped on the Falcon. Rather than perseverate on the problem, he turned his attention to the people with the best chance of doing something about the mess. Ferris, how are things looking? He asked while flipping the main holo tank to show a close-up view of the pinnace and the remote-controlled nucleaden dropships that were approaching the deadly swarm of asteroids. Oh, you know, bleak. But Hallie here is a better pilot than I recall, so we're making good time. Gee, thanks, Ferris, Hallie retorted. Uh, sorry, Captain. Don't worry about it, Chase replied absently. Looks like Saris has managed to pull over 20 fighters away. She's already taken out six, but she's gotten scorched doing it. Yeah, I see that. Ferris's voice didn't sound as morose as his words. That's why I said it was bleak. We're still staring down 32 fighters around these 12 sizable rocks that are going to turn the station into slag. I have just eight dropships, and my best sims show that only four make it past the fighter shield. Five if we sacrifice ourselves, which won't work well, because then no one will be alive to guide our assault ships in. You going to be able to lend a hand? Hopefully, Chase said through gritted teeth. Mad Dog took longer to get the antimatter than we'd hoped. There was more damage to the Asura than originally anticipated. We're lighting up the AP drive now, but I don't know if we can get to you in time. It's going to be tight. Tell Mad Dog that he's a slacker, Ferris sent back. Hallie and I will do the best we can. Keep us updated. You got it. Ferris closed the connection to Chase and returned his focus to the eight dropships he was controlling. The Marauder's craft were fully capable of being flown remotely, but even on the best day, they moved like a pig in heat getting friendly with a football. Sitting in them and feeling the thing under you was one thing. You could use all your senses to tell what was happening, react, compensate, and see if the reaction was enough in a split second. Slouched in his seat in the pinnace's cockpit 20,000 kilometers away, all he could do was hope that he could get his craft close enough while ignoring the pain in his side that was partially caused by the round he'd taken and partially by the artificial liver the medics had quickly stuffed inside of him, while complaining that he was nuts and needed to get back in the auto dock. You doing all right, Ferris? Hallie asked. 
You look mighty pale. Yeah, that's just fear and worry, he replied. You know, just a few hundred million lives hanging on us, no biggie. She handed him a juice packet. Well, drink this. We're not gonna be able to save the world if you pass out. Thanks. He took the packet and tore the corner off with his teeth before pouring it down his throat. Once empty, he stuffed it into a waste pouch and returned his focus to the eight ships he managed. The cockpit disappeared from around him, and his vision filled with the twelve rocks hurtling toward the station and the screen of thirty-two fighters protecting them. Three of the rocks were two kilometers across, and the rest were between four hundred and five hundred meters. One of the big daddies was up front, and the other two were in the back. Overall, the hurtling chunks of impending death were spread out over several hundred kilometers. But Hallie was vectoring the pinnace to swoop over the first rock, and then come around to hit the rear ones. The plan was to use speed as their ally, along with the tactical missiles the pinnace still carried. They weren't enough to do much more than dent the asteroids, but should Allie score hits on the fighters, they'd take the Nietzschean birds out. Of course, the pinnace only had 12 missiles. Theris ran the Sims again and again, finding that at best, they'd take out eight of the fighters and then get a clear shot at the leading rock with two of his tack nuke carrying dropships. Sims showed he'd need two hitting the leeward side to shift the mass enough to swing it harmlessly past the station. But if he saved his force for the other two big daddies in the rear, the fighters would take out all his ships before they got there. His best bet was to take out as many of the leading rocks as he could and pray that Cirrus would get the event horizon back into the fight in time to finish off the last of the rocks in the swarm. As he closed down the simulations and looked out at the near space around the Maltese Falcon, he was disgusted by the civilian ships and local police patrol craft, for that matter, who were fleeing for their lives. Something snapped in Ferris at that moment, and he reached out, flipping the comm system to a wide field broadcast. He took a deep breath to speak and Hallie gave him a questioning look, but he paid it no heed. This is Ferris the Ferryman, calling all true Genevians in Malta's near space, though I wonder if there are any true Genevians out there. But on the off chance that any of you sons of bitches remember what it was like to be a free people— a people who stood up against the sort of bullshit these fucking neats are pulling, then I could really use your help. Hallie and I are here, putting our lives on the line to save the Falcon. We can take out a few of these rocks, but not with those fighters bearing down on us. The way things look, we're gonna die out here trying to save your station, while you motherfucking cowards run away with your tails between your legs. So I'm sending this message to see if anyone out there still has a spine. Or if you all like the taste of Nietzsche and assholes so much that you're okay with running and not helping your own people. Like I said, Hallie and I might die out here, but we're gonna die giving the Nietzsche what they fucking have coming. He flipped off the wide broadcast and clenched his teeth from the pain flaring in his side. Hallie reached out and touched his arm, and he glanced at her to see a tear tracing its way down her cheek. That was beautiful, Ferris. As far as Ferris was concerned, he'd just made a fool of himself. He shook his head before turning back to the forward display. Put your helmet on, Hallie. Let's just kill some fucking neats. She nodded silently and grabbed her helmet, only to pause with it over her head. Look! She stabbed a finger toward the forward display, and Ferris saw a tug boosting away from the Maltese Falcon. It was heading for the big daddy at the front of the incoming rocks, not a way to safety. A moment later, two other tugs joined it. A message came in from the lead tug. Ferris the ferryman, this is Margo. I have Billy and Tom with me. We can shove that first rock if you can take on the fighters. I got no love for Nietzscheans, and it's about time we did something about it. Then another voice came over the channel. I can't do much about rocks, but I've got the beams that like the taste of Nietzschean asshole. About time I gave him a meal. Ferris saw that the new message came from one of the police patrolled cruisers that had been shepherding ships that were fleeing the Falcon. Over the next five minutes, another police patrol boat and two freighters signed on, moving to bracket the tugs that were boosting toward the first rock. Is this all we have? Hallie gave Ferris a wide-eyed stare. No one else is willing to stand up? Ferris wanted to curse the cowards that continued to run from the incoming swarm, but he bit his lip and nodded. They don't know what hope looks like anymore, Hallie. Let's show them. 
Message in a Bottle. Stellar Date 12.23.8949. Adjusted Years. Location, Cusa District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Any updates from upstairs? Rika asked as she settled into the cockpit next to Shoshin. No, he replied with a shake of his head. All the relays are jammed, and the torrent of fire is on the far side of Malta. Not that I think we could get line of sight right now anyway. There's a lot of ionization in the upper atmosphere from the nuke and antimatter detonation. I figured, Rika muttered, the public feeds are full of people who have spotted it, but they're all saying it's not coming fast enough to take out those incoming asteroids. Yeah. Rika turned to see Cor and Gemma entering the cockpit and settling into the rear seats. What's in the case? She asked the AM-4. Cor glanced at Gemma. The lieutenant's diary, it's very special to her. Rika wondered why Cor was so sour about whatever he'd been saddled with and glanced at the ISF lieutenant. Gemma? It's a QC blade. She replied quietly, as though infiltrators were about to crawl out from under the seats and steal the tech. The one from the penis. We grabbed it before we blew the ship. Seriously? Rika exclaimed as she rose from her seat. We can call the fleet, get help. Oh, hell yeah, Nikki added. Mams, I don't think I follow, Gemma said. What kind of help? We rode an FTL corridor down to within just one AU of Malta, Rika explained. We can use the QC blade to get them to send help down that corridor. Shoshin glanced back at Rika as he lifted the pinnace into the air. The Asura barely made it, ma'am, and those things. Things? You encountered the Exdali? Gemma pulled off her helmet, revealing wide eyes and a wider mouth. And you lived? Did any get out? We made it, just barely, Rika replied, not wanting to discuss it further. Colonel Rika, please. Gemma looked like she might be on the verge of real fear, something Rika had never seen in the woman. Did any get out? No, she shook her head. Not that we saw. Vargo did a negative graviton pulse to push them away, and then we transitioned out. You're sure? Well, they were eating the ship and us, and then they were gone, so we probably didn't bring any. I think we'd know, right? Gemma blew out a long breath as she nodded. Yeah, I guess so. They wouldn't have just buggered off if you brought one through. It would have kept on snacking. So what the hell are they? Shoshin asked. Rika felt a knot in the pit of her stomach and swore that she'd come clean with her people when this was over. Her initial omission had turned into a lie that was sure to blow up in her face before long. While Rika struggled with the trouble her omission had caused, Gemma shrugged as she replied to Shoshin. Things that live in the dark lair. You only find them within a few AU of a star. I know of two times they've gotten out. Once was at New Canaan. We opened a rift and let them into normal space to devour an Orion fleet. Holy shit, Shoshin whispered. And it worked? Yeah, Gemma nodded. We got them tucked away again, but it wasn't easy. The other time was in the transcend. They didn't manage to stuff them back in, so now there's an interdicted region of space where the Exdali are expanding, just feeding on everything. It's growing slowly, but... Stars, I really don't want to think of that right now, Rika said. I mean, really, really don't. So why are you suggesting subjecting the rest of your fleet to them, Colonel? Gemma asked. The Asura was trashed, and we blew our missile load on the torrent of fire, Rika explained. We're flinging everything we have at those rocks that are headed to the Falcon. But if we could get a half dozen relativistic missiles, the problem is solved. And I take it they're in short supply, Kor asked. Yeah, the Event Horizon doesn't have a single one aboard, and neither does the torrent of fire. These two ships haven't seen resupply in months, and before that, they were stripped down for the fleet that hit Albany. Holy shit, Cor exclaimed, his eyes lighting up. You want to get our fleet to send a few REMs into the dark layer, and then have them come out and take out the rocks? Rika nodded. Precisely. But they're still, what, 30 AU out? Gemma asked. That's four and a half hours at the speed of light. How will you message them? Rika gestured at the case Cor held. With that... I can get them the message in seconds. They can get the missiles into the DL, and five minutes later, kaboom. There's just one problem, Cor said meekly and lifted the case to reveal a hole three quarters of the way down. 
your ace in the hole took a hit. Open it, Nikki demanded and Kor complied, revealing the QC blade with its control system on one end and the rubidium containment section on the other. Damn, Gemma muttered. The control systems are shot. Doesn't matter, Nikki said. Kor, go pull off the panel for the comm rack at the back of the cockpit. We have to get this thing powered up. It's useless without the control system, Gemma said, her eyes narrowing. What are you trying to do with it? Rika tapped her head. I have control systems in here, just no paired atoms. Holy crap, the ISF lieutenant said as she rose. Let me give you a hand, Core. I just got a QC relay from Carden, Chief Ona said, twisting in her seat as she turned to look at Heather. It has Rika's signature, which is odd, because it's tagged as coming over Colonel Borden's blade. What's the message, Chief? Heather asked, finding the provenance to be strange as well, but wanting the meat of the matter. There's a big mess of data. I think she burned out the blade sending this much at once. Okay, she left some bits for Cardin to fill in, and they're sending it now. As Ona began to assemble the data, Heather's mouth dropped open. More from the newfound knowledge of the existence of living creatures in the dark layer than the fact that the Neats were pulling an asshole move, like blowing up a station in retaliation for effectively losing a system. Just then, Potter rushed onto the bridge in her new AI frame. I just pulled the updates and stumbled my way up here, she said with a rueful expression on her new body's alabaster face. Heather gave Potter a quick smile. And here you thought you'd have a quiet day to get used to a body. Somehow I feel like I triggered this. Potter's tone was exceedingly morose and she stopped herself. Damn, emoting with a body is weird, going to take some getting used to. Worry about that later, Heather replied, turning back to the holo tank. So Rika sent us this burst. In 24 minutes, those rocks will hit the station. She wants us to use the dark layer tunnel, provided it's not swarming with those things, and send in missiles to swat those rocks. Right, so we need to take our M's. Potter said. Take? Heather latched onto the word. Don't you mean send? Potter shook her head. I've run the numbers and sent them by Piper, and he agrees with my findings. Ships have maneuvering grav drives. They can push off dark matter in any direction. RMs only have fusion and AP engines, which means they can't maneuver in the dark layer. Fuck, Heather swore. Of course, someone has to go in there with the RMs. Potter shook her head vehemently. Not someone, me. It needs to be an AI, and I'm the one that can get there fastest. Launch the RMs, put them in cluster off the bow. I'll grab them with a pinnace's grab field and do what's needed. Heather was about to object, but Potter had already run off the bridge. I'm taking your favorite pinnace too, Heather. Potter sent up, sorry. Don't be sorry, Potter. You're going to survive this. You dump out the minute you see those things closing on you. Don't try to tango with them. Huh, Potter replied. Now that I have a body, I could tango. Heather put a hand to her forehead, doing her best not to groan. Then she looked at Chief Garth, who was sitting open-mouthed, staring after Potter. You got cotton between your ears, Garth? Get the RMs and the tubes yesterday. We only have 24 minutes till the asteroids hit that station. Potter wasn't sure if it was the lack of adjustment to the physical body she was using, which seemed more real to her than she thought it would, or just the gravity of what she was about to attempt. But she was quivering slightly as she slid into the pilot seat. Damn you intrepid people in your belief in hyperrealism, she muttered and sat back in the seat, pulling the harness down and then gripping the armrests. The pinnace was already warmed up and spinning on the cradle to face the open bay doors as she reached out into the navigation systems. While the idea of flying the ship using the consoles was interesting, she wasn't about to try that for the first time on such an important mission. Instead, she closed her eyes and reduced her awareness of her body to the bare minimum, shifting her senses to the ship's sensors and engines. The pinnace was her body, and she was speed. RMs are launched, Heather called down. Be safe, Potter. I'm always safe, actually. Never mind. I've spent the last few years strapped to the back of a mercenary in combat. This is the safest I've been in some time. The flight status showed green, and she hit the command for the rails to accelerate the ship out of the bay. Potter banked the pinnace around the Fury Lands, boosting to meet the RMs that were holding steady in front of the massive vessel. 
The pinnace was on the larger side, just under a hundred meters in length and thirty wide, fifty with the atmospheric fins extended. She supposed that when the mothership was four kilometers long, a hundred meter craft was a pinnace in comparison. She slowed as she came over the ten RMs and extended her ship's grav field, pulling them in close to the hull, hoping that the positive graviton field wouldn't be enough to attract the ex dolly once she transitioned. Potter, Heather called down as she began her burn to move away from the Fury Lance before shifting to the dark layer. What? She replied, worried that it was some new concern. I just got a message directly from the Allied Field Marshal. She sent along a data packet, your eyes only. Uh, okay, Potter replied, wondering what in the stars Tannis Richards would have to say to her. She unfolded the data before transitioning. If she'd been fully connected to her physical body, her jaw would have dropped. Shit, they know how to control the ex dolly. The message came with a strong admonition to only use the specific graviton waveforms to repulse the Exdali, not to attract. If they were to get out, it would take a whole fleet running the repulsion patterns to push the things back into the dark layer. Not like I'd ever want to attract those things. Potter checked over the ship's status one last time and transitioned into the dark layer. Once the stars had disappeared, she checked that the RMs were still safely tucked against the belly of the pinnace and activated the repulsion patterns in the grav systems. Okay, she muttered aloud, having momentarily forgotten she had a body. Now I just need to worry about what I used to fear in the dark layer, running into invisible stationary dark matter. The Find, Stellar Date 12.23.8949, Adjusted Years, Location, The Moon, Malta, Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Borden leant around a corner and fired on the first thing he saw, which turned out to be the back of a Nietzschean soldier who was fleeing down the large tunnel deep within the moon. Damn, bad form, that. He signaled for Daphne to advance while he covered the dark shaft. Once she'd taken up a position behind a support column, Callie and Kev moved up to another. Borden followed, and the team leapfrogged their way down the passage, inexorably closing on their target, which he hoped was what they thought it would be. After securing and disabling the base's rail guns, he and Gemma's team had sat tight, waiting for the pinnace to come back and get them, until Saris had relayed the scan data that showed a nuclear blast followed by an antimatter one. He wasn't going to count Gemma and the mechs out, but it meant that he and the Marines on the moon were on their own. Rel had poured through the databases, finding that the base had passed through a lot of hands over the centuries, and the Neats only used the upper few levels. It seemed that once, Iberia had been an important and wealthy system, and this had been one of its primary military outposts, which was nothing more than intellectual stimulation, until Rel had found mention of something called a star crusher deep within the bowels of the base. And so they left the command center, after blowing the controlled systems for the rail guns, and had been fighting their way through the Nietzschean installation on the moon ever since. They'd long ago expended all their ammunition, scavenged for new weapons, and run some of those through all the rounds they could find. They were now down to the rifles they'd pulled off the most recent group of Nietzsche they'd killed. Each of the Marines had half a dozen weapons hanging from their shoulders and jammed into mounts on their backs, just in case they found magazines that fit one or another. If one thing had become clear, it was that Iberia was the dumping ground for leftovers no one else wanted. The same was true for the soldiers they'd encountered. While Borden had to give credit where credit was due, in that they'd encountered a few squads who had stood their ground, just as many had run off when the four Marines arrived, pouring weapons fire into their foes and executing clean, well-orchestrated tactics. While he appreciated the mech's way of fighting, one where they simply brought overwhelming force to bear in every situation, the ISF Marines had a long history of careful, yet effective tactics, born of their roots in the Terran Space Force's Marines. Borden himself had trained in the Congo on Earth, sweating out his days in boot under an unrelenting sun, learning how to make the most of every situation, especially when you were dealt a shitty hand, which seemed to be the rule, not the exception when serving as a Marine. Their current situation was a prime example. Nano clouds depleted, armor hot and scored and incapable of stealth, 
troops scavenging for weapons and moving toward a destination that may or may not contain what they hoped it did. Join a colony mission, Borden thought with a laugh. Leave all the shit behind. He liked to joke that serving in the ISF was the last thing he'd hoped to do after getting a berth on the GSS Intrepid, but if someone had asked him to be honest, he would have told them that he loved it. At first, he'd worried that his current assignment with the Marauders would see he and his team lost in the ass end of space, which was pretty much their current situation. But he had to admit that he was rather enjoying gallivanting across space with the mechs. On top of that, the Nietzscheans were a foul people, whose winner-take-all mentality had suffused every aspect of their society. The problem was, their society didn't aid that many in becoming winners. A part of him felt a modicum of guilt for mowing down so many of the poor saps that had been sent to this outpost. But if they picked up a rifle and aimed it at him, there was no debate. When push came to shove, that was the only rule that mattered in war, after having your team's back, of course. Next left, Rel announced to the team. If this damn map is right, which it's not been so good at, Kev added. You got a better one? Sergeant Daphne growled. Callie chuckled as she eased around a support beam and nodded that the coast was clear. Kev's just hangry. Need to get that boy a cheeseburger. Oh, stars, Kev moaned. I'd kill for a cheeseburger. You've killed a hundred Nietzscheans today. Has it helped? Daphne asked. No, and I've checked them all for coupons, too. What the heck is a coup? Oh, crap. What is that? Callie asked, flagging something coming up from behind the group. Borden cycled his vision inside. <sighs> Looks like some sort of tunnel cutting machine. 200 meters back. Kev, since you want cheeseburgers so bad, you go take it out. Me? Daphne has the only burn sticks left. Daphne pulled the satchel off her shoulder and tossed it across the tunnel to Kev. Congratulations. Now you have the only burn sticks left. Damn it, Kev muttered as he grabbed the satchel and pulled a pair of burn sticks out, moving back down the tunnel. As he advanced to the rear, a hail of bullets flew through the air, nearly striking the Marine before he reached the next column. Borden signaled Callie to hold her position at the fore, while he and Daphne laid down suppressive fire for Kev. Tossing on three, two, one, the Marine called out and Daphne ceased firing from her side as Kev whipped the two burn sticks in a straight line down the tunnel. Round streaked out from behind the boring machine, striking one of the burn sticks and knocking it into a wall. But the other made it through defensive fire and landed atop the machine, its thermite core igniting and burning their way into what Borden hoped was something important. It turned out to be their lucky day as the machine ground to a halt and the neat didn't advance beyond its cover. Hey! Callie called back to the group. The entrance to the chamber is right here. Daphne, Kev, cover the entrance, Borden ordered. Callie and I are going in. You'll let me know if there are cheeseburgers, right, Colonel? Shut up, Kev, Daphne ordered. Okay, Sarge, if you hear anything else, it's just my stomach growling. Stray shots were still coming from the stalled-out tunneling machine, and Borden waited for a lull in the fire before rushing across the passage and moving down to the doorway Callie had pointed out. She stood before it, covering his approach, and nodded back at it. Do you think it's in there? I don't have any special knowledge you don't, Borden growled as he stared up at the large steel doors. The data says it's in there, but there's only one way to find out. There's an access pad on the left door. Rel highlighted it on their HUDs. Under a century's grime. Borden placed his last hackett over the kit. The device set to work, and 15 seconds later, A dull groan filled the stale air as the doors began to retract into the wall. Once they had split apart far enough for him to pass, he slipped inside and gazed up at the find as the interior lights began to activate. Oh yeah, she's here and she's beautiful. Towering a hundred meters over Borden was one of the strangest contraptions he'd ever seen. He could tell that the designers of the Genevian behemoths must have drawn their inspiration from this thing, which proudly bore the name Star Crusher on its side. It had a long central body like a behemoth, with a huge railgun on its back. But rather than four squat walker legs, the Star Crusher had six articulated insect-like legs. All of that made it look like some sort of crazy bug, but a bug with 12 very large missile pods on its back. Callie whistled as she moved inside the chamber. 
That's no cheeseburger, but it'll have to do. I'm heading up to the cockpit, Borden said. We'll find out if this thing still has some sting left in it. You look for the controls to open the bay doors above. You got it, Colonel, Callie replied, then paused to gaze up at the Star Crusher. So when all this is over, do you think we can keep it? If I have to strap it to the back of the Furulance myself. Collision. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Kusa District, Cerulean, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Allison heard a lumen calling out to Dell, confirming his arrival a minute before the pinnace sat down in the middle of the street in front of the house. Without another thought for Yaka and Illumin, she strode out of the house and watched the pinnace come down. If she hadn't been so intent on killing Dell for EMPing her up on the station, she would have been impressed at how skillfully he set the craft down between the large trees that lined the road. Granted, the pinnace was small, only 40 meters long, squat and ugly. The ramp began to descend, and Allison strode down the walk toward it, wishing she had ammunition for something other than her electron beam so she could shoot his legs out the moment he appeared on the ramp. Waiting for Dell, the tall, dark-haired, cocksure bastard that he was, to clear the ship was taking all her self-control at the moment. He was almost past the aerofin on the pinnace's tail when Yako called out from behind her, Allison, what the hell are you doing out here? She turned toward Yaka, ready to take the two quick steps required to drive a fist through his face, but Dell called out from behind her. Yaka, an informant caught sight of Jakob and the woman. She's only two kilometers from here, down on Maida Street. Do we have an ID on her yet? Yaka called out, anger and excitement tinging his voice. My guy saw her face, but didn't make an ID. Sending you her picture. Allison had stepped back as Yaka blithely walked past, so she got an up-close view of his face losing all color as Dell sent him what she assumed must be Alice's image. His steps faltered and he stumbled, reaching out and placing a hand on her arm to steady himself. The fuck, he whispered. No, she's dead. The Neats killed her years ago. Who is she to you? Allison asked, gazing down at Yaka, who suddenly seemed to realize he was leaning up against the deadliest person he'd ever encountered. She's, she's my mother. Damn, Allison shook her head. If I'd made a bet, it would have been on sister, but that was mostly to do with the fact that I can't actually picture Alice in the throes of passion. Yaka spun on her. You lied. You know what she looked like all along. Allison shrugged. Yeah, I just wanted to make you squirm a bit. As much as I'd like to put a bullet in Alice's head, I figured that if you knew who she was, you'd stay till the last minute, searching her out and, well, I want your ship over there. She finished the statement by gesturing with her GNR, pointing it right at Dell. She was about to fire when she decided that she really would like to know where Alice was and then get her hands on the woman. There were still 20 minutes before the station would be hit, and then roughly another 10 until it came down. Damn it, I've never stalled so much in my life. But the discipline, Yaka muttered as he stared up at her. How? It doesn't work on us anymore. The chip port is just a placebo so that folks like you will think you have us under control. Now, Dell, hold it right there, Illumin said from the house's doorway. Her golden lips set in a thin line as she leveled a large caliber rifle at Allison. It would be enough to smart, but Allison was certain the flow armor covering her skin could hold up to a few shots from the weapon. Or I could take door number two. She reached out and grabbed Yaka by the neck, lifting him into the air while he squirmed and grasped her arm to relieve the pressure on his throat. You were saying, Illumin? Fuck, the red-skinned woman whispered. Please don't hurt him. That's right, Dell shouted from next to the pinnace, hands hovering over his pistols, eyes fixed on Allison's DNR, which was still pointed at him. You kill Yaka, you have no leverage over either of us. Well, Allison shrugged, other than your lives. Illumin set her rifle down, then kicked it away. Okay, look, just let us go, we won't come after you. 
Allison found herself far more conflicted than she'd expected to be. When planning out her escape, she'd intended to kill all three of these people without any hesitation, probably with a healthy dose of extreme prejudice to boot. Now she was considering letting some of them live. Where's Alice? She asked Dell. Address on Mida Street. Building 4314, Suite 22. Something in Dell's voice caused her to peer into his eyes, where she saw a deep, simmering rage. She realized that this was the sort of man who never hesitated to kill and would hunt her down years later if he lived. Like I need that. Her electron beam lanced out, drawing a straight blue line from the barrel of her GNR to Dell's head. A second later, the man's corpse fell to the ground, and Allison strode to a lumen's discarded rifle and stomped on it while the woman let out a series of small shrieks, backpedaling and tripping over the doorway's threshold. Allison didn't pay her any heed and walked to the pinnace, still holding Yaka aloft by his neck. She strode up the ramp, only glancing at the headless body as she passed it by. At the top of the ramp, she reached for the control, only to hear a lumen wailing for her to stop. A moment later, the woman fell on her knees at the base of the ramp, golden eyes wide with fear. Please take me too, please, I don't want to die here. Oh, for star's sakes, Allison muttered. Up, in the cockpit. She stepped aside and a lumen ran past, giving Yaka, whose face was turning beet red, a terrified look. Allison followed her to the cockpit and then let go of Yaka. I assume you can fly? He looked up at her, tried to squeak out a word, and then nodded mutely and climbed unsteadily into the pilot seat. Then let's go, Allison said clamping her feet to the deck plate while a lumen sobbed softly as she pulled on her harness. Once it was in place, Allison reached down and placed a hand on the woman's neck, delivering a dose of her now replenished nano into the woman's body and rendering her unconscious. Thanks, stars, finally some peace and quiet, Allison said with a smile. We're close, Colonel Rika, Shoshin said as the pinnace streaked over Cartagena. Rika glanced at the hero girl, whose name turned out to be Hana, and the woman nodded meekly. Almost there. Wait, what's that? Kelly pointed at the window as a pinnace rose into the air a kilometer away. That's gotta be them, Fred exclaimed. Look, that's the hero logo on the nose. It was supposed to wait for us, Hana squeaked. The bastard didn't even call out to check. Rika directed a cold glare at the woman, and her mouth clamped shut. Shoshin didn't need to be told to follow the other ship, and banked the pinnace sharply, turning toward the other craft, which flew a short distance and then disappeared behind a long row of apartment buildings. Rika rushed to the ramp to see Genesa and Kor already lowering it. The moment Shoshin had the ship over the street, the three jumped out and hit the pavement next to Yaka's pinnace, only to witness a perplexing tableau. Allison stood at the base of the pinnace's ramp, holding a man in her right hand, the tips of his boots just barely resting on the ground. Her GNR was extended and trained on a tall man, who stood next to a hover car, holding a woman in his arms. Between them was another man, shorter with dirty blonde hair. Both his arms were outstretched, one palm raised toward Allison, one directed at the man holding Alice. Please, Rika heard the man in the middle say right as she hit the ground. Please don't shoot. We can settle this peacefully. I'll be the judge of that, Rika said as she approached. Genesa was on her right with her GNR trained on the man holding the woman, while Kor came around the other side, PR-111 aimed at the man in the middle. Allison visibly sagged, and the soles of the man's feet touched the ground. Sweet stars, it's good to see all of you. You especially, Colonel, she said, shaking her head. I thought I was about to get it from more of this guy's weird girls, she gave the man she was holding a light shake, which caused him to whimper softly. Glad to see you too, Rika said, trying to keep too much jubilation from her voice until she knew what was going on. Suddenly, a woman rose from the car, a GNR of her own aimed right at Rika. How's about we all lower our weapons, she said in an easy drawl. No need to get carried away here. Gloria, the man in the middle hissed, looking over his shoulder. That's not helping. 
two figures materialized behind Gloria. GNR's extended. Yep, really not, Kelly said as Kelly nodded. Gloria raised her GNR and held up her other arm. Look, we don't need guns in play. You all out muscle us. I just don't want anyone to get hurt. Fair enough. Rika lowered her weapon and gestured for the rest of her marauders to follow suit. Core, Allison glanced at the AM-4. I knocked Illumin out in the cockpit, make sure she doesn't fly off. Illumin? Core asked. She's like the alpha hero girl. Core chuckled as he turned toward the ramp. Rad. Okay, for starters, I assume that's Alice? Rika asked, gesturing to the woman in the arms of the man next to the hover car. Sure is, Allison said with a sneer. And this dickwad, she gave the man she held a shake, is Yaka Hiro, her son. Rika's helmet scan gathered vitals from Alice, ascertaining that the woman was awake. By the slight shake of her shoulders, she could also tell that the lieutenant colonel was crying. Don't you go getting all emotional, Rika, Nikki admonished. Everything that's happening right now is that woman's fault. No, it's the Nietzscheans' fault. They're the ones who separated her from her son, who were trying to destroy the Falcon in the city. Semantics, you know what I mean. Don't let that bleeding heart of yours stop you from doing what needs to be done. Rika nodded slowly, turning her focus to the man standing in the middle of the mess. And you are? Um, I'm just trimming. We're trying to help this woman, Alice. Yaka has one of his thugs, a guy named Dell, going after her. Not anymore, Allison said with a laugh. Dell kind of lost his head. Okay, just Tremon, Rika said, noticing that the man holding Alice had relaxed a hair at the news of Dell's demise. I'm Colonel Rika of the Marauders. We're here to bring Alice in. I told you, the other man said to Tremon. This woman's a trouble magnet. You're not wrong there. Rika said, as Shoshin set their pinnace down a hundred meters behind them. Genesa, place the lieutenant colonel under arrest for dereliction of duty and mutiny. Tremon's shoulders slumped as Genesa all but skipped toward the man who held Alice. Damn, and here I thought I was helping, he said. Good riddance, the other man muttered as he handed Alice over to Genesa. Tremon, how did you, Gloria, and your other friend here, Get mixed up in all this, Rika asked. Tremon watched Genesa carry Alice to Shoshin's pinnace. That's Jakob. He and I were just trying to do the right thing when we saved her. We need to go, Jakob said, gesturing to the hover car. There's not much time. Gloria turned to Jakob, her eyebrows halfway up her forehead. Jakob, don't you realize who this is? This is the woman that is liberating Genevia. Where else are we going to go but with her? I can think of a lot of places, Jakob said, eyeing Rika suspiciously. Either way, that car's not going to get you far enough, Rika said. Not if the station really does come down. We have room, though. Come with us. Over the past several minutes, Rika had noticed a few people appear in the doorways along the street. Nut had made a threatening move and she'd paid them no more heed than necessary as they'd watched the scene unfold. At Rika's words, a woman called out, Please, I have children. We have no way to get out. The feed said the maglevs were backed up and there's no hope. Tremon gave Rika an imploring look. We'll go with you, but you have to help these people. Rika counted 33 desperate-looking people who had crept out onto the street. She gave Tremon a curious look wondering why he'd demand she help everyone else to get him to come along. Not that it mattered. She wasn't going to turn anyone away. Okay, folks, hurry. We don't have much time. Final countdown. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Event horizon. Cerulean shipyards. Malta. Region. Iberia system. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Mona? Saris called over her shoulder. Have you got those forward beams back online yet? Almost, Lieutenant, the woman said without looking up from her console. 
This freaking ship is like a relic. You're lucky I spent a week working with the mechs on the Undaunted on this backward tech, or we'd be out of luck. I'll have to put you on repair rotations more often, Sarah said with a raised eyebrow. Good for the team. Or you could do one, Mona muttered. Saris pulled the destroyer out from amongst a series of cargo nets in the Cerulean shipyard. Scan caught sight of their pursuers, and Saris was glad to see that the final seven fighters they'd drawn off were still with them and hadn't returned to the battle around Ferris's ragtag fleet. What was that, Sergeant? She asked, suddenly realizing what the other woman had said. Eh, uh, what? Mona asked. Funny. Okay, Pars, Mona called down. Flip the forward batteries to the other trunk line. It should be ready to feed power again. You sure, Sarge? It's not gonna blow up on us? Pars asked. Well, if the battery blows up and kills you, it'll save you being around when those fighters slice us to ribbons. Think of it as a head start on the afterlife. Pars does like to be first, Tina added. Just do it already, Sars yelled. And a moment later, Mona let out a triumphant cry. Oh, baby, we're ready to rock and roll. The Event Horizon's chaotic route through the shipyard had caused the pursuing fighters to follow the destroyer single file, stretched out over several kilometers, with a twisting path Ceres had taken amongst the hulls and cargo nets. The enemy ships had only gotten off a few shots, but Ceres knew that when they reached the far side of the shipyard, all that would change. Luckily, with Mona's repairs, it would change in the Marines' favor. Seconds later, the Event Horizon burst into clear space, and Saris punched the rear starboard thrusters, spinning the ship around, its straining dampeners barely keeping them in their seats as they fired the port thrusters to halt the motion. Eat this, suckers, Mona yelled, firing the four functional beams. Two struck one fighter, and then two hit another. Both enemy ships died fiery deaths just two seconds later, and Saris let out a cry of joy. Then three of the enemy craft burst through the expanding clouds of plasma and debris, two firing beams at the nearly crippled destroyer, while the third launched a pair of missiles. Charging, Mona called out. Three, two, firing. The event horizon's beams lanced out again. This time one pair focused on the missiles, while another pair targeted the ship that had fired them. One missile made it past and splashed against the shields, its kinetic energy barely absorbed by the grav field. But the fighter that had launched them didn't move fast enough and one of the beams tore right through its cockpit and the ship was no more. Down to four, Saris cried out in triumph. We've drained the bats, Mona said in worried tones, glancing at Saris. Must have been an error in the capacity measurements. Saris wasn't surprised. The event horizon was on its last leg, barely more than a glorified troop transport at this point, enough to keep the locals in line but as evidenced by its inability to hold off less than two dozen equally ancient fighters without falling apart, not much else. Bay door open, ready to kick them out, Tina announced. Do it, Saris called back. And once Tina confirmed that the payload was out, she repeated the prior maneuver in reverse. The old ship groaned as the thrusters fired, turning it around once more, while the main engine's grab field distributed the payload that Callie had pushed out into space. For a moment, nothing happened, and Mona asked, Were those limpets all duds? Please don't let them be duds. Then one of the fighters exploded, followed by another, causing Saris to let out a cheer while Mona screamed out a string of obscenities at the Nietzscheans. By some miracle, the final two fighters turned away, apparently deciding not to follow in the footsteps of the rest of their squadron. Oh, no, you don't, Saris said through gritted teeth as she brought the destroyer around once more, praying it would hold together just a few minutes longer as the deck bucked violently under their feet. Charged, Mona cried out, and fired the beams at the fleeing attack craft. Only three fired this time, two striking one of the fighter's engines, causing a small explosion, and the ship went dark as it tumbled through space. The other fighter made it away unscathed. Saris fired the main engines again, attempting to pursue, but the ship lurched and began to slew to the side. Her board lit up with an alert that the starboard engine had lost its fuel supply. Then the port engine sputtered out, a control system error showing up on the engineering console. On the main display, the countdown showed only 10 minutes left before the asteroids hit the Falcon. Below that, 
the hollow tank laid out the battle, which still raged around the group of asteroids. The three tugs that had joined in had shifted the first of the large rocks, but one of the allies had taken damage from a fighter, and the other two were still hooking onto the smaller asteroids. Ferris's pinnace and the few other ships that had joined in to help were still struggling against the bulk of the fighters. Damn, Mona whispered. There's no way. It's not over yet, Saris whispered. Colonel Borden might still reach his objective. The Ferryman. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location. Fury Lance's Pinnace, near Maltese Falcon, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. I swear, Ferris muttered, if Vargo ever asks me to do him a solid again, I'll tell him where he can stick his solids. You're doing great, Hallie said as she fired the Pinnace's beams on one of the fighters, jinking the ship to avoid the small craft's retaliation. I know I'm doing great, Ferris muttered, as he managed to settle another of the dropships on one of the 500-meter rocks. Blowing it in ten, he called out to his ragtag fleet while shifting his focus to the next rock. The tugs had moved the first big daddy and shifted two of the smaller ones. He'd blown two more of them, though the debris field would still pass dangerously close to the Falcon, and this would make a third. That still left six rocks, and two of them were the big daddies. Though they had 12 minutes before impact, they only had seven to get the big daddies moving, or they'd still clip the station. Ferris was considering moving all his resources to the big ones, but most of the Nietzschean fighters had moved back to guard them, knowing that so long as those two rocks hit the Falcon, the station was done for. It may not fall fast enough to land on Cerulean, but it would still come down. He was about to order his ships to make the run on the fighters anyway, when a message came over the shared channel. This an invite-only party, or can anyone join? Colonel Borden? Ferris asked, knowing he sounded like an idiot for simply saying the man's name. Damn straight it is. I have this lovely thing called a star crusher, and some caring soul left 36 longbow missiles in it. I don't know if they'll all make targets that far out, but what should I focus on? A star crusher and longbows? Fuck, Colonel, did you find a leprechaun down there too? Hope not, because we killed pretty much everything we came across. Targets? The fighters in the rear, Ferris said quickly, and a moment later, the Colonel signaled a successful launch of 33 of the longbows. We're gonna walk this thing over to the launch base and see if the Neats left us any rides. Hope it helps. It does, trust me, it does. Though Ferris did his best to be effusive in his thanks, he worried that the colonel's help wouldn't be enough. He tagged the longbows on the holo display. The quick and nimble missiles didn't pack enough punch to move any of the rocks, but they were perfect for taking out fighters. He noted that it would take them five minutes to close the distance between the moon and the targets, but already some of the Nietzschean craft were fleeing, eleven in all, leaving only eight fighters remaining. Fuck, maybe we can get the big daddies after all. He directed his final three dropships to one of the big daddies. While the two remaining tugs moved to the other, the police patrol ships and freighters escorting them in. Beams, light kinetics, and a few small missiles streaked between the ships and the remaining fighters, but none suffered severe damage. The tugs were about to settle on the largest rock when suddenly the 11 fighters that had left the fight turned back and made a beeline for the tugs. Shit, Vera swore. I'm such an idiot. The two police ships opened fire with their beams, attempting to drive the fighters back, and one of the Neats lost an engine, spinning away into the dark, but the rest launched their remaining missiles at the tugs. Every ship in Ferris's fleet did their damnedest to hit those missiles, and a few beams even stretched out from the torrent of fire, playing across the 300,000 kilometers between the cruiser and the battle, but it wasn't enough. The missiles hit, and the tugs were gone. Even as Borden's longbows bore down on the fighters, Ferris felt despair welling in his chest. There was no hope for it. The rocks would hit. The station would fall. Fuck! He screamed, slamming his hand against the console, hitting it again and again, beating on it with both fists and cracking the display. Motherfuckers! Hallie reached out to touch his shoulder, and he shrugged her hand away. Don't say it. 
a long silence stretched out, seeming to last minutes. But Ferris knew it to just be a few seconds. He was about to order the ships to fall back and blow the nukes on the last dropships, for whatever good it would do. But as he opened his mouth to order the retreat, a new voice came over the channel. This is Lieutenant Potter of the Marauders. All ships clear the swarm. I say again, all ships clear the swarm. I'm taking them out. Potter? What the? How the hell did you get here? By finding out that AIs can have nightmares. I have a load of RMs, so if you'd mind giving me some room. You heard the lady? Ferris announced to his fleet, and Hallie banked the pinnace away, an elated expression on her face. She's got this covered. All ships fall back to the markers I'm sending. Ferris wanted to believe they'd won, to believe that the Falcon was safe. But the knot in his stomach wasn't going anywhere until the mass cleared the Maltese Falcon without taking down the station or hitting something vital on the planet below. Thank the dark stars, came the response from one of the freighter captains, a sentiment echoed by a few others, and then the ship shifted to either side of the swarm, keeping the fighters bracketed between themselves and the moon. The signatures of twelve relativistic missiles appeared on his screen, drives flaring like new stars in the darkness as they streaked toward their targets, while the longbows continued their march from the moon toward the fighters, all of which were frantically scattering. That's right, little roaches, Hallie muttered, a grim smile on her lips. Run away, though there's nowhere for you to go. Ferris supposed she was right. Borden was moving his star crusher toward the Nietzschean launch bays on the moon. None of the stations in Iberia would allow those fighters to dock, and they'd lost both their capital ships in the system. If they didn't die from the longbows, they just might die in the darkness. Though the previous half hour had sped by at breakneck speed, the single minute it took for the RMs to reach the rocks seemed like an eternity. Ferris had his knuckles to his lips as he watched the counter hit zero. The missiles had reached relativistic speeds, and the force with which they struck the asteroids blasted them to atoms in brilliant flashes of light. Then the light was gone, and so were the asteroids. Little more than clouds of plasma and dust remained where once there had been terrible instruments of death, bearing down on the Maltese Falcon. Ferris was examining the velocity and structure of the cloud, worried that the amount of dust could still damage the station, when two more explosions erupted in the leading edge of the dust cloud, removing any risk of it passing over the station. Shit, Potter, you did it. It was nothing, the AI replied. You know, I just had to fly a ship through the dark layer with no special sensors, while avoiding dark matter and keeping the ex Dolly at bay. ex Dolly, The things in the dark layer. Ferris let that sink in as Hallie asked, How did you know to come, Potter? The Fury Lance must still be over four light hours away. They haven't even seen those asteroids launch yet. You can thank Colonel Rika. She got a message out to us using the ISF's Quancom blade. Well, shit. Ferris sank back in his seat, suddenly remembering how much his side hurt. I guess it's good to know she made it okay. Were you really worried about Rika? Hallie asked with a laugh. I bet if she'd stood on Targian Tower and Cerulean, the Falcon would have fallen elsewhere just to avoid her glare. Ferris snorted and then sucked in a sharp gasp. Maybe you should get us back to the Torrent of Fire. I think I need to see a doctor. You got it, Captain. Next. Stellar date 12.23.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Torrent of Fire, Malta. Region, Iberia System, Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Rika's ascent to the Torrent of Fire was delayed by the explosion overhead and the broadcasts from multiple sources that the Nietzschean attack had been thwarted. Turning back to the surface before they even left the stratosphere, the two pinnaces returned to Cartagena, depositing the grateful locals on the street where they'd collected them less than 20 minutes earlier. As the civilians disembarked, Tremin, Gloria, and Jakob silently stared at one another for several long minutes, privately arguing about leaving the ship. Eventually, Rika gestured to the ramp. Any day now, I have a fleet to get back to. I can't sit here all day while you three argue like an old... Whatever. Tremin gave the other two a quelling look and turned to Rika. We're staying, Colonel. 
I'd like to talk to you about something when we get to your ship. Rika nodded and signaled to Shoshin to take off. Then she turned back to Tremon and cocked an eyebrow. My ship or the Nietzschean cruiser my people are currently squatting on? Well, Tremon paused and glanced at Jakob, who shook his head vehemently. To be honest, I suppose here is as good a place as any. Tremon, really? Jakob said, half rising as he gestured at Alice, who was laid across the seats two rows up. Not everyone here. My real name is not Tremon, the man said, holding out a hand to silence Jakob. It's Calvin. Alice let out a long groan from her seat. Oh, you can't be serious. That was legitimate intel? The fuck? Calvin? Rika repeated the name and then matched it with the resigned annoyance in Alice's tone. President? Calvin? I won't lie, I suspected it, Nikki said privately. Show off, Rika replied with a tired laugh. She watched Jakob tense, the man prepared to defend his charge against a swarm of enraged mechs, while Gloria laughed softly. Well, there it is, the woman said. Tremon nodded as he gave Jakob a significant look, one that did nothing to take the tension out of the other man's stance. Once upon a time, yes. I suppose you're going to want your pound of flesh from me. Rika glanced at the other mechs on the pinnace. They all still wore helmets, not revealing their expressions, but maintained neutral or indifferent postures. <laughs> Calvin, she said with a soft laugh. I don't think any of us care enough about you one way or another, at least right now, to demand any sort of recompense. So far as I'm concerned, you're a useful asset. Maybe when Genevieve is reestablished, we'll do fun things like have war tribunals, though I'd like to keep those focused on the needs as much as possible. Calvin glanced at Jakob. Told you so. These mechs are honorable and upstanding. Kelly barked a laugh, and Rika couldn't help but chuckle softly. Let's not get carried away, Mr. President. Ugh, please. I'm no one's president. In fact, could you call me Tremon? I like him a lot more than Calvin. For a moment, the request sounded ridiculous to Rika, but she knew what it was like to live with the shadow of war always looming overhead. Of course, Tremon. Of all the people to run into on some shitty street, Alice muttered, and Rika turned and walked toward the woman. Go ahead, Lieutenant Colonel. Say another word. See what happens. To her credit, Alice didn't even breathe loudly, and the rest of the trip up to the torrent of fire took place in complete silence, except for when Kelly fell asleep and began to snore. Well, you did it again, Rika, Jay said as they stood in Captain Alina's ready room, a space decorated in strident red and black with strange abstract artwork on the walls. Did what? Rika asked. Nearly got killed? Chase snorted as he leaned back against the former captain's desk. That's sort of a given, though from what I saw, you were barely in any danger. Rika thought back and realized that Chase was right. Huh, I guess nearly died is such a default response. I never thought of any other. Now, Ferris, he's the real hero of Iberia. I heard his speech. I won't lie, I got a bit teary. Yeah, he did well. Granted, he'll tell you Potter's the hero here. Though if Borden hadn't gotten to the moon and disabled their main beams, the Neats wouldn't have used their backup plan of sending in those rocks. Rika laughed and stretched out a hand, clasping chases and pulling him upright once more. She drew him close. Guess we're just heroes all around. Go us, Chase chuckled as he slid a hand around Rika's head and drew it forward, their lips nearly touching. I feel like we need to celebrate. Do. Let's. Their lips met, and Rika breathed in Chase's scent, which she realized was more the scent of mech than man after his transformation. Strangely, she found that she preferred it. Malta and the space around it was a mess, though a rather beautiful ring consisting of dust from the asteroids was forming around it. In the end, more people had died from defending against looters and getting trampled trying to get to Maglev's leaving Cerulean than in the actual combat fought to free the system. 
Is it wrong that I feel a bit disgusted with these people? Rika asked Nikki upon their return to the Fury Lands after meeting with John, the new station master of the Maltese Falcon. Not John. He's a stand-up guy. We need more Johns. It's like what Hallie told us, Farah said. They don't remember hope. We have to remind them what it looks like. This is the first step. Rika nodded absently as she strode through the ship to her offices. Halfway there, she decided that she really didn't want to be alone and made her way to the galley instead. When she entered, she saw the very last thing she expected. Tremon sitting in the midst of a group of mechs, talking to them about what they'd been through in the war and afterward. The man seemed genuinely interested in them, in what had happened during and after the war, and was offering heartfelt apologies to each and every person he spoke with. As she approached, he looked up and gave her a tired smile. Thank you for bringing me to your ship, Colonel Rika. Not sure where else I would have brought you, she replied with a casual shrug. I'm just glad that we all seem to be getting along so well. Kelly was sitting across from the former Genevian president, staring intently into his eyes. You're right, Rika. I thought I'd be angry. Want to kill him if I ever saw him. Funny how things don't always go the way you'd expect. Well, Tremon shrugged as he glanced over at Shoshin and Crunch, who stood nearby, fully armed and armored. I think I may actually be under some sort of arrest. A bit, Rika allowed. Technically, under both Septian and Theban law, the perpetrators of the Genevian Met program have been declared war criminals. Is that the law we're under out here? Tremon asked. Are you not reestablishing Genevia? Rika could tell that despite what she believed to be real sincerity, Tremon couldn't help but fall back on his demagogue ways, asking leading questions to get the right or wrong answer laid out before the waiting audience. She looked around at the mechs. Who are you? She asked them. Not shouting, but in one voice, the mech said, Marauders. Who's Marauders? Crunch called out from where he stood at the edge of the group. Rika's Marauders, the mech shouted this time. Rika felt a smile grow on her face that nearly split her cheeks. Please understand, she said to Tremon. I care about Genevia, or I'm learning how to again at least. But we have a mission, and we'll not falter in executing that mission. We're to strike at the very heart of Nietzsche and cut it out. There can be no Genevia while there is a Nietzsche. And what of Iberia? Tremon answered. Will you just leave it in disarray? They have no governor. That Nietzschean appointed fool fled the moment it appeared the Nietzsche had lost. We'll stay for a few days, Rika replied, glancing at the faces around her. But I'll tell you now what I'm going to tell the people of Iberia tomorrow. The Genevian people must remember what honor is. They must honor one another and stand together. They must help and not harm one another. No matter what they may think of their neighbor, and no matter what slights they've experienced in the past, if they can do that, they won't need mechs propping them up. They can stand on their own. Rika pulled out a chair and settled heavily into it, grinning at the mechs hanging on her every word. Because we've been Genevia's crutch for far too long. That was a good speech, by the way, Nikki said as Rika left the galley an hour later on her way to meet with her advance team. Honestly, I thought I was being a bit haughty and then a bit petulant. That sort of thing is just not my style, but I don't like people trying to paint me into a corner. I don't think he did it on purpose, Nikki offered. Well, he needs to be more careful with what he says, she replied, while stepping into the lift that would take her down to the starboard bays where the team was assembled. Okay, I know that's harsh, but it's true. It's fair. He wants to really understand your intentions, but doing it in front of your people was a poor choice. Maybe he'll make smarter ones later. We'll see. The lift opened up and Rika walked down a series of passages, trying not to think of the farewell she was about to have, and instead wondering how they'd get Colonel Borden's star crusher on the lance. He said that it was his compensation after his pinnace had gotten blown up. Before long, she came to the bay where three pinnaces sat, marauders loading them with supplies for their journey. Orchestrating the chaos was Chase, a grin on his lips as he yelled at Kelly for trying to sneak a case of vodka onto the ship. Having fun? Rika asked. More than I should be, 
Chase grinned as he wrapped an arm around her shoulders and pulled her close. I mean, mostly I'm just giddy to get to Decker and shove my boot up a few asses that sorely deserve it. Like Hal's? Rika asked. Oh, hell no. See what I did there? Rika rolled her eyes, but couldn't help a small laugh. Yeah, Hal's hell. Good one. Tough crowd. Anyway, I'm not gonna kick his ass. I'm gonna make sure I get a berth in his bay. Best place to dock on Decker. Just remember, we're looking for intel, not payback. Rika. Chase brushed his lips against her ear. Why can't we have a bit of both? She pulled her head back from his, a stern look in her eyes. Just be careful, you. You're doing recon. That's why every mech you're taking served in Parsons or lived there. Blend in, find out where to hit the neat, and then meet us at the rendezvous. You got it, Rika. In short, don't go in like you would. Rika opened her mouth to give Chase a stern reprimand, but then closed it and smiled, shaking her head. Pretty much, yeah. Chase gently turned her head and kissed her passionately. I love you, Rika. I love you too, Chase. Woohoo! Kelly cried out as she walked past. There's a dark corner right over there, you know. Chase groaned and turned to reprimand Kelly, but Rika pulled him back against her. You're not getting away that easily. The final upgrade. Stellar date 12.25.8949. Adjusted years. Location, Fury Lance, Malta. Region, Iberia System. Old Genevia, Nietzschean Empire. Chase had departed a few hours prior, and after dealing with a thousand pressing issues that had cropped up immediately thereafter, Rika had finally made it back to her quarters, which seemed so empty with Chase on his way out of the system. Rika stepped up to the new ISF rack that Phineas's team had made and released the clamps that held the armor on her body. Following that, she unlocked the bolts holding her limbs in place and the rack her armor and mech limbs them away, then lifted up her girly arms and set them into place. Once they were attached, she stepped off the rack and stretched her arms up, intertwining her fingers, rather pleased at how good she'd become at managing all five, though five toes still caused her no end of trouble if she tried to move them independently. Satisfied that her limbs were functioning properly, Rika ambled over to her bed and laid down on the sheet. Though she trusted Chase implicitly, the fact that she'd just sent him out felt like the wrong move. They'd just finally reunited everyone in her force, and two days later, she'd sent a whole platoon's worth of mechs away. It's not like that, we'll follow in just a few days, she reminded herself. And the team isn't under duress or poorly supplied, they'll be fine. Rika? Nikki asked. I know you're probably thinking about Chase and his team, but do you have a few minutes to chat? Is this about what you were going to tell me back when we were aboard the Asura? Rika asked with a wry twist of her lips. Huh, yeah. I was wondering if you'd remember that. Rika chuckled. Huh, you know I have a near eidetic memory, Nikki, even without mods. Though if I didn't, I'd still be unlikely to forget that. Not to mention you being thousands of years old and having flown hundreds of starships. It's been days. Why didn't you bring it up sooner? Nikki seemed rather perplexed that Rika had simply let those questions go unanswered for so long. Well, we've been kind of busy, but also I figured you'd tell me when you were ready. Are you ready now? For some of it, yeah. Nikki paused, seeming unsure of herself. I'm old, Rika. Thousands of years, yeah, that definitely sounds old. Are you making fun of me? Nikki demanded. Rika reached up and interlaced her fingers behind her head. Maybe a bit. Seriously, Nikki, I'm not even 30 yet. Pretty much everyone is old to me. You know? Nikki mused. In a way, I think that's weirder than my situation. How are you so strong when you're so young? A giggle that a younger woman might have let out had they not lived Rika's life slipped past the SMI Dash 4's lips. <laughs> well, in mech years, I'm easily a hundred. How old are you? When were you born? In the 31st century. Rika sucked in a surprised breath, her heavily lidded eyes snapping wide open. That's 59 centuries ago. Holy shit, you, you're, damn. The AI gave a rueful laugh. Okay, that's not what I expected, 
You're not often at a loss for words, Rika. Rika nodded mutely as a host of questions flooded her mind. Then she latched onto one, asking it aloud. Why me, Nikki? Well, there was a healthy dose of circumstance that brought us together. Sure, I get that. But why did you pair with me? Well, there are a lot of reasons, Rika. But I suppose if I had to boil it down, it's because you're kind and honest and honorable. Rika thought of all the people she'd killed over the years, many of whose faces she could still see if she cared to. I don't know about that. Honest, sure. The other two are questionable. Well, I've been around a bit. Trust me, you are not a cruel person. I know that type, and you're not it. Rika barked a laugh, enjoying the joy that came from deep inside herself. Are you going to throw your venerable years at me whenever I disagree now? Maybe. Think it will work? Probably not. You forgot one thing in your list. I'm a bit stubborn as well. A bit? <laughs>